Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Order, Senators. Uh, yesterday afternoon, Senator Crossan asked me whether or not I could give a guarantee that the women in parliament display would remain in place. Um, she asked about the display which is in the public area of the presiding officer's display area near the Parliament House Theatre. Having conferred with the Speaker, I can confirm that the display will remain in place for the foreseeable future. Um, petitions. Petitions have been lodged in accordance with the list circulated to the Senators. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Uh, are there any notices of motion? Senator Allison. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I give notice that 15 sitting days after today, I shall move that new regulation 400, made under item 41 of Schedule 1 to the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Management Amendment Regulations 2007, number 1, as contained in Select Legislative Instrument 2007, number 217, and made under the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Management Act 1989, be disallowed. Are there any further notices of motion? Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Regulations and Ordinances, I give notice that 15 days after today, I shall move that the following delegated legislation a list of which I shall hand to the clerk shall be disallowed. Mr. President, I seek leave to incorporate in Hansard a short summary of the matters raised by the committee. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Further notices of motion? We move on to reports. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Parry. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I present the 16th report of 2007 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have that report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator M Parry. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the report be adopted. Senator Milne. Uh, Mr. President, I just rise to comment on the fact that uh, I am so appalled that the uh, Selection of Bills Committee has decided not to refer the Tax Law Amendment 2007 Measures No. 6 Bill to the Rural and Regional and Transport Affairs Committee of this Senate for appropriate um, consideration. Uh, I find it uh, disgraceful that any government should be so keen to rush this through the parliament without appropriate scrutiny, and I hope never to hear a Liberal or National Party senator stand up in this campaign and say they're concerned about water or food security in Australia. Because what this, tax amendment, what this tax amendment does is to provide for the planting of so-called carbon sinks, but there is no definition of a carbon sink. It gives full tax deductibility for any trees that are planted in the next four years and then a, a different ratio after that. But the important thing is, the important thing is, Mr. President, there is no requirement for the trees to stay in the ground for any length of time. This applies for 14 years, which by coincidence is the rotation rate for plantations. There is no requirement that the trees that are planted are biodiverse. There is no, there is no analysis of the hydrological um, ramifications of this legislation. Now, already, rural Australia is up in arms because of the managed investment schemes and the distortion that that is causing in rural Australia. And now, on top of this, 
in, the, in farmers in face of the drought, you are going to have the cement companies, the aluminium companies, the coal industry coming in and making huge investments a, in water rights and b, in terms of land, taking agricultural land out of food production in order to get tax benefits for the planting of what are effectively plantations. It's, it does not say these trees cannot be cut down at any particular period of time, and that is the critical issue. It doesn't say they have to uh, meet the Kyoto rules even. What this is doing is distorting—it's going against even the Liberal Party philosophy, I would have thought, because it is distorting the, potentially the carbon market by saying, we'll put a cap on but we will advantage the forest industry and these large emitters in the context of setting up a national emissions market. Now, I don't know whether the government understands what it is doing with this particular legislation, but there will be a riot in rural Australia when they find out, when they find out that the cashed-up large emitters, the cement companies, the aluminium companies, uh, the coal um, energy corporations, can use their profits to effectively take land out of agricultural production and take water out of agricultural production, because, of course, trees need water just as much as crops do. Now, the refusal of the government to allow this to be referred for proper analysis by those who are already concerned about what's going on order, because order, of the Senator managed Milne. investment order, schemes— no, order, I Senator Milne. I just, there is far too much audible noise in the chamber. For those who are having meetings, please have them outside or conduct them much, quiet, much more quietly. Senator Milne. Thank you. Uh, everybody knows that if you really were serious about sequestering uh, carbon in terms of forests, what you would do is stop the logging of native forests and stop land clearance across Australia. That is how you would most effectively sequester carbon. Everybody knows that. And instead of that, we've got a government driving deforestation in the Tiwi Islands. There is, that is a definite. That is a definition of deforestation when you convert, when you convert tropical savanna to monocultures. That is deforestation under anybody's definition. It's even not allowed under the government's own policies, but now I hear the minister defending it. You've got logging going on in primary forests in Tasmania, in Victoria, in southeast New South Wales. You are knocking down primary forests and now giving tax deductions to the big emitters to drive farmers off their land and take more water out of the system. And I think it's time the government. Uh, it, what it exposes here is the government's failure to realise you need a whole of government approach to climate change. You can't just intervene to distort the carbon market, to pork barrel the forest industry and the big emitters at the expense of farmers. And that is what the government's done. The hubris here of saying we're going to drive this through this parliament, and in 12 months' time they'll say, oh, we had no idea that would be the effect of this legislation. Well, let them not say that and let them not get up in an election campaign and say they're worried about the drought or the impact on farmers of lack of water in rural Australia, because this tax deduction will drive that process even more. It is an appalling piece of legislation, but at the very least it needs to go for appropriate scrutiny so the Bureau of Rural Sciences can at least point out to the government the error of its ways in terms a, of, um, of uh, sequestration order. Your and time b, in expired, terms of an emissions Senator Milne. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Parry be agreed to. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Look, uh, I'll say things now that I've said many times before at precisely this stage on a Thursday morning, but they do need to be put on the record every single time. Um, and I would flag that I, I will move an amendment to um, address the issue raised by Senator Milne, which, as, as the, just to make clear before the um, chamber, the report before us is selection of bills committee and the committee. Um, Considered a proposal, obviously from the uh, Greens, to refer the Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures Number no. 6 Bill to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, uh, but was unable to reach agreement on whether the bill should be referred. Which is a nice way of saying all of us wanted to refer to the bill to the committee, and the government didn't want to refer the bill to the committee, so we didn't refer the bill to the committee. So I'm moving an amendment seeking to uh, bring about that end, purely to have it formally on the record as by way of a vote. Um, look, I, I don't know whether all that Senator Milne has just said about what's in the bill is what's in the bill. I heard a few interjections, particularly from Senator Watson, who I, I do know understands tax issues pretty well, that uh, at least some of the things you're saying he was disputing. So I, I don't know. 
um, and that's the, why you have that's why you have Senate committee inquiries uh, to get all those views that different people have about what the bill will do, uh, hear from experts who actually know, and make sure there's no unintended consequences. Uh, see whether it's going to achieve what it said it's going to achieve. Uh, that it's uh, not going to have um, uh, other uh, outcomes that will happen as well, at least as far as can be foreseen, uh, and then recommend that it be passed or recommend that we amend it to make sure that it does what it says it's going to do. Now that's just good practice, good public policy, good public administration, regardless of your policy views about you know, whether or not we should be having tax incentives for this type of thing or not. And it is a serious problem that we're rushing through a piece of legislation when there obviously there are major concerns being raised by some about the potential impacts of it. Uh, you know, if we're looking at, you know, it's, it's a nice benign bill, Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures Number Six, um, doesn't tell you very much. Uh, but anything that's dealing with tax deductibility relating to carbon sinks and the like is opening up an area where we do need to get it as right as possible. I and mean, the last thing I want to see is tax deductibility put in place relating to carbon sinks that ends up being just a big taxpayer funded <coughs> rort for a bunch of people uh, that doesn't actually provide any particularly positive uh, uh, greenhouse benefits. Uh, and then people will point to it and say, oh yeah, well see we tried that and it didn't work. So we'll, we'll bother, we won't bother doing that anymore. We won't bother trying incentives anymore. Uh, let alone the fact that if, if we're going to give in tax incentives for this sort of thing, uh, we'll have a cost attached to it, whether that's the best use of that sort of cost to produce uh, a carbon gain. Uh, so there's, there's all those sorts of questions. Now, it also raises once again the fundamental issue, this is why we need fixed terms. All of us around here today are all asking each other, are we going to be coming back in three weeks? And there's a whole bunch of people, myself included, who think there's no way in the world we'll be coming back in three weeks. There's other people saying, oh, yep, no, we probably will. Well, again, it's just bad public policy, bad practice for a lawmaking body to be rushing something through just because this might be the last chance when we don't even know. I mean, we could be rushing this thing through, saying, well, we can't refer it to a committee because we mightn't get the chance to pass it in three weeks' time. Uh, so we've got to put it through now, even though it may be seriously flawed. And a lot of people will make investment decisions potentially on the basis of what's there, so that by the time you try and fix up the flaws, you've already got it built into the system, and it's too late, potentially. Uh, if we had a fixed term, we would know. Uh, we'd know whether we're coming back in three weeks' time. Uh, we'd be able to do our job properly. I mean, the, the ridiculous scenario is we may rush this thing through now because you know it's the last possible chance, and then find out we are back here in three weeks' time, and we could have had a good look at it, or at least some sort of look at it, um, and made sure that it worked properly. We don't know because of that simple thing. So I'd, I'd repeat the Democrats' long, long-standing plea for fixed terms. And I would say, again, in terms of just good public policy, I don't know. I don't have a view on this bill because I haven't had a chance to look at it. That's what Senate committees are for. Unless there's a good argument against it, we should be accepting what used to be a long-standing precedent. If somebody wants to look at a piece of legislation to check it out, we should accept that and refer it. So I'd move that amendment to um, refer the Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures No. 6, Bill 2007, to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee for inquiry and report by October 10, 2007. Senator Butler, hear you say you are moving an amendment? Yes. Yep. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, President. We've uh, heard from Senator Bartlett, and he was uh, honest enough to tell us that uh, basically it's uh, a similar speech that he's given on numerous other occasions, and uh, I thank him for that. And so, what I would simply do is refer people to the Hansards where I have responded to him previously without uh, traversing uh, the, the ground any further. In relation to the contribution of Senator Milne, it was once again, if I might say, a bizarre and confused ramble. But what it does show, what it does show is how anti-forestry and how anti-trees the Australian Greens are. This is just quite a bizarre contribution. They go around the world telling us all that carbon and greenhouse gases are the most important issue confronting the world. We have to deal with it. And then, of course, they say in the next breath, and the Howard government's doing nothing about it. Yet here we are introducing legislation, trying to provide carbon sinks, and what is the first stunt that the Greens do? They complain about, they complain about 
planting trees and they want to delay the passage of the legislation, either assisting the world's atmosphere with providing carbon sinks is important or it isn't. But here we go yet again, having the classic case of the Australian Greens trying to have it both ways. Their mantra against forestry, against trees, against tree plantations is such that all you've got to do is mention it and they start salivating like Pavlov dogs and know they've got to oppose it, irrespective of how good it might be for the environment. And, uh, we have uh, been told a number of things uh, which are just false, but uh, can I indicate that the Emissions Task Force will be dealing with uh, some of the further details, but what we want to do is provide certainty to people that want to plant trees for carbon sinks. And if we believe the greenhouse gases are a real problem, then we should be encouraging this type of activity, but not according to the Greens. And then we heard the bizarre commentary about deforestation on the Tiwi Islands. Well, I had the privilege of being up on the Tiwi Islands. The Aboriginal Land Council there actually support what's going on. The income being generated is now allowing them to develop their own private school. And do you know why they're using the income generated for their own private school? Because the leaders of that community are concerned, people that are in their 60s and 70s are concerned, that the educational level they got as young people is not of the same high quality standard as their sons and grandsons have achieved. And therefore they have said the educational system has been letting them down and they see a real benefit for their future generations in this. But uh, in relation to monocultures, that was mentioned as well. The condemnation of changing a monoculture pasture to a monoculture tree plantation. I ask you, what's the environmental impact of that? Virtu virtually nil. Other than, of course, once again, the bad thing is that it's trees. We can't see trees being planted. It is just a very bizarre position that the Greens continually put. And what the Greens also deliberately avoided in their uh, discussion were other aspects of this bill, which deals with the uh, grants for tobacco growers. We as a government have taken a, a stance in relation to tobacco growing. And uh, there is a particular exemption being provided to enable these people uh, to get grants to get out of tobacco growing. I would have hoped that we all support that move, especially the Australian Greens. And these people are now putting in their tax returns for the previous financial year, and it is important that they be provided certainty as well. And that's part of the bill that the Greens also would seek to delay, which would mean that uh, these people couldn't put their tax returns in. But of course, the other aspects of the bill are not canvassed at all by the Greens. The only thing they oppose, like the Pavlovian dogs that uh, salivate whenever uh, the bell rings with the Greens. It is mentioned trees, mentioned plantation, mentioned forestry, and the Greens go berserk and think that they have to oppose it, even if, like on this occasion, Order. it is good for Order the environment. Senator, your time is Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to respond briefly to certain remarks made by Senator Milne. Firstly, there was an assu uh, assertion that carbon sinks forests were would have some benefit to MIS schemes. Having myself uh, uh, having sought an assurance of a no double benefit to an acti activity outside the carbon sinks uh, legislation, namely to MIS, uh, that, it, that exclu specifically excludes s such benefits. I therefore think it is important that this myth that uh, was alleged by Senator Milne doesn't get wider currency, and that is why I rise today to put at rest that particular issue. Now, if Senator Milne has a particular problem in relation to agricult prime agricultural lands, no, maybe the simplest approach would be for her to pass to put up a simple amendment. Amendments are 
not uncommon to the Greens, and I suggest that this would be uh, a far uh, more beneficial, more direct and more appropriate response to uh, address her concerns in relation to the issue of further trees being placed on prime agricultural land. I thank the Senate. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Parry be agreed to. The Sorry. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required? I'll put the question again. I will put the question again. Those order. Order. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Division required, ring the bell.
Lock the doors. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Campbell teller for the ayes and Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division there being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Parry be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, we we'll now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Parry. Yes, uh, Mr President. At the request of uh, Minister Abetz, I move that the Government Business Orders of the Day listed on pages 4 and 5 of today's Order of Business, under the heading at 12.45 p.m., be considered from 12.45 p.m. till not later than 2 p.m. today. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We should now Sorry, Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged in respect to business of the Senate Notice No. 1 to the 15th of October and business of the Senate Notice No. 2 to the 16th of October. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Uh, are, there, are there any formal motions? Senator, sorry, Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I move to postpone um, general business notice of motion No. Uh, 914 to the next day of sitting. Uh, sorry. Yeah. You, you, Senator Milne, you have to seek leave to move that way. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, seek leave. Uh, is, leave is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, the question is the motion moved by Senator Milne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, we will now proceed to formal business. Uh, are there any formal motions? Senator Abet. Yep, a formal business. I ask the government business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. Uh, uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Abetz. I thank the Senate. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to communications and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Betts. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law related to communications and for related purposes. S Senator Betts. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the first day of the next period of sittings. Senator Betts. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the Government Business Notice of Motion No. 2, proposing the exemption of bills from the bill's cut-off order, be taken as formal. Uh, is there any objection to this uh, motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Betts. I thank the Senate. I table a statement of reasons relating to the Health Insurance Amendment Medicare Dental Services Bill 2007 and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard and move the motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Betts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say Senator Brown. Note the Greens' objection to uh, this motion. Uh, there should be proper consideration of all these bills. It's not being afforded by this motion, and we won't be supporting it. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Betts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. <coughs> I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, further formal motions. Um, I actually I, I intend, if it suits the, if it's the wish of the Senate, intend to call them in the order of 918, 919, 920, 921, 922, then going back to 914. The Senator, stop the spoiler. Thank you, Mr. President. That order suits me. Um, Mr. President, I, I uh, seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion 918. Is leave uh, granted? Standing in my name. There being no objection, leave is granted. That Senator was Speedy Gonzalez. I just want to say I uh, amend the motion in the terms that have been circulated in the chamber. I apologise that that only took place half an hour ago, but in this place negotiations often happen at the last minute. Thank the government for their negotiations, and I ask that the motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Stop the Spoyer. Mr. President, I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I seek leave to make a small amendment to General Business Notice of Motion Number 919, as circulated. Is, is leave granted? Day. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Before asking that it be taken as a formal motion, so I now ask that it be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Bartlett. Um, uh, I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber um, and ask that be taken as formal. The question is that the, the motion as amended moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Payne. I ask the general business notice of motion number 920, standing in my name, relating to sexual slavery in Japan, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this notice being taken as formal? Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move an amendment to the motion. Is leave granted? There, there being no objection, leave is granted. Senator, Senator Allison. Uh, uh, I seek leave to amend the motion in the words as circulated in the chamber. Uh, leave. Sorry. The, the, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
bon son. Hein. Lock the doors. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Allison be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Campbell teller for the ayes and Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division, there being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Payne uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Oh, sorry, Senator Wong. Sorry, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to this motion. Uh, just one minute. Okay, we'll stop the bills. I'm sorry. I didn't see you standing, Senator Wong. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I indicate Labor will be supporting the motion because it is at least a formal acknowledgement by the Australian Senate of the suffering of these comfort women. Uh, we recognise the motion is not perfect, and we are extremely disappointed that the Howard government has not seen fit to heed the concerns of the Australian victims of these crimes and their supporters in drafting this motion. 
The Senate will recall Labor moved a much stronger motion yesterday uh, that had the support of this community, which the Howard government senators voted down. Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. If leave granted. There no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Allison. Thank you. Uh, the reason the Democrats put up um, an amendment to this motion. Sorry, a point of order, Senator Brown. I can't hear Senator Allison, President. Order. Right, Sen Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The reason the Democrats put up an amendment to this motion is that uh, it contains uh, several errors which were pointed out by those women who are urging the Senate to make a, an, a statement with regard to the comfort women. Uh, the first of those is that Japan, despite being a member of the UN, did not act on the UN Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women's recommendations on her report on comfort women, published in 1994. Uh, also, Japan has failed to recognise its breach of C29, that's the Convention Against Forced uh, Labour, through forcing comfort women into sexual slavery, despite the campaigning by Korean survivors of the ILO. And furthermore, in the 1970s, the Japanese government at the time buried the remains of proved war criminals <coughs> sent sentenced at the Kyoto Tribunal into the Yasukuni Shrine and have subsequently honoured them by prime ministerial visits. Uh, the Kono Statement in 1993 was an expression of a personal remorse and not an official government statement, as stated by the Australian survivor Jan Ruff O'Hearn, and as academically and legally proven by expert Dr Mindy Rockcotler, Director of Asia Policy Point. Dr Kotler, who leads a team of international academics to better understanding of Japan, said a definitive official government statement must fit one of four conditions. So it's, um, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, Mr. President, um, the reason we will not support this motion as it stands unamended is because it will actually do more harm than good. Senator Nettle. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, thank you. It's really important that the Japanese government are asked to make an apology for the treatment of comfort women um, during World War II in Japan. Um, the Greens have been involved in the campaign with community groups in Australia and around the world calling for an official apologies from the Japanese government. And we think that it's extremely important that the Australian Parliament pass a motion calling for an official apology um, from the Japanese government, um, similar to the US Congress did last week in calling for an official apology, um, and that is what we support. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Payne be agreed to. Um, those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Um, we then move on to further formal motions. Um, Senator Fielding. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that general business, business of notice of motion number 921, standing in my name, relating to the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Fielding. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to regulate creeping acquisitions and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Fielding. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to regulate creeping acquisitions and for related purposes. Senator Fielding. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Brown. Thank you, President. Um, I ask for formality for motion number. 922, which any objection? Uh, celebrates the life of the grand old man of, of the Australian environment, Vincent Cerventi, who died recently, aged 91. And uh, I commend this motion to the Senate. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Brown. 
I thank the Senate and I move that motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, Senator Nettle. Uh, thank you. I ask that general business notice motion number 923, standing in my name for today, relating to the Carteret Islands and the um, sea level rise that they are experiencing as a result of climate change and the need for them to be relocated and calling for the government to assist them in that process be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Nettle. Thank you. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Nettle, I think you have further. I do. Uh, thank you. I ask that general business notice motion number 916, standing in my name for today, relating to um, Lucas Heights nuclear reactor, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Nettle. Thank you. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Nettle. Thank you. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 917, standing in my name for today, relating to the bushfires in Greece, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Nettle. Thank you. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Nettle be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the, con to the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Are there any further formal motions? If there are none, we move on to the uh, tabling of committee reports. Uh, just, uh, um, as indicated at item 7 of today's order of business and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall call on order of the day number 6 relating to committee reports, which relates to the 131st uh, report of the Committee of Privileges. If there is no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the Senate agree to recommendation at paragraph 40 and b endorse the finding at paragraph 41 of the 131st report. It, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGoran. On behalf of the Joint Committee on Publications, right. I present the report of the committee, printing standards for documents presented to Parliament, together with the Hansard record of the proceedings, minutes of the proceedings and submissions received by the committee. I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to incorporate a tabling statement in the Hansard. Is leave granted? If leave is granted, uh, the question is the motion moved by Senator McGoran be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, other committee reports. Senator Nash. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present the report of the committee inquiry into the prescription of terrorist organisations under the Australian Criminal Code. We done that one I move that the Senate take note of the, note of the report. Mr President, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I have pleasure in presenting the committee's report entitled Inquiry into the Prescription of Terrorist Organisations under the Australian Criminal Code. Mr President, combating international terrorism has become a high priority for national governments since the tragic loss of thousands of innocent lives in the terrorist attacks by al-Qaeda on the US in 2001. Over the past five years, terrorist violence has claimed hundreds more lives in attacks in Bali, Jakarta, Madrid and London. These events have signalled an increased threat to Australian interests and several prosecutions for alleged terrorist activity are currently before the courts. The power to list a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code was one element of a package of reforms adopted in 2002. Australia has listed 19 organisations, but so far prescription has not been an element in any of the prosecutions for terrorist organisation offences. No listed entity has applied to the minister to be delisted or sought judicial review in the courts. Despite this, it was evident throughout the inquiry that some sectors of the community continue to have concerns about the impact of prescription and, in particular, the breadth of terrorist organisation offences. 
Several witnesses called for reform that would see prescription transferred to the judiciary or a new advisory panel to advise the minister on possible listings. The committee considers that the current model of executive regulation and parliamentary oversight provides a transparent and accountable system that is consistent with international practice. However, there is clearly room to improve the public information available about the implications of listing and data on the application of the new terrorism laws. The appointment of an independent reviewer would make a significant contribution to those efforts. Mr President, I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Nash. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Nash be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Other committee reports. Senator Nash. Uh, I present the 24th report of the Publications Committee and move that the report be adopted. Thank you. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Further committee reports. Senator Workley. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present report number 89 of the committee treaties tabled on the 7th of August 2007 and move that the Senate take note of the report. I seek leave to incorporate a tabling statement. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. And the question is that that motion be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Any further committee reports? Senator Payne. Do you have a report? Senator Nash. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. I present additional information received by committees relating to estimates as listed at item 7 on today's order of business. Thank you. Senator O'Brien. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to take note of the additional information uh, from estimates from the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport uh, Committee, uh, and I uh, seek to incorporate my contribution, uh, which I understand has been agreed. And in addition, I seek leave to table documents which are referred to in my incorporated contribution. All right. Well, which Senator O'Brien, I'll, I'll just uh, you're seeking leave. Um, is l on both both matters. Um, is leave granted on both matters? If no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator O'Brien. Are there any further committee reports? In terms of Senator O'Brien's um, report, the question is that the Senate take note of the uh, material. Um, all of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Any further committee reports? <laughs> Nothing further at this stage. Thank you. Uh, Clark. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Bartlett for the disallowance of regulations. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move business of the Senate, notice of motion number three, standing in my name for today, uh, which is to disallow uh, certain components of uh, migration regulations. Um, as detailed in that uh, motion. I'm just searching for to make sure I get the wording right. But um, the Migration regula Amendment Regulations Number 7, Select Legislative Instrument Number 257 for this year. Um, and uh, the disallowance motion seeks to uh, simply disallow uh, four separate items within what is quite a large block of regulations. Now, at the start, I'd, I'd emphasise I realise this is both complex and uh, flagged at fairly short notice. I only put the uh, disallowance motion in yesterday. So at the start, I would once again make the point that uh, if we had fixed terms in this country, we would know whether or not we were sitting again in three weeks' time. And uh, I would have been able to have deferred the debate until uh, the next sitting period. Uh, so it would have been more opportunity to properly examine uh, the issue before us. And uh, that is as frustrating for me as it is for everybody else that has to deal with the issue on short notice, uh, but that is the reality of uh, the situation placed before it. If I don't move this disallowance motion today, then uh, that basically may be it. Uh, there will be no further opportunity, uh, certainly not until after the election, uh, which could mean not sitting the next sitting day, uh, possibly not even until February of next year, by which time the regulation will have been in force and operation for four or five months. 
uh, and becomes much more problematic to disallow. So I recognise the less than desirable circumstances. If we had fixed terms, uh, we would know uh, when the last sitting day was and we could plan and do our business accordingly. We don't have that, so we will have to operate in that air of uncertainty and uh, push forward um, with things now. Uh, I do also, of course, acknowledge that for that very same reason, we have about 20 pieces of legislation we have to get through before the um, end of the week, and therefore I will truncate my remarks somewhat more than I otherwise would in the circumstances. The, the core of the intent of the disallowance, and it's my understanding that it's the effect of the disallowance, uh, relates to changes to the general skilled migration program criteria, and in particular its impact on uh, family, family migration and the, the weight placed on uh, getting sponsorship from family who are already within Australia. Uh, the Democrats are on record over the years of giving uh, strong support to the family component of migration. Uh, the balance of our migration program over the last decade, and particularly in recent years, has tilted very heavily towards the uh, skilled program and uh, away from the family program and in very crude terms. When the Howard government came in, two-thirds of our migration intake was family related, one third was skilled. That's now pretty much reversed. Two thirds skills, one third family. It's putting the humanitarian criteria to one side. Um, I think that's a bit out of balance myself. I think we could rebalance it somewhat, but um, the, the key issue for me is not further um, degrading the importance of the family migration component. Uh, having said that, it does need to be emphasised as this. Uh, particular component of the regulation goes to is there's actually quite a bit of overlap. There's a significant part of our uh, skilled migration program that actually takes into account family linkages and whether or not people are already in Australia and keep a significant number of people who come here on skilled visas, both permanent skilled visas that are seen as part of the migration program and the, the long-term temporary ones, um, which are sometimes seen as separate to the migration program, uh, include. Uh, spouse visas linked to the skilled visa and uh, that sort of immediate family component. Uh, so there is an overlap there as well, which is not, often not immediately apparent given how the statistics are put forward. Uh, but in short, the changes the government has brought in from the 1st of September will um, uh, remove recognition for uh, applicants whose family Will not, further, will not provide any specific points for applicants whose families are already based here or prepared to sponsor them to Australia, uh, which, uh, in the Democrats' view, diminishes recognition of families important in the migration program uh, and migration process. Uh, it, it is, uh, as in many cases with uh, migration visas, quite complex, and, uh, but the, the basic effect will be to, to raise the, the base pass mark by five points. Um, because uh, it will, in effect, remove uh, okay. any uh, extra points for having um, family sponsorship of a uh, visa holder. It's, I, um, I would say it's not you know, the most monumental change made to our migration program in the, the history of Australia or even in recent years. It's uh, what might seem to be a small change, but. Uh, it is nonetheless one that uh, I believe is not warranted. Uh, looking through the background to the changes to the general skilled migration stream that came into effect from the 1st of September, uh, now all permanent visa applicants who are sponsored by an Australian relative are automatically awarded 15 points. Um, points for sponsorship will no longer be awarded to visa applicants sponsored by an Australian relative, uh, except for those that apply for the skilled regional sponsored um, visa. Um, the, there was an um, outline in the explanatory statement to the uh, amending regulation that um, gives some indication as to why the change has been made. Uh, there was uh, an evaluation of the general skilled migration categories made um, by uh, Bob Birrell, uh, Leslie Ann Hawthorne and Sue Richardson, um, which related to the subclass 138 visa, which has uh, been closed off by the changes that have come into effect from the 1st of September. 
uh, it raised some issues in regard to that. Uh, but without going through all those, in the interest of time, I shan't do that. Uh, but the report made some recommended changes to thresholds and points. Um, and it did recommend that the points test and current pass mark required by each visa subclass be maintained at current levels, which included the points for the Australian-sponsored subclass visa 138, um, uh, with such applicants to receive the concession of 15 points for family sponsorship. Now, in effect, by closing off subclass 138 uh, and introducing a different subclass, uh, the government has gone against that recommendation and has uh, removed the concession for family sponsorship. Um, the effect of this disallowance is not to remove the new subclass, uh, 176, the skilled and sponsored, but simply to restore the old subclass 138 to have that coexist alongside it, um, which would restore the concession for family sponsorship. Uh, now, that's a somewhat messy way of doing it, but that's the nature of regulations. When things are done via regulations, as senators would know, but the general community may not, uh, you can't, the Senate isn't empowered to add things into regulations, so all we can do is delete specific items. We can't uh, amend and take out bits within the items. Uh, we can't add in new parts. Uh, all we can do is allow or disallow either the whole thing or specific parts. Uh, so the effect of the disallowance, at least the intended effect, is to uh, restore the pre-existing subclass visa 138, which would also restore the concession for family sponsorship uh, for people um, under that particular uh, 138 visa, uh, which did deal with uh, one part of the general skilled migration program. Uh, because of time, I won't go into the wider debate about uh, the broader migration program, the broader skilled migration program and all the different components of it. Uh, I would like to take the, the, the opportunity just to make two key points. Uh, I do believe there needs to be much wider recognition of the massive expansion in long-term temporary visas into Australia, particularly in the skilled area, but in a whole range of other areas as well. Uh, in all of the debates about uh, improving integration of uh, migrants into our community, I think there is insufficient recognition of uh, the need to do more for people who arrive here on long-term temporary visas. Our settlement assistance and our focusing on people that are new arrivals focuses on people that are arriving with permanent visas. Um, and that's fine, and we do that moderately well, maybe even a bit better than moderately well. Uh, but there is a large group of people, a much larger now group of people, who first arrive here on long-term temporary visas who do not get access to settlement assistance because, in technical terms, they're not settling. And uh, they basically are having to make it on their own. Now, some of them get support through universities, some of them get support through their employers, but it's very much an ad hoc um, uh, potluck type of arrangement, and I don't think that's good enough. A lot of people, when they do get that permanent visa, have actually already been here for a number of years on temporary visas, particularly have come through student visas or through long-term temporary skilled visas, uh, and that includes, uh, and that is uh, something I need, I believe, needs to be focused on uh, much more. I'm, I'm one of those, which uh, is not a universal view, even within my own party, that we uh, do benefit from a very strong and large migration program, and I have no problem with the size of it, and I have no problem with it even expanding uh, a little bit more. Uh, I do have a problem if there was an excessive focus on skilled without the recognition of the importance of family. And this change the government's doing, I think, degrades that little bit more the recognition and uh, importance and benefit of, um, of family sponsorship and the family connection uh, that I think does need some recognition, particularly uh, when we are not doing as well as we need to in regard to settlement assistance and support for people when they first arrive here. Uh, the family in that circumstance, when they're being sponsored by family, plays a, an absolutely pivotal role. Uh, if you do have family already here, of course, uh, they are going to be, in many cases, the best settlement assistance you can get, better than anything government can provide. Uh, so I'm not even suggesting that uh, in calling for better settlement assistance that uh, it's a matter of government doing it all and government fixing everything. Um, I'm 
longer I hang around this place, the more I feel government isn't the solution to lots of things, and government tends to be more the problem half the time. Um, <laughs> must be your influence, Senator Mason. I must be rereading your first speech or something. But it's just while you guys are in government, I realise you guys call all the problems, so obviously government isn't the answer. <laughs> but the, um, quite seriously, as, as all of my comments have been serious, the, the, um, um, the, the role of government is to adopt policies that facilitates an outcome, and often that doesn't mean the government just putting more and more money into government programs and trying to splat them over the top of people. Uh, it's recognising what skills and abilities and benefits are there in the community, and the family is a key one of those, uh, particularly in this migration context. Uh, and, uh, and in regards to improving settlement support and assistance, um, it can well be uh, just more support recognition facilitation for the family to provide that and for others within the community, whether it's business, whether it's universities, whether it's anybody else, and uh, more assistance for them to provide that support uh, rather than you know, some other separate government-funded program. Um, that's just a very general comment, but it goes to, I think, an important point. Uh, the number of people that come in here on temporary long-term visas now far outstrips. I think it's at least double and, and possibly even treble the numbers that come on permanent visas. Uh, so, in terms of our overall migration program, uh, they are actually the key part of it, and they're the part that get missed out in the migration debate. Now, I've gone off on a bit of a uh, tangent, although it is a related tangent, uh, because I think that point needs to be made as often as possible, and it's a key part of the migration debate that is not recognised. Uh, but to come back to the core point, uh, the Democrats believe there needs to be more clear recognition of the importance of family and the uh, component of family, both direct and uh, indirect in regard to um, points concessions for family sponsorship in our migration program. Uh, we don't believe this change is warranted, and I'd have to say I don't believe— well, it, it is clearly not, at least on the, my understanding of the recommendations from the, the review done by uh, Mr Birrell and others, the evaluation of the general skilled migration categories. Uh, it is not consistent with their recommendation. Uh, and in the absence of uh, sufficient justification given by the government, I don't believe that we should um, proceed with that change. Senator Nettle. Um, <coughs> thank you. The Greens are concerned that these regulations will make it more difficult for migrants to bring their family members here. We think that's a great shame because we know that migrants settle best when they are around close family members. And we note the comments of various different migrant groups in the community who believe that these regulations will be an effective way of ending the family reunion program by stealth, something that we don't want to see occur. So we are concerned that these, what these regulations will do um, is just make it more difficult for migrants to settle in Australia and to be surrounded and supported by family members in the process of settling in Australia. Thank you, Senator Nettle. Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the, uh, in terms of the disallowance uh, of the Migration Amendment Regulation 2007, number seven, uh, Senator Bartlett is right when he says it is a complex uh, issue. It was only uh, put in yesterday and on relatively short notice. It would have, uh, I think, as Senator Bartlett recognises, been, uh, been much better to have been dealt with uh, in the next sitting period to allow all of those matters to be examined in detail prior to uh, having this debate. I do recognise uh, this is potentially the last uh, week we are sitting, unless the government uh, chooses to rule that out uh, and allow us uh, some confidence that we will be able to debate it uh, in uh, the next sitting period. I doubt the uh, government uh, will be in a position to be able to do that, quite frankly. So I do understand. Uh, Notwithstanding uh, that, uh, why Senator Bartlett then has uh, brought it on, uh, recognising that it is uh, short notice. The uh, opposition uh, won't be supporting the uh, disallowance motion. We do think it's a complex matter. We do think that uh, it is a substantial regulation, and the point that uh, Senator Bartlett is trying to depack in this complex regulation is one point within a range of uh, matters. I understand that uh, the way disallowance motions work, and Senator Bartlett, uh, I think, went to that point. It is uh, a matter where you have only a blunt instrument. You can say yes or no to the regulation, even if you uh, disagree with only one part of it or wish to change one part of it. It's not a 
It's not like legislation where you can amend it uh, and change it uh, or seek to amend it and seek to uh, change only that part which you might disagree with. Having said all that, when you do look at uh, the change that is being uh, put forward, the explanatory sp statement itself to the amending regulation states uh, that the new paragraph uh, 1128B subsection 3 subsection DA, uh, someone should, uh, as an aside, uh, go through and try to renumber that to make it more intelligible, but notwithstanding that, provides that an application by a person seeking to satisfy the primary criteria for the grant of a subclause 138 skilled Australian sponsored visa must be made before 1 September 2007. The effect of this amendment is to prevent further applicants being made on or after 1 September 2007 for a skilled Australian sponsored migrant class BQ visa by persons seeking to satisfy the primary criteria for sub clause 138. The, uh, that of course follows uh, and it describes the Australian sponsor sponsored uh, matters. It followed a evaluation of the general skilled migration categories. Of course, uh, Senator Bartlett uh, went to that particular uh, report himself. It's interesting to note in that report that uh, what seems to uh, uh, is suggested within that report itself is that where you have uh, subclause subclass, I should say, 138 uh, sponsored migrants, successful applicants who benefit from this concession are not required to live near their uh, sponsoring relatives. About half settle in Sydney and uh, 15 to 20 per cent in Perth, according to the Adimia settlement data. The uh, other issue, of course, raised in that report itself was offshore migrants who are sponsored, especially those sponsored by family or by region do least well on obtaining employment soon after arrival. Almost 30 per cent of the latter two groups are not employed. Furthermore, at least a quarter of those who are working are only employed part-time. While and the report went on to say, I should quote, while we cannot be completely certain of these reasons for this lower rate of employment, it is likely that it is caused in part by the less stringent selection criteria that these two concessional categories require. The report uh, then also went on to say the visa carriers that do worst on annual earnings are the 138, 139 and 882. And I quote, these are the Australian sponsored visas where successful applicants faced a lower pass mark or were, or were not uh, points tested. The large negative effect for annual earnings reflects the fact that these groups have more difficulty in finding full-time employment as well as they face a wage penalty when they do find a job. Having uh, said all that, the report did make uh, recommendations. When you look at the uh, overall change, though, it, the government uh, didn't follow those recommendations in the strict sense of the word. They lowered the points in some respects for the uh, skilled uh, portion, but have brought a rather complex, as I've said, regulation forward. So we note uh, the government is dealing with a significant problem in this area where, uh, where those who have been relying on sponsorship to meet the points requirement have been least likely to obtain employment soon after arrival. And to that extent, uh, Labor is not convinced that the points mechanism is the only uh, way or indeed the best way of dealing with this problem. Nevertheless, uh, Labor does recognise that is an attempt by the government to increase the likelihood that those arriving under the skilled migration program do in fact uh, enter uh, the, labor, the workforce itself. What we can say, though, uh, we will continue to monitor the success of these changes uh, to see how they uh, work through. It is recognised that there has been an issue that has been raised within uh, the ethnic community councils of New South Wales, where they do uh, strongly urge, and I think Senator Bartlett has uh, done that today, that the government reconsider the proposed regulations. It is recognised that they have a strong voice in the community representing uh, the ethnic communities right across the New South Wales. To the extent that the government does have the opportunity uh, today, they should be able to then 
provide their uh, further justification, their reasons for uh, the changes that are mooted and how they will ensure that it does not uh, adversely impact upon the programs that uh, have been important to the ethnic communities of New South Wales. In uh, having said all that, uh, the uh, position that we have adopted, of course, is that we will uh, continue to monitor the success of these changes to ensure that they do have a, uh, a impact that is positive rather than a negative impact in those communities as well. Thank you, Senator Ludwig. Minister. Uh, Mr. Ang, Deputy President, thank you. Um, the government will be opposing Senator Bartlett's uh, disallowance motion. As Senator Bartlett did indicate, uh, Schedule 41, items 41 and 72 of the Migration Amendment Regulations 2007, number 7, have the effect of closing the skilled Australian sponsored visa, subclass 138. This visa has been replaced by the skilled sponsored migrant visa, subclass 176, during a process of visa rationalisation. This visa has a greater emphasis on skills in demand in, in Australia and English requirements to meet Australia's skills needs. Schedule 2, items 7 and 8, have the effect of removing the assurance of support for the subclass 138 visa. Mr. Act Deputy President, in consultation with Centrelink, it was decided to remove the assurance of support for the subclass 138 visa. It was a mandatory requirement, but as the visa applicants need to be schooled, it was decided that an assurance of support wasn't necessary and indeed had the effect of limiting the number of applicants for this visa category. Uh, Senator Bartlett uh, and uh, Senator Ludwig have spoken more generally about immigration policy. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government believes in strong, strong immigration management for a prosperous and indeed a, a cohesive nation. The government's migration program is keeping our economy strong by keeping pace with the demand for skilled labour while ensuring we have a, a cohesive and an integrated community. The government has increased the English language level required for all skilled migrants, a minimum of year 10 equivalent English, ranging to university level English is now required across all skilled visa categories. Priority is given to those with the highest level of English. In, genu in general, Mr Acting Deputy President, in relation to Australia's annual migration program, there is now a focus on entrants who can contribute. Australia has an ageing population and, of course, a growing economy. The Howard government believes that it's essential that new migrants bring skills to contribute to the workforce and a commitment to integrate into Australia's community. Our migration program is focused on skill migration to ensure that new arrivals can join the workforce and integrate quickly into our society. The migration program for 2007-2008 provides 102,500 places, that's 67 per cent of the annual migration program, for skilled migration, compared to only 24,000, that was 30 per cent, under the Labor government. That's an enormous change. In government, Labor did not focus on skills. Labor used the migration program for political gain. Labor allocated, allocated 70 per cent of places to family reunions for people with little or no prospect of joining the workforce. In a very interesting speech by Barry Jones, the former Labor minister and indeed, of course, the federal president of the Australian Labor Party, in a speech quoted in Paul Sheehan's Among the Barbarians, The Dividing of Australia, Mr Jones said, the handling of it, that's immigration by the previous Labor government, was, I have to say, less than distinguished. Partly because, I think, it was seen as very important, a tremendously important element in building up a long-term political constituency. There was that sense that you might get the Greek vote locked up or, from other party political points of view, you might get the Chinese vote locked up." End of quote. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Howard government has refocused the migration family stream to provide places for all those who will contribute to the economy and our community. Many young professionals travel internationally 
and develop relationships with other young skilled professionals. We have increased the number of partner visa by 4,000 places to enable these young professionals to live and work here in Australia. The government will be opposing Senator Bartlett's disallowance motion. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Just briefly to, to close the debate, um, a slightly political contribution there from Senator Mason, so I probably need to respond to a couple of his points. Um, but uh, firstly, I, I um, accept the points that, that people have made. Indeed, I've uh, called a number of times for the, the streamlining and rationalisation of visa categories. Um, it's, as may be evidenced by people trying to interpret this debate, it's an incredibly complex area and all of the different subclasses and subparagraphs and criteria that flow around the place and are continually changing is, is absolutely bamboozling. Um, and uh, I think we have about 150 separate visa subclasses in Australia, which I think is just uh, an absurd, absurd and excessive uh, number of different uh, categories uh, to have for people that are simply trying to, to migrate to Australia or to, or to come here I mean, for um, temporary purposes. You need some different criteria, but I think having 150 is really getting quite over the top. So uh, I support rationalisation. I just don't support this particular one component of this rationalisation because uh, I think it downplays the, the family component. Um, certainly it helps people integrate if they have an increased chance of getting a job when they get here. There's no doubt about that, but that does not guarantee integration uh, or effective integration and comprehensive integration. And having recognition for family who are here is another key avenue and I would argue more likely to be a solid, long-term, more wide-ranging mechanism for integration. So it's not a matter of skills are the way to go or family is the way to go. I think it's a matter of getting the balance better. Now, may well be that, um, that the balance was out of whack under Labor. I think it's now out of whack in the other direction under Liberal. I think we need to balance them out more. Um, you know, the point's been made many times. I shall only make it briefly now that one of the reasons why we have to have such a large skilled intake is because of the lack of investment uh, by the coalition government over more than 10 years in skilling people who are already here. Uh, and that includes many of the migrants after they arrive uh, do need continual reskilling, as do Australian-born people. And because we've underinvested in that area, the requirement, in part, uh, for such a big component of the migration program to be in the skills area uh, has, has occurred. Having said that, uh, we always will need to, um, or we always should, be looking to uh, bring skilled migrants here. Australia has been built uh, in large part on the contribution of migrant labour, both skilled and unskilled, and through doing that in itself, generating that prosperity, creates more demand and creates more uh, need for those further skills and that further labour. Uh, so it's a, a self-generating process, generating prosperity, generating a need for more migration, but also needing to do better at skilling the people that are here, migrants, uh, new recent arrivals, long-term um, members of the Australian community. Uh, and we don't do that well enough. Uh, but to me, as part of that, it, it isn't just getting people here as economic units and getting them into the workforce. We are undervaluing. And it's, it's particularly ironic, I guess, coming from a, a government that would normally be seen to be more uh, likely to be spruiking the, the central role of the family, that we're undervaluing the contribution and the component and the role of family, uh, both in uh, assisting migrants uh, to be uh, grounded in the Australian community and, I might say, in that wider role of integration, uh, of uh, maximising the, the effectiveness of, of multiculturalism uh, and ensuring that all Australians benefit uh, most effectively and most uh, completely from that. Uh, so I think we've we've got to do a lot more to, to get the balance and recycling some of the what I think is basically mythology, even if it's mythology spruiked by Barry Jones himself. I still think it's mostly mythology, uh, as most people know in this area. The idea of locking up the Greek vote or locking up the Arab vote or locking up the Lebanese vote or locking up the Chinese vote is uh, grossly overstated. Uh, locking up any vote, the gay vote, the, the English migrant vote, the New Zealander vote, it just doesn't work that way. And you might be able to do a little bit here and there, but the, the notion that you know there's these big clumps of people that you can shift around as a voter block is, is grossly overstated in my view. Uh, and I think Barry Jones, whilst he has lots of skills, is not necessarily most skilled in uh, 
assessing that aspect of the political process, if I might say so. Um, so the, the core concerns of the, the Democrats remain in regard to this, and certainly uh, uh, we will continue to push for our view that there needs to be greater recognition of, of uh, family component in the migration program. Uh, I would, as an aside, note that in amongst the many changes the federal government has made over the decade or so has, that are, remains seriously problematic is the major cutback and continual capping of uh, age parents migration. Uh, there is a waiting list of over 20 years for uh, the non-contributory aged parent visa category, uh, which uh, obviously if you're thinking 20 years and you're relating it to aged parents uh, is less than satisfactory. Uh, and I think that's a, a terrible undervaluing of the, the role that uh, parents and family play in, in integration and in the, the wider contribution to the Australian community, even if they're not all going to come here and go out and get jobs and become doctors and nurses straight away. Uh, there are other contributions that migrants make um, and that parents make and grandparents make. And uh, I think that's an area that the government needs to reconsider and re-examine. Uh, having said that, uh, clearly on this occasion, uh, this uh, disallowance is not going to be successful, um, but I think it is uh, important to continue to, to highlight the uh, need to give greater weight to the role of family in uh, migrants and migrations, the migration systems, and also, I might say, in what is quite a complex points system that applies to various uh, visa categories uh, to downgrade or remove. Uh, the family linkage, I think, is a mistake. Thank you, Senator Bartlett. The question is that this allowance of four items of the Migration Amendment Regulations 2007, number seven, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Clark. Business of the Senate order of the day, number one, report of the Community Affairs Committee to be presented. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present the report of the Community Affairs Committee, Highway to Health, Better Access for Rural, Regional and Remote Patients, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee and move that the report be printed. The motion before us is that the report be printed and tabled. Is that motion agreed to? Those that can say aye against say no, the ayes have it. Senator Humphreys. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is that motion agreed to? Those that can say aye against no, the ayes have it. Senator Humphreys. Oh, yeah, I, please leave. Thank you. I move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, uh, this report uh, is a report into the various uh, patient assisted travel schemes which operate around Australia. In 1978, uh, a federal patient assistant travel scheme uh, was established, uh, and at that point um, it was operated by the Commonwealth Government. In 1986, uh, that uh, scheme was devolved to the various states and territories of Australia. And this inquiry was intended to establish how well those schemes served the need of Australians living in rural, remote uh, Australia. Uh, it found that there were serious inadequacies in the various schemes that the subsidy levels were unrealistically low in many cases, that the thresholds uh, that people had to travel before they qualified for assistance were often too high, that the schemes themselves were complex and obscure, that access to them was uh, difficult, uh, and that there were marked inconsistencies between the way these schemes operated from one jurisdiction to another. And when so many people were in effect crossing state boundaries uh, by virtue of these schemes to access services, those uh, inconsistencies became a matter of some um, uh, vexation to the users of the schemes. What was disturbing also was that, uh, in conjunction with those, uh, those facts, there, were clear, there was clear evidence of lower health outcomes for people living in rural and remote Australia. For example, uh, more depression uh, for people in remote Australia, lower levels, uh, I'm sorry, higher rates of communicable disease. Um, a greater incidence of very low birth weight uh, babies, and generally lower levels of life expectancy. Now, we might expect that there'd be a certain degree of uh, lower or worse health outcomes by virtue of people living a long way from health services, but the question is whether the various PATS schemes 
are able to mitigate the effect of that distance, and real questions remain as a result of this inquiry as to whether they effectively do that. Uh, PATS um, certainly alleviates some of the financial burden associated with having to travel for medical assistance, but a relatively small proportion of that. Something like a fifth to a tenth um, of the costs uh, usually entailed in travelling long distances for medical assistance is the kind of level of reimbursement that people can expect. And that leaves many Australians uh, with significant financial hardship associated with uh, medical, uh, medical illness. Most disturbingly, perhaps, is the fact that the cost of travel actually dissuades some people from seeking medical attention. It actually uh, dampens demands for certain preventative services like, for example, uh, ca breast cancer screening, and it leads, leads others uh, to choose not to be treated or to be treated too late um, for intervention to be effective. Uh, that has led the committee to make a number of recommendations, key among which um, are that uh, there should be um, a building in uh, to the next Australian health care agreement um, of attention to this issue so it becomes one of the measures whereby uh, Australia um, engages the effectiveness of its health and, related, and hospital related services. And secondly, that the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Committee establish a task force to look at a range of issues uh, affecting the operation of the PAT schemes, including obviating the differences between jurisdictions uh, and also establishing national standards which will ensure that uh, a certain uh, amount of consistency uh, can be achieved and the standards applicable in these schemes can be raised across the nation. Uh, I don't propose to speak for any longer than that. I simply want to thank the committee secretariat for its very hard work in putting together this report. I thank the other members of the committee and I particularly thank uh, the senator who was the driving force uh, and inspiration for this inquiry, uh, Senator Judith Adams. Um, it is true that the committee began the task of this inquiry with a certain um, reluctance uh, based on some view that this might not be an issue of great substance. I have to say by the end of the inquiry we were, conv we were convinced that this is an issue affecting very substantially uh, all people who live in rural and remote areas of Australia and does need uh, very serious po public policy attention. Thank you, Senator Humphrey. Senator Moore. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the committee actually always felt, most of us, that this was a position of great substance. And the, um, the reason we felt that way, Mr Acting Deputy President, is that so many people who have come to talk to our Community Affairs Committee in previous committee hearings on things such to do with cancer, the cancer journey, um, the gynaecological cancer services we did, even the poverty inquiry several years ago, the issue of patient assistant travel was one that came up in their evidence. And if you do a scroll through the, uh, the website, you'll find that so many people who uh, live across our country actually acknowledge that the cost of travelling to get their right to effective health services um, was deterring them from actually making the decisions that could be best for their health and for the health of their families. I think the most confronting thing for all of us in this process was hearing the evidence from um, people across the country, not limited to one state. These issues were common across every state that we visited, and those where we could not visit, we had written submissions. The inquiry was long awaited. And I know that the recommendations of this inquiry, um, there are many people who are waiting to see them and to see what difference we could make um, as a result of the evidence that they gave to us. So I particularly, again, and I think this is a common theme for our committee, want to thank the people from across the country who were prepared to be involved in the Senate process, who actually acknowledged that there were significant issues around the costs of travel and accommodation linked to health services, and were who prepared to come and talk with us about those things. These inquiries would not operate if we were not getting submissions or evidence from people. And again, we were um, overwhelmed, I think, by um, how many people wished to talk with us. The recommendations, as Senator Humphreys have pointed out, um, 
are focused at bringing this issue higher on the priority list. Because we did have evidence from m many state governments. My own state government gave a um, detailed submission but did not feel they needed to come and give evidence at the inquiry. But nonetheless, they did provide um, detailed submission to the inquiry process. And the kinds of evidence that state governments were giving us had a common theme. They all acknowledged that there was a need for a patient assistant travel scheme. They all told us about internal reviews that they'd taken to look at um, the needs in their own areas, and they all reinforced the fact that the patient assistant travel scheme, or whatever it's called in their local jurisdictions, was only ever meant to be a subsidy scheme. There was never any intent that it was going to be a full reimbursement of costs. That was common. What was also common from the committee's experience was that we acknowledge it should be a subsidy, Mr Acting Deputy President. We don't think the subsidy is enough. And I think that that reaction was shared um, in every state. Uh, I do also want to pay particular credit to Senator Adams, who has, I think, taken this um, particular committee and taken us with her. Um, in her quest to ensure that the issue of patient assistant travel is recognised, that it's brought up the, um, to the authority at each state government to say that whilst there have been efforts to improve schemes, and I think that was common and should be acknowledged in every state, that they, they, the evidence that we were hearing was not new to any state authority. Um, but in terms of the action that's been taken, there has been some movement forward, but it needs to be coordinated. It needs to be a COAG issue. Um, and we need to ensure that the kinds of figures that we heard in terms of travel subsidy and in terms of accommodation subsidy, they need to be increased. Because people who are in crisis about their health don't need the extra pain and suffering of um, financial problems. I also just briefly want to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, I think for me the most worrying aspect was the evidence that we received that people were making health decisions um, based on their economic situation. And, um, I think I will be haunted by the evidence that we received in Alice Springs, and it came up in other places too, but I, I am particularly haunted by the evidence we received in Alice Springs about women who were making decisions about breast screening and also subsequent urgent breast cancer treatments based on access to services in their local areas, which were not existent. As we speak today, there is no effective screening process in Central Australia for breast cancer. Amongst all the other issues that we're facing in these areas of health care, that one just comes, comes very close to my own experience, and it's one that I was worried about. I could not help but contrast my own experience with the way I was supported and taken very quickly through immediate treatment with that which is available to women in that part of Australia. If, if we can do anything with this inquiry, it's bringing that to public awareness, actually bringing the, pub, the patient assistant travel scheme to public awareness. We can make a difference. There is good will. There's got to be good action. Thank you, Senator Moore. Senator Boyce. Your Acting Deputy President, um, as a relatively new senator, this is the first inquiry I've had the opportunity to participate in from beginning to end, and I'd like to thank the Secretariat and the members of the committee, particularly Senator Judith Adams, for the uh, experience, the fact that uh, the very worthwhile experience that this uh, inquiry produced. Um, I think probably the first thing to say about the PATS programs as they are uh, in, used in each state is that they are very little programs trying to do a massive job. They are trying to provide equity of access to people from rural and remote areas with a very small subsidy. And I think one of the things that uh, particularly struck me in regard to the submissions that we did receive from the state governments was the very cautious nature of those submissions in terms of trying to control the money. We heard evidence that often towards the end of the budget year uh, people would be denied access or, or refused uh, subsidies when earlier in the year that it would appear that that very same set of circumstances would have received a subsidy. So there was not only lack of consistency between states but lack of consistency within states in terms of the subsidies given to people. And to me the, the very real value of this inquiry was the fact that it put a human face on the, the 
those decisions, the fact of a mother not being a given subsidy to donate uh, an organ for her son's welfare, a son who was in his 30s and had children, obviously someone that this community needs to be as healthy as he can be. It also spoke about one of the uh, images I think that will haunt me, as uh, Senator Moore pointed out, was the image of a very sick Indigenous man from remote Australia arriving at Adelaide Airport for treatment and not being met by anybody and not understanding how one might get from the airport to the hospital. So obviously there is a lot of work to be done to improve this and I would recommend certainly and uh, support the comments of my fellow senators that uh, COAG is the place to do the work that we need to give real access to, uh, to health facilities to remote and rural Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Boyce. Senator Polly. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise too to speak on this report. And can I say from the outset that uh, I too share my fellow senators' views and thank uh, Judith Adam for her contribution to ensure that we follow through on this inquiry. And I think it'd be fair to say that Senator Adams, coming from WA, uh, knew only too well the issues facing um, her West Australian fellow citizens in trying to access adequate uh, medical services, as I too do, um, living in Tasmania. And although we're geographically not as large as WA, certainly the distances and uh, the landscape of Tasmania does make it difficult in accessing uh, services at times. Can I say that um, although we are from WA and we represent most states and territories on this uh, committee, that this is a national issue, and this is one of those issues that we cannot afford to we cannot afford to bl you know play that blame game because this is a, a responsibility of state governments and uh, the federal government to address this. Can I also say that uh, from the evidence that was given? The, there were many instances of very emotional evidence that was given about hardships from family members uh, that where Pats doesn't actually allow family members always to travel. Um, people can find themselves in cities where they're unknown. There were many issues relating to the lack of financial assistance through this uh, scheme because, as Senator Moore said, it, it was there to subsidise. But I think it's fair to say that we have to address the concerns that was raised in this inquiry in relation to the money that's afforded uh, for accommodation. I think we have to look at uh, other options for accommodating people when they do have to travel either interstate or intrastate, as they do um, in our great country. I think the, the concerning issue that confronted myself and I'm sure my fellow colleagues is the, the families are now making decisions about their health based on financial circumstances. And I think that's something that we all need to be reminded of and to ensure that these 16 recommendations, which I agree with other speakers, are very good recommendations. But I feel very strongly that we have to follow up on this inquiry. Too many reports uh, gather dust um, in uh, this place, and I, for one, would like to be able to participate and uh, continue to monitor this scheme. Can I also uh, place on record my thanks to the Secretariat for their hard work, and I think without a doubt the Community Affairs Secretariat uh, probably work harder than most other uh, secretariats, if I dare say that. Uh, but can I also particularly thank those people who came before us and gave ev evidence, and particularly all those written submissions that we received, and I commend the report. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Carol Brown. Thank you. Um, I also um, would like to support all the um, um, speeches given here today on um, the Patient Assistant Travel Scheme inquiry. And I will start by putting on my um, support for our leader in this inquiry, and I have to say excuse myself to the chair and the deputy chair, Senator Humphreys, and more, but um, it was quite clear um, this inquiry was driven and led by S Senator Adams. Now, um, what also was clear out of these hearings was that there was some fundamental um, 
problems, and and that and one of those was the promotion of the actual scheme. Particularly in Tasmania, we heard two um, two stories of where uh, uh, patients changes were made to the patient assistant travel scheme that actually were beneficial to um, the patients, and one in uh, to do with renal dialysis and the, ch the change to the strict 75k travel rule. And there didn't seem to be a view that, other than changing, making that change, that it actually should be promoted. I can, uh, the uh, Kidney Health Australia, Tasmanian branch, knew nothing about the change. Um, I, most of the patients that it affected knew nothing about the change. It was left up to the coordinators in Burnie. Now, in Tasmania, we do have a review committee, which is a standing committee, I believe, which uh, encompasses the coordinators and other managers of the scheme, but it doesn't have a consumer advocate on it. Now, what was clear is that consumers are concerned that they are being left out. They're not being listening, listened to, and they want their concerns addressed. Now, this inquiry provided for many witnesses, particularly their users and the users and their advocates and their carers, an invaluable opportunity, some for the very first time, to give voice to their concerns and put their views forwards as to the benefits, shortcomings, and the fundamental importance of a patient assistant travel scheme to a national audience. Now, the terms of reference regarding the operation and effectiveness of the sc travel schemes uh, allowed us to range over all aspects of the schemes, such as the need for greater national consistency and uniformity, the need for national minimum standards, the current level of utilisation of the scheme, and, of course, the level of unmet need. The depth of interest in this inquiry is indicative of the depth in which health issues are engaged in in this country. My home state of Tasmania is, has the most dispersed population. Tasmania has the highest percentage of any Australian state located outside its capital city. And given Tasmania's relatively low population to other states, a range of specialist services are not available intrastate, which means assistance with travel is essential for many Tasmanians. What is clear from the committee's work was there needed to be an increased patient liaison and better communication to ensure continuity of care for patients. What was also clear was that the demand for PACs would increase and that other pressures would also uh, impact on the demand for the scheme. So what we have heard is that there is a great need, but there is also a massive job to be done. And that's why I'm, I fully support um, the recommendations, particularly recommendation two that says, that, and I quote, that as a matter of urgency, the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council establish a task force comprised of government, consumer and practitioner representatives to develop a set of national standards for patient assistant travel schemes that ensure equity of access to medical services for people living in rural, regional and remote Australia. And um, it does need to be a national approach. That was clear from all the submissions that were received, and it was clear um, that is what the patients need and want. So I would also would like to commend um, the Secretariat for their work. They've, as usual, they've done a very good job. And I commend the report to the Senate, Highway to Health, Better Access for Rural, Remote, Regional and Remote Patients, and, and I hope that these very important recommendations will be taken up and acted upon. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Adams. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. And firstly, um, as I rise to uh, speak to uh, this report, I would like to uh, sincerely thank my Senate colleagues for agreeing that the Community Affairs Committee could hold this inquiry 
As um, the chair of the committee said at the start, they were a little dubious. Well, certain members were a little dubious about whether this was a very important inquiry. But I think we have uh, probably proved that, and with the tabling of this report today, uh, for those who read it, will certainly realise that there is a problem in uh, rural and remote Australia. So I um, would like to thank uh, the committee members. They've certainly supported me um, very, very strongly and thank them for their remarks. And to the committee secretariat, I would like to thank them. Uh, it's no easy task with 190 public submissions and four confidential submissions, plus um, we held hearings in Canberra, Alice Springs, Melbourne, Perth, Launceston and Brisbane, which meant they all had to travel and uh, leave their homes and put in uh, some rather horrific hours because when we visited, uh, went to other places, especially Alice Springs, we were able to go and look at the um, Aboriginal Congress and also visit the hospital and speak to those people who were actively involved with actually policing the system. And I think by doing this, it gave everyone an, an idea of just how important the system was. But um, I'd like to quote from my first speech um, in this place, which was on the uh, 11th of August 2005. And in that I said, I firmly believe that the patient assistance travel schemes in each state need best practice national guidelines to ensure rural patients have flexibility in accessing the best possible medical assistance. Since the Commonwealth handed the responsibility of the patient assisted travel scheme, PATS, over to the states in 1987. This issue has been reviewed many times and, as has been stated, recommendations from five recent parliamentary committee reports have highlighted the problems associated with these travel schemes. We have the evidence and data to tackle the problem and I will be strongly recommending to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee, as it was at that stage, that the administration of PATS must be dealt with urgently. It is a complex issue as it falls within the state's jurisdiction, but something must be done. So after two years of <laughs> probably um, really annoying my colleagues, but pushing very, very hard, we've finally tabled our report. And uh, that is uh, no mean feat. And I think that the people that have actually um, put forward the submissions, all the support we've had from the organisations, which um, I will just uh, quickly go through the National Rural Health Alliance, of which I was a member for six years as a councillor representing the Australian Healthcare Association. That has 27 organisations, which include rural nurses, doctors, allied health groups, service providers such as the Royal Flying Doctor Service, consumer groups like CWA and academics. And the support that we've had from uh, the national bodies such as the AMA, the Australian General Practice Networks, state governments, local governments, can cancer groups, Aboriginal <coughs> health organisations, teaching hospitals, consumers and health service boards. It just goes to show that um, this inquiry really was a national inquiry. Everyone is concerned about it and um, as there are less and less of us living out in, in um, rural and regional areas and remote areas, I think that um, we've really done a service. We've got the evidence now. It's there for someone at a higher plane to act on, and that has to be the coordination of all the states, because at the moment we have, excuse the pun, but uh, really a dog's breakfast um, as far as the different areas of the PAT system go. I, just like, I was very um, pleased to receive from the AMA um, and, uh, just bridging the gap, which we celebrated um, several days ago, and their fifth um, item on their um, uh, flyer is um, very, very good. That's about the patient-assisted travel scheme. But I just think this is important to note, coming from a body such as the AMA, the Australian healthcare system is based on the principle that all Australians are able to have access to the same level of healthcare regardless of where they live. Those who live in regional, rural and remote Australia should not be disadvantaged if they must travel to larger centres to access quality health care. And they also go on to say, which is one of our recommendations, um, the AMA believes that the Commonwealth should work with the states and territories to expand PATS to cover other treatments available under the Medical Benefits Scheme, which is known as the MBS, including access to allied health professionals, 
where a doctor coordinates the patient's overall care. And in this climate, PATS is really very much out of date since it was handed over to the state in 1987. And we really do need to look at how we actually organise health. Primary health care is very, very important, but no longer is it just the um, bailiwick of the doctor, the GP or the specialist. It's the multidisciplinary team that sit behind them as their support. And this might be with our remote area nurses, it's definitely with our allied health people. And for my, uh, the way I looked at this, I think it is so important and it's part of one of our recommendations that instead of being sent to the nearest specialist, who may not be the most appropriate specialist, um, and this because of uh, having to go to someone that really isn't quite the person you should be seeing, that person, the patient, is going to then create um, probably a much larger debt as far as the health system goes than they would have if they'd been able to actually access the most appropriate specialist. So this has been one of my very, very strong pushes, and we have that contained in one of our recommendations. And uh, with the development of national standards, which I spoke about in my first speech, I've said um, this is our recommendation. It should include, but not to be limited, by consideration of the following areas. Patient escorts, including approval for psychosocial support. At the moment, it is only for medical support. And how many people are sent to the um, city areas to be by themselves while they undergo treatment for radiotherapy and uh, for chemotherapy and for other um, issues that, or other um, symptoms that they may have to be treated for? They're alone. How, I mean, this is just completely unfair. It's cruel. It's just just not on at all. And we found with our Indigenous people when we went to um, Alice Springs, uh, some of the horrific stories we, he we heard there, there's a number of these patients, English is not their first language. They're sent off by themselves on an aircraft or in a bus, probably never having been in an aircraft before, to a city, and then nobody meets them, nobody takes them anywhere. Where do they stay? What happens? And there have been some dreadful instances um, one in the Northern Territory of um, an elderly, well, an elder, um, a very old gentleman being uh, dropped off at the airport and um, unfortunately had nowhere to go very early in the morning and um, he was found deceased seven days later. I mean, these are the sort of things that just can't happen in this day and age. We have other instances, uh, especially in my home state of Western Australia, where the bus drops a patient off a mother with a baby at three in the morning and she's got another 400 kilometres to go hoping someone will come and collect her. They don't come and collect her. These are the sort of things that we just have to do something about. So patient escorts are very, very important. Uh, the second probably problem is now with um, obstetric services in rural and regional areas being limited to, um, for safety sake and litigations. Uh, the fact that you have to have an, um, an operating theatre that, um, and an anaesthetist standing Senator by. Adams, so, your time has expired. Right, thank you. Um, I'd like to seek leave to continue my remarks at a later date. Thank you, Senator Adams. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Clerk. Business of the Senate Order of the Day number two for the presentation of a report by the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee. Senator Perry. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I was a bit eager there for a moment. Uh, on behalf of Senator Payne, I present the report of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee on its examination of annual reports tabled by 30 April 2007 and move that the report be printed. Is that motion granted? That motion is agreed. Clerk. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures No. 2 Bill 2007 for concurrence. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Is that motion agreed to? Those that can say aye against, I know the ayes have it. Min uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law rela in relation to Social Security and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the debate be now adjourned. 
Is that motion agreed to? Those of the Prince say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Aye. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Is that motion agreed to? Those opinion ayes, against no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, sorry, Clark. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Health Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Those that opinion say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to health and private health insurance and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Is that motion agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Yes. Ah, Minister, my apologies. Uh, the clerk needs to read the title, and then if you could move that the resumption of the debate be read. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Is that motion agreed to? Those that opinion say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Tax Laws Amendment to 2007 Measures No. 5, Bill 2007, and informing the Senate that the House has made the amendments requested by the Senate. Minister. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Is that motion agreed to? Those opinions say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Thank you. A message has been received from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Classification, Publications, Films, Films and Computer Games Amendment Terrorist Material Bill 2007, Second Reading Adjourned Debate. Question is, Senator Stottis Boyer. I believe that I'm about to move Democrat amendment. Uh, I think number one standing in my name. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Directing Deputy uh, President? We're moving Senator into the Stottis committee Boyer, stage we're, we're now. We're not in committee oh, we're stage. Committee we're still stage. on second, second reading stage, and I'm seeking the call from any further uh, minister. Any further Thank speakers, you, Mr. minister? Deputy President. I think that one of the second reading speakers has not completed her speech. Has she? I thought Senator Kirk hadn't finished, Mr. Acting thank, President. Thank you, Minister. We understand that Senator Kirk hasn't completed her second reading speech. There may be some. Senator Webber. Acting Deputy President, if I could draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Idea. It would be nice with the 5,000 whips Quorum clerks if present. we could have a speaker's list occasionally. Ring the bells.
Quorum present. Quorum present. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. In closing um, second reading debate, at the outset I want to express my disappointment the Labor Party has chosen to pursue their amendments to this bill. It clearly demonstrates a lack of understanding of the important issue and it shows the depth of inexperience the Labor Party has when it comes to issues of national security. May I say a, a high degree of naivety. This, disappoints, this disappointment does not extend to surprise, Mr President. I'm not surprised the Labor Party has once again pushed an agenda that is not in the best interests of the nation. You have the government on the one hand doing everything it can to improve security, to deal with potential terrorism threats in Australia, and the Labor Party and the opposition in this place, on the other hand, supporting measures that would be inadequate to protect the Australian community. They would want to water down this important initiative. They are clearly not serious about dealing with terrorism and the genesis of terrorism. I'll deal with the opponent's opposition's amendment in more detail in the coming uh, committee stage, Mr Acting Deputy President. Waiting for a terrorist attack to occur, of course, is utterly unacceptable. Prevention and anticipation and doing something to avert the event is the top priority and the new battleground. The government is concerned about influences within our society that lead people into terrorism and our laws must deal adequately with material that encourages people to commit terrorist acts. And that is what this bill is about. The classification brackets publications, films and computer games close brackets amendment, terror material bill 2007 amends the classification act so that material that advocates the doing of a terrorist act must be refused classification. Things could not be more simple and more welcome. Material that has been refused classification, of course, cannot be legally sold, exhibited or displayed in Australia. There is significant doubt and uncertainty about whether current classification laws adequately capture material that advocates the doing of a terrorist act. What is clear is that something needs and must be done with respect to such material. I thank honourable senators for their contribution to the debate, and I'd like to respond to some of the points raised. With respect to uh, Senator Ludwig, um, the accusation uh, against the Attorney General of delay in responding to this issue is totally wrong. Of course, what we do in the Commonwealth domain is we consult the states. There is no point in having federal legislation that is in contradiction of state legislation. And so we consult the states. We consult the state attorney generals at biannual, biannual uh, uh, six monthly meetings. We consult the ministers of police. We consult corrective services ministers. We consult all the necessary state ministers to make sure there is national harmonious, concise, consistent legislation. The attorney has been seeking to herd cats in terms of the state ministers. They have a very limited understanding of what national security is really about and, of course, typical of most Labor Party ministers in this country, no interest, no interest whatsoever in responding to these threats. Um, can I say that, that Senator Ludwig is fully aware of the facts um, of what has gone on here, and, and subsequently I will seek to table um, a chronology of events that the Attorney General uh, has uh, put before the various state ministers, only to be rebuffed out of ignorance and naivety. Can I say the Attorney, um, in tabling this uh, uh, chronology in the other place, he was uh, quite surprised and shocked at similar accusations. Um, as we've heard from Senator Ludwig, to be raised uh, in the uh, House of Representatives by the member for Brisbane. Of course, Senator Ludwig is aware that it is his state and territory Labor colleagues that are responsible for the delay uh, and that he did nothing to bring them to account. Uh, I note Labor supports this legislation and yet seeks an to take an opportunity to, uh, to uh, argue that it, there's been delay. The delay, of course, is at Senator Ludwig's feet having no um, goodwill with his state colleagues, obviously. It seems that Labor has a very, very relaxed attitude towards the facts of this matter. And I table the chron chronology uh, to highlight the significant inconsistencies uh, in the arguments put forward by the honourable senator. I table that document. Thank you, Minister. Uh, it is indisputable that the Attorney General has been working tirelessly on this important initiative since the existence of this material first came to light in July 2005. It is the state and territory Labor governments that have frustrated the process 
continuously, refusing to be cooperative or constructive, hiding behind their bureaucrats while repeatedly opposing any proposal, to put, any proposal put forward by the Australian government. And of course, and of course Senator Ludwig, representing Lud, Rudd Labor, has been the epitome and the personification of that dilatory conduct. I do not intend to take up the Senate's time by going through the chronology of events once again. They are there for all to see and will be in the hands. So the document I table speaks for itself. I think it's important to make the point that immediately after it was clear that the AFP, DPP and Classification Board were unable to deal with this kind of material under the current regime, the Attorney-General did act decisively and urgently to obtain the agreements of the State and Territory Censorship Ministers to take material that advocates terrorist acts off the streets. They said no. Many times, and, and of course here we are now, um, uh, late in the electoral cycle, seeking to uh, repair something that responsible, responsible state ministers should have switched on to a lot sooner than they did. And of course the attorney has been forced to take action. The attorney should be commended for his leadership on this point. Um, with respect to some of the commentary in the second reading speeches, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to say that um, um, Senator Nettle made some outrageous commentary in her speech last night comparing the current, current governor government to Hitler and, St and, and Stalin, to the Hitler and Stalin regimes. These sorts of comments always say more about the person uttering them than the person or institution they are trying to criticise. I certainly uh, want to say that I was disappointed with Senator Nettles' uh, attitude in these matters. It shows that she and Labor have not been paying attention to what has happened in the world since, since, since the 11th of September 2001. In Senator Nettle, in one of her more lucid moments in the debate yesterday, claimed that these measures further erode human rights in Australia in the name of national security. She mentioned that freedom of expression and freedom of speech will be further eroded. Um, the government, of course, rejects this. The former Canadian Attorney General and former, hu former human rights lawyer Erwin Coulter, who is a strong proponent of the concept of a humane society, uh, sorry, humane security, recently told a Canadian parliamentary committee that, and I quote, Terrorism constitutes an assault on the security of a democracy and the most fundamental rights of its inhabitants, the right to life, liberty and security of the person." End of quote. In seeking to prevent terrorism, counter-terrorism laws are in fact protecting these basic rights and freedoms. Therefore, if counter-terrorism legislation is proportionate, its security objectives are not so much in conflict with human rights but supportive of them. And of course, the Australian government um, has taken great time and great effort to get the balance correct. Uh, and, and we maintain that, uh, we maintain that, uh, that this legislation goes a long way towards achieving the perfect and the right balance. Freedom of expression is an important part of Australian society and merely holding and asserting strongly opposing views should not attract censorship. This law is designed to strike an appropriate balance, as I've said, between freedom of expression and the need to protect the community, and I think that it achieves, as I've said, that balance. There's another right which must be protected, the right to be protected from the per pernicious influence of material that advocates and the na na th th that the naive and impressionable go out and commit terrorist acts against other human beings. The inclusion of of 9A3, section 9A3 in the bill will ensure that the new provisions will operate effectively against unacceptable material but will not infringe or impinge on freedom of speech or mainstream popular culture. Senator Nettle mentioned Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and said that this provides for freedom of expression which includes the freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds through any kind of media. I have to say that I can see where, where she was going at the, at the outset of those comments and I thought, how naive can you get? However, this article also states that this right carries with it special duties and responsibilities that may be subject, and I underline this, to certain restrictions as provided by law and are necessary for reasons which explicitly include national security. And of course, the Greens uh, have an absolute anathema towards national security. Refusing classification of material that advocates that people commit terrorist acts is consistent with this obligation. Can I conclude, Mr Acting Deputy President, by saying the Attorney General has unambiguously stated that this bill would not have proceeded if state and territory governments agreed to amend the classification code and guidelines individually in their states. This point needs to be made clearly. The government has been forced to restore to this bill to resort to this bill because the state and territory governments have refused to cooperate now, and, and here we are. Um, with the Labor Party attempting to weaken this measure. The attorney has pursued this issue with state ministers
for over a year, and I think that this is very, is very disappointing but also very indicative of the fact that they have no interest, no responsibility and no understanding of what we are seeking to do here. I'd like to acknowledge that the most recent meeting of the Standing Committee of Attorneys General New South Wales and South indicated their support for the proposal, and so my remarks are tempered uh, with respect to those jurisdictions. However, the amendments to the Code and Guidelines require unanimous support of all governments, so the initiative once again failed. The bill is not about restricting freedom of speech. It is, all, it is about ensuring that material advocating terrorist acts is not legally available. The bill takes into account submissions received during widespread consultation conducted by the Attorney-General's Department on this proposal. It is important to note that there is a provision in the bill that puts beyond doubt that material that is merely part of a public discussion, debate, entertainment or satire will not be captured by the bill. The explanatory memorandum also clearly states that the provision is only intended to capture material which goes further than that and actually advocates the doing of a terrorist act, clearly defined terms uh, taking their meaning from or directly adapting the criminal code provisions which were agreed by the Council of Australian Governments when introducing the anti-terrorism laws in 2005. Terrorism acts are a specific and highly dangerous threat to the Australian society, which is obvious to all, all of us. The government firmly believes that material um, which advocates people undertaking such acts should not be legally available, and the measures contained in this bill will achieve that objective, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, uh, Minister. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. All of that opinion, please say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. For an act to amend the Classification, Publications, Films and Computer Games Act 1995 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill standard printed. Now it's uh, Senator Stott to spoil Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Got it in the right order now. I uh, was rather quick to jump to my feet earlier to move uh, one of a number of amendments standing in my name on behalf of the Australian Democrats in relation to this bill. Uh, I uh, incorporated my speech last night. Uh, as some senators would know, I was talking to around 1,000 ADFA uh, midshipmen and officers instead of attending this debate. And uh, I just want to add for the record um, speaking of national security through you, Chair, to, uh, to, to my colleagues. Um, I, I, I just want to respond briefly um, before I address uh, the um, First Amendment um, on behalf of the Democrats, and that is that I think most of us in this place, all of us, are indeed capable of acknowledging that terrorism is indeed those things that uh, uh, um, Coulter uh, referred to, whether it's an assault on our freedoms or our liberties or our way of life, uh, that it does represent an absolute invasion um, and threat to the things that we hold dear. And I think we're all capable of understanding that there's a need for um, proportionality um, and that it's important to get the balance right. And I'm really getting sick and tired of people who question how this balance is achieved, being described as uh, somewhat naive or Indeed, I uh, understand the, uh, the attack that's just been made on the um, crossbench colleagues, the Greens, that uh, you know, they don't necessarily care about national security. And I don't think we can accuse anyone in this place of not caring about national security. But one thing I will say, Chair, is that some of us see national security not just as a nebulous concept or enigma or some big picture. When we talk about terrorism, we shouldn't forget that people in the community, indeed some of us in this place, see it um, in a very personal sense, very personal and emotional sense. And we're all looking for some answers and some solutions. And I just want to make clear again for the record that I really, as a legislator, I'm allowed to question the nitty-gritty of these laws, especially when you know, we believe that there is a lack of empirical justification for some of the changes before us, when we do believe that there's a defective definition in relation to these and other bills or acts. And it's not just me, it's not just the Democrats, it's not just people in this place, it's broader organisations that have been critical of the legislation before us and other counter-terrorism measures that have been adopted by this government. That's not because we don't care about national security, it's because we do care passionately about reaching that proportionality to which the minister, uh, the minister refers. And there are a number of ways that we recognise that we address issues, such as uh, terrorism. So I just think that, again, and in light of September 11 and the anniversary that we commemorated uh, last week uh, in this place, um, 
not that we really commemorated it, to be quite frank, Chair. As I said on record afterwards, I was a little surprised to see that the recognition of September 11 was done so in that context only of national security. Nowhere did I see an acknowledgement of the fact that Australians died. Ten Australians died. Friends of people in this place died. And I get very frustrated that sometimes we lose that aspect of this debate when the attacks that take place in the chamber against the state governments or territory governments or Rudd you know, <laughs> devotees or apparatchiks or whatever it may be. Anyway, I put in that plea, Chair. Um, I acknowledge the uh, Minister's uh, concerns with the state and territory governments. I don't necessarily endorse them. I note from the second reading address uh, uh, by uh, Minister Rudd that he also, the Attorney General, uh, devoted more time in his second reading address to attacking his state counterparts than he did necessarily in um, putting forward an argument for justifying uh, the need for the legislation. Uh, I think perhaps if he'd uh, addressed more comprehensively the issue of this power grab, uh, some of the constitutionality questions relating to the legislation, it would have been uh, more productive. In relation to the First Amendment that I so move, this, uh, this amendment, which uh, has been circulated with, uh, with plenty of time, um, is actually based not on some arbitrary judgment that the Australian Democrats have made, but it's actually based on a Law Council submission. Uh, it means that any material that might be refused classification because it concerns terrorist material must be viewed in context. So the inclusion of the phrase, regardless of his or her age or, men or any mental impairment, uh, in uh, section 9A2C, suggests that material should be, must be assessed according to how it may be understood by any person and not necessarily an ordinary or reasonable member of its intended audience. Now, the Democrats consider this to be, and others, consider this to be a marked departure from, uh, from usual practice and would place classifiers in the awkward position of placing themselves uh, in the shoes of, say, um, a child or, say, someone with a mental impairment. Uh, a scenario that um, uh, the Classification Review Board itself um, raised issues with. And I think through you, Chair, I think you've actually acknowledged on record in, in, in this place, um, you know, you've qu queried this as well. Um, I think you're satisfied with the government's response, but I, I still think that there's a room for some uh, qualification in relation to the legislation before us. So that's why I'm seeking to uh, amend section uh, 9A. Um, 1A after that to require uh, that decision makers should assess the likely import of the impact of the purported terrorist material based on persons or class of persons to or amongst whom it is published or intended or is likely to be published. So that's our intent. Um, I don't believe this amendment has the support uh, of, of the other parties, but I think it was important for us to, uh, to attempt to, um, to change this particular um, section and uh, I, uh, I commend that. Uh, uh, commend that uh, amendment to the Senate. Thank you. Minister? Senator Ludwig? The, uh, the opposition won't be supporting the amendment. This item provides that uh, when making a classification regarding a publication, film or computer game that advocates the doing of a terrorist act, consideration must be given to the likely impact of the material on the class of persons to or amongst whom the material is to be or is intended to be or is likely to be published. Currently, of course, there is uh, no such requirement which exists uh, in the uh, material, and its likely impact uh, vis-a-vis certain groups uh, is uncertain. Labor is opposed to this item on the grounds that although the material may, may be likely to be accessed by any one group, it does not mean that it, it can't solely be accessed by other groups as well. It's far better that the classification laws take a more universal test by looking at material in the whole context rather than, I think, through the lens of a uh, certain group. It, uh, on that basis, uh, particularly, it wasn't uh, also a matter that was explored significantly in the Senate Legal and Constitutional uh, Committee and didn't uh, eventuate in a recommendation from them. Thank you. Minister? The Chairman, I want to say that I congratulate uh, Senator Totsis Bui on addressing ad for last night. I um, su suggested that the topic uh, that she was to talk about should be entitled to fight and win. I think she may well have rejected that, uh, that theme at ADFA, but nevertheless I congratulate her on going to some extent to the lion's den to go down and uh, teach uh, 
uh, good things to those people at ADFA, and I, as I say, congratulate her on that. Can I also say, um, in not such an, an harmonious uh, spirit, that every time the government does something in terms of a budget initiative, it's a pork barrel for both the crossbenchers and the opposition. Due consideration, due consideration of the government is, is, entitled, is entitled to failure to act. And of course, when we seek national consistency, it's a power grab. Now, let's just address the facts. Can we take some of the emotive politics out of it? I know we're getting to the end of the cycle, but can we, can we maintain some semblance of balance here? Some semblance of balance. This amendment is totally unnecessary. Section 11 clearly sets out the provisions that deal with this. The government does not support the amendment. Thank you. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Dr Spoyer, amendment number one on sheet 5373, be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Dr Spoyer. Chair, uh, amendment two. Uh, I move amendment two, standing in my name on, the, on behalf of uh, the Australian Democrats. Uh, we believe this amendment reflects a need to excuse instances where material clearly has a purpose other than advocating terrorism. Um, we believe that the bill is uh, confusing because, in some respects, it asks the classifier to focus on the intention of the person who created the material, uh, but in other respects it clearly focuses on the effect of the material, uh, intended or otherwise. The amendment will ensure that only material that might reasonably re be regarded as intending to advocate terrorism, so in acknowledging that intention role, will, uh, will be refused classification. The amendment reflects Herriock's view that uh, a way, um, and I quote from Herriock's sub submission, and um, they are a number, one of the organisations that's been critical of the, uh, the legislation before us, that a way of ensuring that legislation in this area is carefully targeted and proportionate, there's that word again, is to expl expressly require both the specific intent to incite the commission of a terrorist act and a concrete danger of this act being committed as a result uh, of the incitement." End quote. So I just put that on record uh, in relation to Herriot. Chair, but it just reminds me that there are a number of organisations that have been critical of the legislation, and I think that's worth reminding the government of. Again, once again, it's not just uh, the crossbenchers, but when you've got organisations and groups like the Law Council or the Gilbert and Tobit Centre, uh, the Federation uh, of uh, Community Legal Centres, um, the Australian Publishers Association. So obviously, we're dealing with some really vexed, important issues here uh, relating to, um, you know, freedom of, of speech and. Uh, academic uh, pursuit as well, uh, the Classification uh, Review Board, uh, the Australian uh, Press Council uh, as, uh, as another example, um, the Sydney Centre for International and Global Law has given some um, helpful pointers in relation to um, uh, issues uh, in this debate or surrounding issues, including a Bill of Rights. The New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, I suspect that that might uh, um, be responded to uh, as a usual suspect by, by some in the government, but uh, nonetheless um, their concerns have, uh, have been duly noted. Uh, I think that uh, there is a very strong argument from a number of groups that the law as it currently stands uh, is actually sufficient, and hence the concerns that the government haven't provided sufficient justification. So if you get away from the issue of constitutionality or the so-called power grab or anything to do with, with the state, uh, territory and commonwealth uh, uh, dilemmas or arguments, there are many other arguments in relation to this legislation, including the so-called empirical or lack of empirical justification. I mean, Herriot recommended that the proposal uh, be reconsidered on the basis that it wasn't convinced of the necessity for tighter censorship laws in order to combat incitement and or glorification of terrorism. So the current provisions chair of the classification code provide that material must be refused classification if, among other things, it promotes, incites or instructs in matters of crime and violence. And that's what we're talking about here. So once again, put on record, I know that uh, you know, the minister implores us to strip away from the politics and you know, um, get away from the emotion. This is emotional. Terrorism is emotional. And yes, we have to be clear-headed, hard-headed legislators in addressing the responses to terrorism and coming up with the solutions. But we also have to be careful we don't become um, sort of political for the sake of it in the sense of, uh, once again, inciting fear in the community when we could be addressing uh, in very clear and rational ways 
some of the issues dealing um, not only with the causes of but the perpetuation of violence, be that terrorism violence or any other violence in our community. So hence the, um, the intent of our motion dealing with um, intention and, and, and effect and I hope that, uh, that the um, Labor Party and the, uh, the government will duly consider the amendment before them. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, you're to be disappointed. Uh, the Labor Party won't be, uh, won't be supporting the amendment. Uh, one of the difficulties, I think, is, is that you then, uh, what the item will do, it uh, inserts a new requirement for uh, whether or not material advocates the doing of a terrorist act. The new requirement requires that for material to advocate, in other words, for the purposes of the act, the doing of a terrorist act that must have been the intention or reasonably be regarded as the intention of the creator of the material. A piece of material that should be looked at in a complete context, not just at that point, uh, because what you're trying to then do is look at it at only that point when it's actually created. It's far better, in fact, if you have a more functional approach and uh, look at it its actually likely impact rather than the intended one. Uh, and you can certainly get uh, into a range of debates about what the intention was at the time it was created. Put that aside, what the legislation will allow is a functional approach. What is its impact now? How is it impacting rather than what the intention of the creator might or might not have been at the time, which can tie up uh, a lot of legal experts for some time. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Look, the um, the introduction of intent into the person advocating uh, the material that we're talking about here obviously and severely undermines the purpose of this bill and is unacceptable. The bill is about taking out of circulation material that, on the face of it and as a fact, advocates the doing of a terrorist act. The objective assessment of the material itself is important, not what the creator intended. We don't support this amendment. The question is that uh, amendment number two on sheet 5373, moved by Senator Stott to Spoyer, be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Again, say no. I think the noes have it. No, have it. Senator Stott Despoyer. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendments three and four, standing in my name. Uh, leave. I seek leave to move them together. Is leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Chair. As uh, honourable senators would see, uh, the uh, the two amendments uh, remove uh, the words or indirectly. Uh, these uh, amendments, uh, the the uh, the first amendment, well, in fact, both of them ensure only actions which directly uh, counsel or urge the doing of a terrorist act are refused classification. Uh, it is required because the inclusion of the notion of an indirect advocation, advocation of terrorism draws a blurry line between material that may, on the one hand, be legitimate in the context of a struggle for liberation or independence and what, on the other hand, uh, may be a terrorist act. Uh, the Democrats consider that more leeway should be afforded to classifiers to reflect this uh, uh, political reality uh, and, uh, of course, this goes back to the broader issue of respecting the freedom of expression. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Labor doesn't support the amendments uh, items uh, three and four. Uh, the Democrats aren't going to get much joy out of us in this, uh, in this area. The item omits the phrase uh, or indirectly from subsection 2A and it does that again for item four effectively. Currently that subsection provides that material must be banned if it uh, directly or indirectly counsels or urges the doing of a terrorist act. This item would remove the phrase or indirectly uh, to mean that material can only be banned if it does those things uh, directly. Uh, as I've said, Labor doesn't support the amendment. The reason, uh, amongst others, and we don't need to draw it out uh, longer than we need to, but the main reason is that if you look at much of the hate language these days, much of it is obviously conveyed directly, but is also can be conveyed and has been conveyed through code words and dog whistles. So you have to look at the whole of the material and in a sense indirectly. You can only look at 
many European neo-fascist movements to know that terrorist organisations are, in fact, unfortunately not always up front about their intentions. And that's why I suspect indirectly is also there to ensure that there is no gaps in the legislation, there are no loopholes. We don't think it's appropriate to allow those for terrorists to circumvent and therefore escape refusal of that type of material. Minister. Yeah, look, one of the things that uh, the government is keen to do is get consistency across the law, across jurisdictions. This uh, amendment seeks to narrow the definition of advocates in contrast to that already set out in the Criminal Code. Uh, it's it's con entirely counter to what we believe should be the case, and of course the government in those circumstances could not possibly support this amendment. these amendments. The question is that amendments three and four on sheet 5373, moved by Senator Stott Despoir, be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Kent say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Stott Despoir. Uh, thank you, Chair. We're up to Democrat number five. I uh, move that. Uh, it uh, deletes uh, subsection 9A2C, which deals with the Praise of Terrorist Acts. As uh, senators may be aware, I've uh, referred to some of our concerns relating to this provision uh, in my second reading um, speech. Um, again, because of this sort of vaguer notion uh, of, of praise uh, rather than sort of promotes or incites. So um, we've put on record now a number of times that we believe this is a fairly nebulous, uh, sort of vague concept, uh, especially if you've got no requirement of intent left unamended. We believe that this section of the bill has the potential to be misinterpreted by classifiers uh, and once again uh, unduly restrict freedom of expression. And on that note, uh, Chair, I mean, I acknowledge Senator Ludwig's comments about, um, you know, his, the Labor Party's view on indirect as well as direct, and I'm just starting to feel incredibly um, sorry for the classifiers in, uh, in some of the interpretation uh, of uh, this legislation and indeed some of the, uh, the material before them. So once again, uh, this is to, uh, to rem uh, remove that notion of, of, uh, of praise and uh, I uh, commend the amendment to the Senate. Thank you. S Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. Uh, this item, of course, would completely remove subsection 2C and that section provides that material must be banned if it uh, directly praises the doing of a terrorist act in circumstances where there is a risk that such praise might have the effect of leading a person, uh, open bracket, regardless of his or her age or any mental impairment uh, within the meaning of section 7.3 of the Criminal Code, close bracket, that the person might suffer, close bracket, to engage in a terrorist act. Uh, Labor believes there are some problems with this section and we'll be moving uh, amendments to that ourselves and we prefer our position than the Democrats. However, I won't take the opportunity of making those points at this, at this time. This would effectively uh, be throwing out the baby with the bathwater, quite frankly, so uh, ours is uh, preferred in this instance and we will be moving those which are in line with the Senate committee recommendations, uh, which uh, we'll uh, talk to when the appropriate time. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Completely removing this uh, directly praises element of advocates is unacceptable. This would be an important tool in the fight to ensure the material that, through its praise of heinous acts, might encourage the naive and impressionable to commit similar acts. Now, concerns have been expressed, Mr Chair, about the possible effect of this provision on popular culture movies such as Braveheart or Michael Collins. However, other safeguards ensure an appropriate balance in making classification decisions. Namely, the praise in this instance must be direct and not done merely as part of public discussion or debate or as entertainment or satire. Um, obviously, this amendment is unacceptable to the government. The question is that uh, amendment number five on sheet 5373, moved by Senator Stott Despoir, be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I, th I think the noes have it. Senator Stott Despoir. Um, if you don't mind, through you, Chair, to Senator Ludwig, I'm actually just going to withdraw uh, the, uh, the next amendment uh, in uh, the uh, amendment number six. Uh, I, um, I seek to do that because uh, um, while the last amendment was uh, perhaps a, a bolder, broader attempt by the Democrats to deal with some of the issues uh, in that section, obviously not uh, appropriate according to, uh, to the Labor Party, but um, uh, we certainly don't want to be throwing any babies out with bathwater over here, I can assure you, Senator Ludwig, but um, through you I will uh, chair, uh, withdraw that amendment and uh, the Democrats uh, in that case will, uh, will support the opposition amendment 
uh, before the chair, or will shortly be before the chair. Thank you, Senator Stottles Boy. You don't need leave for that, but thank you if you've withdrawn uh, your amendment number six. We're now to amendment number seven um, for the Democrats or the uh, opposition amendment number one. So I'm seeking the, who's seeking the call, Senator Ludwig. I'll move uh, opposition amendment uh, number one on sheet five three three zero. Thank you, Can Senator I, Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, the Labor Party will be moving uh, one amendment today in respect of this, in line with the majority recommendation of the Senate Committee report on the bill. The, uh, and of course, that was the majority committee report, both Liberal and Labor Party senators that proposed this. They proposed it, uh, perhaps not in the anger or the uh, making the uh, bold assertions that uh, Senator Johnson has made, but in an attempt, uh, I think, as I understood it, to improve the legislation, to make it effective, to ensure that it does effectively do what it's designed to do well, appropriately, and to that end, uh, it is supported by the Labor Party if it achieves that end. Senator Johnson clearly takes a different view, but these are areas where it's not uh, a matter of, I think, the Labor Party beating its chest on terrorism or, in fact, the Liberal Party or the National Party beating their chest on, on terrorism or how good we are at it, uh, fighting it. Both uh, the Labor and Coalition have had bipartisan support across the chamber on many pieces of legislation dealing with anti-terrorism. Our credentials are on the table, quite frankly, as are the coalitions in ensuring that the fight against terrorism is effective, that the AFP have the effective tools to be able to fight terrorism. The amendment uh, that we're moving is one that I've already touched on in the second reading speech. That is, that the bill as it stands would provide that a publication, film or computer game uh, must be refused classification if it directly praises the doing of a terrorist act in circumstances where there is a risk that such praise might have the effect of leading a person, regardless of his or her age or mental impairment, within the meaning of section 7.3 of the Criminal Code, that the person might suffer to engage in a terrorist act. Section 7.3 of the Criminal Code defines mental impairment as including senility, intellectual disability, mental illness, brain damage and severe personality disorder. The use of that is not good law, it's bad law. It requires the Classification Board and the Classification Review Board to attempt to stand in the shoes of a person with potentially any form of mental impairment and attempt to decide how they might react to some material. At this point, though, I'd like to take the opportunity of addressing some comments that have been made in the media by uh, Mr Philip Ruddock, the Attorney-General, specifically that, and it seems to be that they are trying to find a hook in this. Let's just put that aside and look at the facts in the cold light of day. Labor is saying it should only be taken into account how a reasonable person might see it. I think that's a major weakness. That's what uh, Philip Ruddock has said, Mr Ruddock. This shows really how little the Attorney-General understands his own law, quite frankly. He seemed not to have even read the submission of his own review board. <laughs> Labor is not importing a reasonable person test into its legislation or, as perhaps the out-of-date uh, Mr Philip Ruddock talks about a reasonable man test. We are merely deleting the part of the bill which would be virtually impossible by the Classification Review Board rather than importing a new test into the legislation, as Mr Ruddock seems to suggest. We are leaving it to the discretion of the Review Board to decide. Indeed, the Senate Committee was convinced by the submissions from the Classification Review Board itself. It highlighted how difficult this would actually be to police. The convener of the review board stated in evidence to the committee that the classification review board has discussed the proposals and, as far as we can see, if we made a determination that there was praise or a terrorist act, then we would have to refuse the work, the, the work classification. We cannot work out any other way that we could on a consistent basis 
without some anomaly arising with different panels applying any criteria that would lead to a consistent application of the Act, apart from simply saying that if there is praise, it must be refused. What the government hasn't addressed is how the review board or the classification review board will in fact deal with the issue. It is difficult, if not impossible, to effectively implement as evidenced by the submissions of the government's own review board. This is, as I understand it, why the Senate committee was persuaded to adopt that, including coalition senators, if there is a reasonable basis to say that that position was wrong, what Senator Johnson can do, in a rational, cool sense, explain that. It might be persuaded. But what he hasn't been able to do is, in fact, articulate it in that way. What he has preferred to do is to rely on uh, a exhortation about uh, Labor not being as tough on terror, anti-terrorism or terrorism, I should say, as, as the coalition. And that is disappointing, to say the least, because it is exhortations only, quite frankly. But if you look at uh, Senator Johnson's efforts in this chamber in respect of this bill, the bill has been available for, let me see, the actual uh, tabling of the committee report was back in 30 July. It's been available in the Senate uh, since uh, mid-August. If the government was that wedded to moving this quickly to allow uh, matters to be dealt with by the Classification Board or the Classification Review Board, then uh, Senator Johnson should explain why he's left it sit on the notice paper for so long before dealing with it. It's more than a month. This isn't a matter he can easily say it's the states he can blame. This is a matter he can now say if he was wedded to an amendment to the legislation, he has had it on the papers for a month to be able to move quickly and deal with. Labor has been ready and has at that point at the time indicated that we would support the legislation. Senator Johnson seems wedded to looking at the narrow picture rather than the broad picture, but there again that's what you might expect from the coalition. The broad picture is that Labor does support the legislation. We do see the need for it. Senator Johnson seems to have, or the coalition I should say, seems to have missed that point entirely in their contributions to try to find a hook. And if you then go back and look at the chronology of events, if the government was wedded to a legislative fix. It was available from about the 10th of July 2006. If the government was intending to move this as a legislative fix as urgently as possible to ensure that we would have firm protections in place, then why didn't you do it from the 10th of July 2006? From that point onwards, the Classification Review Board classified two publications RC, six publications unrestricted and the film PG. At that point in time, if you were going to move, you could have moved because you're, you've ended up effectively at the same place in any event. In other words, you, haven't, you can't argue that you've then said, well, we're all about uh, uh, process if you're now going to say you're all about action today. Because you've let it sit on a notice paper for a month and you could have moved it from the 10th of July 2006. But let's look at also uh, some of the issues that come out of that. Because, of course, it's the Classification Review Board where these matters first raised their head to the extent that they were classified as PG rather than refused classification. And perhaps, uh, and I'll give the uh, government opportunity to respond individually to this, but when you look at the, of the classification review board, uh, four out of seven, and perhaps the government can respond individually or collectively about it, but they are convener Maureen Shelley, 
was a candidate, was a Liberal candidate, I should say, for Blacklands in 1998. We've got, uh, and perhaps uh, the coalition can confirm that for us, because the problem seems to surround the classification review board itself. If it had have refused classification of the material, we certainly wouldn't be here today. The deputy convener, the, uh, the Honourable Trevor Griffin, was a former uh, South, Liberal South Australian Attorney General. The review board member, uh, Mr Rob Skilkin, a Liberal former member of WA Liberal State Executive. The review board member, Ms Gillian Groom, the, uh, a former uh, well, wife, well, she's a wife of a former Tasmanian Premier, Ray Groom. She may have different leanings. She may, but I'm sure, I'm sure, Mr. I'm sure Senator Johnson might be able to advise. So what you've got, what you've got, is a Liberal Party stacked review board, picked by the Attorney General, picked by the Attorney General, and not producing the results that he wants. Or are they? Because uh, you've now had to come in here. Uh, with that to be able to try to uh, overcome their decisions. You then, uh, to this extent, uh, when you go back and look at the argument that have been uh, presented by uh, Mr Ruddock about his uh, categorisation of the Labor Party in this, is that the reasonable person test, of course, we could take him back to first year law see if we could get that right about how this legislation would work. But the submission by the classification review board itself uh, seems to have been ignored as well. Uh, what the government is doing, of course, is in that instance not choosing to answer the classification review board, but in fact trying in this instance to answer the Labor Party in both looking at that in a sensible way, looking at the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee, both uh, majority with coalition and Liberal coalition members and Labor Party members on it, and saying they've suggested that if there's a way forward, why don't you pick that up? If you don't pick that up, your answer to that is to simply uh, argue, argue and perhaps even badly, not the issue that's currently before us, but argue about how uh, the Labor Party is viewed on our stance on terrorism. And I think that's impermissible. The Labor Party has been firm on this issue from right back from the first committees that I went on in the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee in 2002, where we dealt with the first six pieces of legislation, the next tranche in 2004. Now, Senator, Senator Johnson of the Coalition may not be aware of all of those matters, may not be aware of the positions that we have adopted throughout all of that, and he might be forgiven for not being involved back then with those. But perhaps I could also invite him to have a look at those to see how they've actually, uh, how the Labor Party has addressed these issues in the past and continues to do so to ensure that what we end up with is good, effective law that operates well to ensure that we can both the AFP and those uh, elements that fight crime and terrorism alike have the proper and appropriate tools to be able to do so and effective tools and they're not coming back here looking for further amendments as we go because of the government's hasty way that they have legislated in some instances. We only have to look at uh, the way uh, the government is in fact trying to use this debate not to answer the critical issues that are contained within the Senate report itself, but to try to spin the argument elsewhere. And they should be pulled up for that and they should correct themselves. Minister. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, with respect to the uh, matter being on the notice paper, of course, if Senator Ludwig was really earnest and genuine in his approach to the government on those sorts of matters, he would have, of course, be able to uh, say that he'd read 
the chronology <coughs> that was tabled in the lower house, which of course answers everything that he said about that, because he would then know, and what he's seeking to hide, is that the states have been offered an opportunity to come with us on this, and they have simply dragged the chain unacceptably. And of course, he's complicit in that because uh, he knows Queensland's one of the principal offenders. But I wouldn't expect him to want to advert to that in here. This amendment by the Labor Party uh, would mean that material that advocates uh, something, if it directly pr uh, praises the doing of a terrorist act in circumstances where there is a risk that such praise might lead only the average or reasonable person to commit a terrorist act, is unacceptable to the government. Now, let me explain for the benefit of Senator Ludwig what he is suggesting. He is suggesting that an adjudication be made b based upon the reasonable person test. This is a lawyer's feast. The Labor Party and the opposition in this place have very limited understanding of the practical workings of the judicial process, particularly the civil judicial process, and the money involved in these sorts of matters. He is advocating the lawyer's feast approach. Let's, let's argue what's reasonable. Let's call all the evidence. The government says no. Terrorist organisers do not respect age or mental capacity. It is those who are younger, impressionable and with diminished mental capacity who are more frequently targeted to engage in terrorist acts, such as suicide bombings. And of course, this is, this is not about the reasonable man test. This is about enabling the adjudicators to look at the people, the people targeted and to make a more subjective assessment. We need to protect the more vulnerable in our community in matters as serious as this. But of course, I wouldn't expect the ALP to understand that. The government also believes that consistency is important across state law. Senate scrutiny committees have indicated on numerous occasions that they are concerned that statutory language should, wherever possible, have the same meaning when used in different pieces of legislation. Uh, I don't think I can take it any further, uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, Chairman. The fact is that um, to remove the um, uh, to, to carry out the deletions to the bill as uh, the opposition would seek really discloses higher and higher levels of naivety. Thank you, Minister. Senator Stott to spoil you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I I assume the Democrat uh, amendment can lapse or I'll withdraw it. Uh, that's uh, Democrat Amendment 7 uh, standing in my name, which is of course identical to the amendment that we're uh, debating uh, from the Australian Labor Party. As you would be aware from the, uh, the sheet, running sheet before us, um, both the amendment that I withdrew prior to this uh, and indeed the amendment that uh, was lost, uh, Amendment 5, uh, dealt with you know, alternatives. Um, thank you. Sorry, uh, Amendment Number Five dealt with, an amen uh, dealt with um, the issue of, uh, of uh, praise of terrorist acts. Then six and seven, we were putting forward some uh, alternatives uh, to try and deal with some of the, um, the issues that have been um, brought forward today. Uh, obviously, um, the, um, the Labor Amendment uh, before us is one that is uh, entirely acceptable to us for the reasons that I've outlined. Uh, actually. Uh, dealing with Amendment 1, um, dealing with the, um, the inclusion of the phrase regardless um, of his or her age or any mental impairment. Um, again, put on record, this suggests that uh, material must be assessed according to how it may be understood by any person and not necessarily an ordinary or reasonable member of the uh, intended audience. Uh, obviously, Senator Ludwig has also outlined. Uh, again, the Democrats believe that this is a departure from usual practice. Um, we again have concerns about how uh, the classifiers will, uh, will judge some of this material in that context, how they're able to put themselves uh, in, into the mind or, the, or the, you know, in the shoes of, uh, of someone uh, with, uh, with a, a mental impairment, uh, for example. Um, this uh, is, is of grave concern to us and uh, hence the uh, discussion through the committee process and indeed now. So the Democrats will support uh, the amendment moved by Labor before us and uh, indeed uh, had we not been debating their amendment we would have been debating our identical amendment. Thank you, Chair. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. I might just take the opportunity of clarifying a couple of points people seem to be getting themselves uh, hot under the collar about. But Labor is not saying that there's a reasonable person test. There's, uh, perhaps we can then deal with it in this way. Does the government say that currently, prior to this amendment, there is a reasonable person test requirement uh, in the guidelines that the review board or the classification review board need, need uh, to then deal with? 
Minister. Right. Senator Ludwig. No, there isn't one. Uh, to the attorney, and in respect of the uh, amendment to uh, that Labor is proposing, it doesn't insert. Labor is not inserting a reasonable person test in the legislation. Or does the uh, government have a different view? Minister. Thank you, Chair. This talks about advocating. So that when you withdraw and limit and, and, and take out what the government seeks to do, you're leaving nothing. I, thought, I, I take it by that, then uh, the answer is no, we're not importing a reasonable person test. So therefore, on those instances, we're not importing a reasonable person test. Uh, the Attorney General uh, maybe uh, needs to go back to first law school where he said uh, Labor is saying it should only be taken into account how a reasonable person might see it, and I think that's a major weakness. That's a quote that he gave. So that's wrong, both in your view and in my view. And what we now have is uh, Senator Johnson uh, or the government saying that in this instance that he can put himself in the position of a mentally impaired person to be able to then determine whether that legislation would work and how the review board or the classification review board would view it. I can't, quite frankly, I can't. Maybe Senator Johnson can. In that respect, then, uh, I can't add any more. But our position would be to allow the classification board or the classification review board, as they argued in their submission, to determine it. The Senator, Senator Johnson. Look, uh, I don't, really don't want to delay the Senate in me having to show Senator Ludwig how the legislation functions. I'm really surprised that he asks the questions that he does because it discloses a, a quite a high level of ignorance. I've said the reasonable man test uh, is what is left with respect to advocation. If you don't specify to prescribe it, we are prescribing it and we want to stick with that prescription. The question is that opposition amendment number one be agreed to. Senator Ludwig. Does, <laughs> would that be sufficient, though, the ignorance that you claim, to place, place me in the position of a mentally impaired person? Maybe you could say that or not, because that is the position that you're putting the classification review board in. But, in that sense, uh, have you then ensured that they have the requisite tools, the guidelines to be able to determine it? The problem is what you have said is that uh, in respect of their answer, their submission, you haven't actually provided an answer to date. Minister, question. the question is Senator Ludwig. You could try again, and I'd offer you, invite you to at least make it clear. But what you're then, what you're then arguing is not clear. It's opaque, quite frankly. Minister. Well, it's clear to us, Senator Ludwig, and indeed if we have to go back <coughs> to lecturing you on what we're doing here, I've said to you that uh, what you propose would mean that material would advocate if it directly praises the doing of a terrorist act in circumstances where there is a risk that, praise, uh, that such praise might lead only the average person to commit average or reasonable person to commit um, a terrorist act. Now, clearly, that is unacceptable. Now, I can't put it more clearly than that. Um, what we are prescribing is the power for a consideration of uh, advocation where there are people affected who are, who are uh, mentally impaired, naive, impressionable, young, as I've said. It could not be clearer. The question is that the opposition amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. We now move to Democrat amendment. Senator Natasha, to stop the spoiler. Uh, thank you, Chair. The uh, final amendment uh, on behalf of the Democrats. Uh, I move that amendment number eight, uh, relating to uh, a review for educational purposes. Uh, we believe this amendment will prevent the unnecessary restriction of public analysis and discussion of such material. Um, a decision by the classification board uh, is, of course, reviewable by the AAT, and uh, the amendment that we've proposed allows regulations to prescribe procedures for application 
and review and conditions for the release of the material which will safeguard the capacity to undertake educational or scholarly review or analysis while limiting the circulation of RC material. Um, the, um, Madam uh, Chair, in my second reading uh, remarks, uh, I uh, put on record uh, the Democrats' uh, concern at uh, what we perceive as the failure of uh, the legislation to address whether or not academics and uh, indeed policy makers uh, may be able to access banned material for academic or policy research. Certainly uh, there were a number of insights provided to the, uh, the Senate uh, committee uh, in uh, various submissions to the Senate inquiry which highlighted the need, the positive need, to provide uh, access uh, to banned materials uh, for study purposes for academics. Uh, such incidences included uh, removal of books from university library shelves where the books were introduced by an historian and to help uh, his or her students uh, understand jihad, his students in this case, and the questioning of a university student studying the prevention of terrorism by the AFP. So we thought there was completely extraordinary examples. So limiting access to books on terrorism, we believe, will hinder the ability to understand uh, and criticise the ideas expressed in them. This is clearly not only a problem for academics and scholars, but obviously for the community at large, which depends upon quality research to understand better uh, the social and the security challenges facing our nation. The Democrats oppose the restriction of materials for genuine academic or policy research and hence the amendment before us which is an attempt to deal with uh, what we consider some uh, clear and obvious uh, and important uh, e exemptions. The question, Minister. Minister. Uh, th thank you, Chair. The government uh, sees these proposals ill-conceived, premature and inadequate. We are working with state and, state, states and territories through the Standing Committee of Attorneys-General to establish mechanisms for appropriate access to, for legitimate purposes to material which has been refused classification. As state and territory laws provide for the offences relating to the use of refused classification material, it is appropriate that they be part of developing suitable mechanisms with appropriate limits and controls. This is what the Attorney General has been saying from the outset, to no avail and being rebuffed by the Labor Party. There are fundamental flaws in this democrat approach. The proposal contains no limits on the type of re refused classification material which may be the subject of an application. It would also designate the classification review board, a merits review body, to override state and territory law. And to use the, the, the on honourable senator's words, this would be a power grab. It would enable Commonwealth regulations to set out procedures which would rightly belong with the states and the territories. The government clearly in these circumstances, given what we've been through in seeking to engage the states, could not accept this amendment. The Senator Ludwig. In terms of this, uh, the Labor Party won't be supporting uh, the uh, item 8. It adds a new section uh, 9b, which has the effect of providing an exemption for RC material for the purposes of review analysis and educational or scholarly purposes. This was a matter that was raised in the uh, committee, the Senate committee, and uh, I understand that the matters are currently before SCAG. The minister might be able to confirm that, uh, that these are matters that uh, uh, and we do anticipate there will be an outcome that will ensure that the process works effectively. He may be uh, distracted at this point, but he could, he could uh, through his advisers, I'm sure, who are listening, just, and I think it was a matter that I raised during my second reading speech, that the, there was an undertaking to uh, fix this uh, in some way, shape or form to ensure that uh, it is dealt with. It's not, a, it's not appropriate to deal with it in the way that Democrats have have uh, proposed. I do understand why that they are proposing in that way. Uh, the uh, mechanism that the government has outlined, we think, can work uh, when, uh, when it's uh, available, and we hope that it's available at an earliest possible time to allow uh, proper research and scholarly and educational uh, work in this area that uh, will, in fact, help fight terrorism. The question is that Democrat Amendment No. 8 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it.
The committee has considered the Classification, Publications, Films and Computer Games Amendment, Terrorist Material Bill 2007, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move the report of the committee uh, be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. Those of that op opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion. Senator Stott Despoyer. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I won't delay the Senate, especially given the, uh, the, the time frame, but I just wanted to place on record uh, once again the objections of the Australian Democrats in relation to uh, this legislation on a number of grounds, uh, whether it be a defective uh, definition um, in relation to this, uh, the bill before us, the so called constitutionality. Uh, arguments, the fact that uh, uh, the latter amendment on which we were just debating, that there's um, no real grounds for uh, um, academic uh, uh, analysis of the kinds of materials uh, to which we refer. I think that the Democrats put forward some um, constructive proposals to uh, alleviate uh, some of the questionable access, uh, aspects of this legislation, and I'm sorry that they weren't uh, considered by um, when considered by the government. I think that the government's got uh, some interesting debates ahead, not only through SCAGs, but also through the, um, I think from the classification review board itself. I think there'll be some interesting uh, difficulties um, in dealing with the interpretation of the legislation. And once again, I put on record, Madam Acting Deputy President, that there's a very strong argument, and it's been put forward by a number of organisations and key groups, and particularly legal uh, groups, to suggest that the, uh, some of the current definitions uh, under the uh, under the act uh, are adequate for for dealing with some of the um, um, the uh, the threats that uh, the government puts forward that are posed in this uh, current uh, security um, environment so i'm disappointed that uh, some of the ideas put forward by other organizations issues raised through the senate committee process and various submissions have really been uh, given uh, little consideration the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the classification, publications, films and computer games act 1995 and for related purposes. Minister. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that government business order of the day number two um, be considered after the other lunchtime bills until not later than 2 p.m. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Mes messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The National Health Security Bill 2007. Social Security Legislation Amendment 2007, Budget Measures for Students Bill 2007. Minister. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, these bills are being introduced together. After debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned, I shall move a motion to have the bills listed separately on the notice paper. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Oh, sorry. Clark. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the provision of benefits to students and for related purposes. A bill for an act to provide for national health security and for other purposes. Minister. Thank you. Now, where was I? I um, table. <laughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I table a revised explanatory memorandum and a correction to the revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Social Security Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 Budget Measures for Students Bill 2007 and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in answer. It's leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Uh, I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I move Minister. that the resumption of the debate be an order of the day for a later hour. The question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as, as separate orders of the day. The question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. And we now, being right on 12.45, we move.
to non contro legislation. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day No. 8, Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs Legislation Amendment, Child Disability Assistance Bill 2007, Second Reading, Adjourned Debate. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on the Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs Legislation Amendment, Child Disability Assistance well Bill, uh, that we are debating today. This bill introduces a new payment child disability assistance into social security law. It is an annual tax-free payment of uh, generally, and in most cases, $1,000 to recipients of care allowance for those who care for children under the age of 16 years. It is proposed to start from the 1st of July of this year and is funded over four years. Uh, the measure was announced uh, by the Prime Minister and uh, Minister Brough on the 28th of June of this year as part of the Disability Assistance Package. The first payment is proposed to be made in October of this year and the total cost of the measure is $566.5 million over four years. In June 2006, carer allowance was paid to 106,500 carers who cared for 125,500 children with disabilities. Carers of children with disability are under great financial pressure in their efforts to care for, the children, for their children and pay for ex essential supports. Medical expenses can greatly exceed those usually faced for most children. Early intervention therapies, respite care, appropriate educational placements, physical aids, uh, all of these costs place families in situations where the provision for their child is actually beyond their resources. And Madam Acting Deputy President, I know you're very close to, uh, well, you have done a lot of research about uh, the costs that families bear uh, where, when they have children with autism. And I'm aware that there are families paying over $10,000 a year in order to um, uh, uh, pay for the early intervention programs that uh, are now being provided uh, for children with autism. Uh, these, uh, that cost of over $10,000 is a cost that only some families can bear. And that means that there are families we know receiving very good quality early intervention services for children with autism uh, in the three to five year old age bracket. Uh, but because of those costs, there are a lot of families who are missing out. Children with disability have diverse needs that uh, often change over time. Young children with disability can, uh, can benefit from early intervention and therapy to maximise maximize their early childhood development and learning and therefore their inclusion in society uh, in their uh, more mature years. Families and children benefit from, um, <clears throat> from respite care to allow the, the family to regroup, to allow the family time uh, to uh, invest in the long-term care of their child. As they develop, it's clear that older children will outgrow aids and equipment and some will need to be replaced. Home and vehicle modifications, hoists in the home, help to uh, modify the family car are often necessary. This child disability assistance payment will assist carers with the purchase of this sort of assistance and other assistance that best suits the needs of the family. These uh, $1,000 payments, of course, then are welcome uh, and uh, Labor will support its package through the parliament. But in doing so, let me make some very brief comments, acknowledging the time, about uh, the current negotiations between the government and the states and territories around the Commonwealth State and Territory Disability Agreement. Uh, that agreement is currently being renegotiated, and I use that term renegotiated extremely loosely. Uh, it has been uh, a very, very frustrating uh, uh, picture for people with disability to watch. We have seen Minister Brough treat the states and territories with absolute contempt. We have seen the t states and territories try as best they can 
to negotiate in, in, in good faith. We have seen the minister put uh, offers on the table and then remove them. We now have a situation where we could end up with an even more complex set of services for people with a disability if uh, the proposals, as Minister Brough has identified, uh, are, are proceeded with. You would be aware, Madam Acting Deputy President, of the uh, report of the Senate Community Affairs inquiry into the Commonwealth State and Territory Disability Agreement. One of the very clear uh, messages from that inquiry was that people with disability and their families find negotiating the, um, the service uh, systems for people with disabilities extremely complex. It would seem that we are about to uh, uh, embark on yet another layer of complexity for people with disabilities and their families. I have urged Minister Brough from uh, earlier this, well, from I think March this year, to undertake negotiations with the state and territories in good faith. That has not been achieved, and it is absolutely clear from uh, the correspondence from people with disabilities and carers uh, that they are totally frustrated uh, with what they are witnessing. Disability services, I think, is the best example of blame game, the best example of where a government or members of, gov or, uh, members of parliament take the easy option of blaming someone else for uh, an inability for people to attain disability services. It is a, the blame game that must cease. We must end up with a situation where people with disabilities can navigate a system easily, can provide the services that they are entitled to, and as part of that, of course, uh, there is a requirement to look to appropriate levels of funding for disability services in this country. People with disabilities want to contribute to their society. They want to be part of society. They want to be included. But when you can't um, access the services that allow that to happen, uh, the opportunity of being part of society is hugely diminished. So uh, I'll leave my comments there, uh, except to say we do support, of course, uh, the uh, child disability assistance uh, package that we are debating today. Uh, but can I urge the minister, Minister Brough, to look very closely uh, at what is going to be the outcome for people with disabilities if he continues uh, in what I think is quite um, an adversarial approach to negotiating with the states and territories around the long-term funding for people with disabilities, and that's through the CSTDA. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Democrats support this legislation before us uh, in as much as it uh, introduces uh, the uh, child disability assistance payment uh, that will, uh, I guess, lock in uh, an automatic payment for uh, families receiving an instalment of care allowance uh, for caring for a child with a disability uh, of $1,000 uh, each year. Uh, that's uh, an eligible payment for uh, annual payment, sorry, for eligible families in receipt of that care allowance uh, on 1 July. Uh, and it's certainly preferable to have that locked in in legislation as something people know uh, is coming, an entitlement that they will receive uh, rather than have to uh, rely on the vagaries of individual budgets for providing these sorts of one-off payments. Um, I'd, I'd be interested at some stage to see a dispassionate cost-benefit analysis of uh, whether these various uh, one-off lump sum payments that are becoming more fashionable these days uh, is the most effective way of uh, getting value for money and delivering um, income assistance to people in need. And I don't actually have a fixed view on that, whether it is uh, a good initiative and a good uh, uh, change that's been becoming more frequent in recent years or, or whether it's uh, a less effective way overall of, of assisting people. Uh, but either way, 
Uh, there's no doubt, as I've said many times before, if there's one group in the community who could always do with more assistance of whatever sort, uh, in a financial sense, uh, it's carers. Uh, so I'm certainly not uh, criticising the fact that it's being provided. I just think uh, when we are spending public monies uh, in an, entrench an entrenching particular approach that uh, having a, uh, an analysis of whether that's the best way to assist people and the best value for money to maximise assistance for people that need it, I think we, we could probably benefit from, from having a bit of a review of all those sorts of things uh, perhaps after the election is out of the way. Uh, as I said, people uh, who are carers are, uh, I think, amongst uh, the group in the community that uh, can always uh, almost unequivocally always do with more assistance, more recognition, more support, and that's about more than just money, of course. Uh, and one of the arguments in favour of lump sum payments like these $1,000 these annual payments is it does assist with uh, uh, people being able to decide for themselves um, how to best use, uh, how, to, how to get the support they most need that's tailored to their individual need rather than a, a predetermined type of assistance or, or entitlement that uh, you know, people have to uh, shape their needs to or their actions to to, to access. Uh, it does mean that, that people can use this in whatever way they choose to get the most benefit out of it. Uh, so that, that's um, certainly an argument in favour of these sort of lump sum payments. Um, there is, I think, a need for continual monitoring and assessment of uh, the nature of uh, support for children, particularly uh, children in their younger years. Uh, I think um, uh, Senator McLucas was alluding, amongst other things, to uh, parents with uh, children with autism, amongst others, uh, who are a group where I think we need to do a lot better with uh, assessing the, the extent of extra support that's provided and the nature of the support that's provided. And uh, children with uh, conditions on the autism spectrum uh, have a, present in a wide variety of different ways and it manifests itself in a wide variety of different ways uh, that I think doesn't necessarily fit the, the fairly narrow medical um, criteria, um, assessment criteria and diagnosis that, that tends to apply with various conditions. Uh, we still have a lot more we need to learn about the nature of um, children with uh, ASD. But uh, part of that, I think, is learning more about the sorts of assistance that's needed and uh, should be provided and the type of support that needs to be provided. Uh, as I said before, that's more than just financial, uh, but when you're even undergoing a financial stress as part of trying to provide that support, then it makes it harder to get other support. Um, that you may need, particularly emotional or um, social supports. Uh, that's just one example, but it's one that I think does need more, more focus. Uh, I was part of the Senate committee inquiry that examined uh, the child, uh, sorry, the Commonwealth State and Territory Disability Agreement. I wasn't as involved in that inquiry as I would like, but I was involved with it to some extent, certainly sufficiently to know that there's still massive room for improvement in that area. Um, and I would reaffirm the, the comments of Senator McLucas in a general sense about that we really need to move beyond that state versus federal blame game. And uh, that's not just uh, a comment of blaming the feds, because I don't want to move into that role either. Uh, I think across the board, uh, all of us at all levels really need to move beyond that. Uh, I think if there's one area post-election that really needs serious examination, um, um, hasn't featured as much as it could in public debate at the moment is just really totally re-examining that whole Commonwealth state arrangements, the, the federalism compact, if you like. Now, whether people think the best environment for re-examining that federalism compact is with uh, Labor state governments and a, a Howard Costello Liberal government or Labor governments across the board, I don't know. People can make their own judgments on that. I have my views as well, but that's for the electorate to determine. But I do think there's a role for the Senate in that uh, debate as well post-election, uh, sometimes still called the state's house, uh, and I think in terms of that not terribly accurate but nonetheless very widespread view of the Senate's role and, and certainly the, the nature of the Senate and the way it's structured coming out of uh, Federation in 1901 
we as an institution also have a need to examine ourselves uh, how we're structured and how we operate as part of looking at that whole modernisation and making the whole system work properly and fixing things that definitely are broken. Uh, and the Senate needs to do a bit of re-examining itself, I think, uh, along the way. But as part of that, I think we, we can play a role um, somewhat, hopefully, independent or outside of the the uh, government to government stouches that go on between state and federal level uh, to try and see work through that in a more um, dispassionate and evidence-based way to get the best possible outcomes, as I might say that Senate committee did when it looked at the disability area where it produced uh, a non-partisan report, a unanimous report, and it's a great shame that the federal government hasn't chosen to act on it in a terribly constructive way. Uh, that is a bit of an aside, but I, only a little bit. It is actually linked into this wider issue. Uh, One-off payments to help people who are caring with children with disabilities is important, and the Democrats welcome that, uh, but we can't kid ourselves. I'm not suggesting the government is arguing this, but we cannot kid ourselves that uh, these sorts of tacking on payments here and there, tacking on particular initiatives here and there, is enough to tackle the core problem, which is that we are failing in this area uh, far too often uh, in regards to people with disabilities and particularly for carers, uh, for children with uh, disabilities, particularly some disabilities more than others. Um, so this is welcome, but it's, uh, it's still far short of what's needed. And, and what is needed is not necessarily piles and piles more money, uh, although certainly it would be of assistance in some circumstances. What is needed is much, much better value out of the money that is spent. And I know that's part of the argument that Minister Bruff is putting forward, uh, and I can see some validity in that. And to sometimes it's more a matter of the way you go about things rather than what it is that you say you're trying to achieve, um, which I would be somewhat more critical of uh, in regard to the minister. But look, the the payment is welcome. The the other concern the Democrats have, and I do have an amendment circulated on this. Um, I shall speak to that now, pretty much to save time. Uh, in the committee stage is, of course, that this $1,000 payment is uh, also going to come under the so-called income management regime or the quarantining regime, where people's income support payments or welfare entitlements uh, are able to be controlled by government and people get told what they can and can't spend it on and where they can or can't spend it. Um, the Democrats outlined our views on that overall issue somewhat uh, reasonably comprehensively during the debate on the Northern Territory intervention measures, uh, so I won't traverse all of that ground again, but I would say that uh, we have a preparedness to explore the workability of income management arrangements under set circumstances uh, to trial that. Um, in uh, certain circumstances to see how well it will work. Uh, we do not support and are quite concerned about it being applied across the board. Uh, it is, of course, being applied across the board um, in the Northern Territory in a number of communities, and that's started, I think, this week. It's actually started to come into operation. Um, I imagine all of us in this place have received representations and concerns about how that is being practically applied in parts of the Territory and uh, whether or not it will be workable for many people who are amongst those who most need uh, income assistance. Uh, so we aren't convinced that this particular payment should come under that regime, that income management regime, at least until there's been time to see how well it's operating. Uh, this payment, these allowances won't come into play until the 1st of July, um, so there'll be time to uh, see down the track um, with the next instalments of payments whether or not the income management is working in a way that uh, you know, would suit for this sort of thing. We think it needs a bit more of a, a go, basically, before we start lumping in uh, these sorts of payments in it as well. I, I am sure that most Australians still don't realise that uh, it is now in place under law that uh, uh, anybody potentially down the track could have their payments quarantined and income managed uh, on the basis of uh, decisions made in the future by federal government um, in regards to school attendance and, and the like and uh, child protection issues. 
Uh, now, I'm not saying that should never happen, but I am saying it's been put in place in law without a lot of people even being aware that it's put there and without very much examination of how it's likely to operate down the track. Uh, governments will have that power uh, to implement that without proper scrutiny at the time because we've rushed it all through a few weeks ago and uh, done so in a way where I don't think most people even realise it's happened. Uh, so in those circumstances, I don't think it's desirable to be throwing new payments into that mix until we see how that... Uh, income management arrangements operate. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, this bill introduces a new form of assistance for people with disability and their carers, confirming the Australian Government's ongoing commitment to this area. Through this measure, families receiving an, an instalment of carer allowance on 1 July 2007 for caring for a child with a disability will be paid a lump sum of $1,000. This will help families buy whatever assistance they may need, for example additional respite equipment or early intervention therapy for their child. This new annual payment will go to eligible families receiving care allowance on July 1 each year for each child under 16 who attracts a payment of care allowance, a separate $1,000 payment will be made. Families will have flexibility in the use of their payment uh, as best suits them because the government recognises that children with disability and their families have needs that are diverse and are changing. Early intervention therapy and therapy to maximise early childhood development and learning may be the best investments for a young child with a disability. Some families and children will particularly appreciate a break through respite care. Children may outgrow aids and equipments as they grow older and, the need, to have, and need to have them replaced, home or vehicle modifications such as a hoist in the home or some form of assistance in the family car may necess be necessary for other families. The new $1,000 payment will not be subject to income tax nor will it count as income for, the so for social security or family assistance purposes. The $1,000 payment for 2007 will be paid automatically to eligible families in October 2007. From 2008, uh, 2008 onwards, the payment will be paid automatically to eligible families in July. No claim will be required. Uh, the government anticipates that this payment will improve the quality of life for around 130,000 children with disability and their families and carers. And can I just make a couple of quick comments in relation to the contribution of Senator McLucas, particularly in response to her um, desire for an end to the blame game? It was interesting, Madam Acting Deputy President, that. Uh, she uh, expressed a sincere desire for the blame game to end, but spent most of her contribution actually in engaging in it. And I acknowledge uh, Senator Bartlett's comments in relation to that. It's very difficult to engage with the states when they, or negotiate with the states when they won't engage with you on some circumstances. Now, some states have been better in, than others in respect of um, the disability agreement. Uh, my home state, uh, the minister there, didn't even respond to uh, correspondence from the minister. So it does make it very difficult. Uh, and if you don't want to engage in the blame game, uh, don't engage. Don't engage in, in the blame game yourself. So um, on, on that context, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I uh, commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to social security and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Democrat amendment here I've spoken to to some extent in the second reading speech. I won't go on at length, given the legislative load that the Senate's dealing with. Uh, the Democrats are proposing that items 9 to 13 of the legislation be removed. Uh, this is the section of the legislation which um, makes the child disability assistance payment subject to income management or quarantining as it's called. Um, according to the explanatory memorandum, the child disability assistance will be treated in the same way uh, as the carer's allowance for the purpose of income management relating to child protection, school enrolment and attendance and uh, the Queensland Commission, which is the Cape York welfare trials as I understand it. Um, and which doesn't yet exist, I don't think, either under law, but that's another matter. Um, as the, uh, I don't want to get into the blame game about that. 
as the um, new child disability assistance uh, is a lump annual lump sum payment, a uh, hundred percent of it, that is all one thousand dollars, will be subject to the income management under the rules relating to the Northern Territory. And now that does, I accept, make it consistent with how uh, other lump sums to do with uh, family tax benefit, etc., are treated. Uh, and there is an argument for consistency under social security law. I appreciate that. Uh, but as I said in my second reading contribution, uh, I think we need to see a bit more about how well the income management regime works before we start lumping every payment in there, particularly it's 100 per cent of it. Um, and it, there is, I think, no small irony that the government is saying that they're providing this payment, quite rightly, pointing out that this provides maximum flexibility for families to decide for themselves how to use this payment in a way that will meet the needs of their child that they're caring for, and yet they subject, to, subject it to income management, which is specifically designed to reduce the choice available to a person. Now, I appreciate you don't want any carer to grab a thousand bucks and go off and spend it on the pokies or you know, buy a thousand bucks worth of grog or whatever it is, um, but that is obviously a potential that's open to anybody in the country to do. Uh, and given that, particularly the people in the Northern Territory who are currently subject to the income management regime, there is no criteria in place, not even a pretense of a criteria that these people are deemed to have been shown not to you know, have them be as good as they could be at caring for their child. Um, it's blanket. Everybody's got their income, manage income being managed. Then uh, I don't think you can make the case that you know these are a group of people who have been found not to be as good as they should be at being parents, so we'll help them with their income. That's not applying in the Territory. This is everybody, all the Aboriginal people in those communities. So it, it to me, is inconsistent with the stated intent of the lump sum payment, which is to give people maximum flexibility to decide for themselves. Um, and as the, uh, I think in the second reading speech of the government, there's the payment will help carers to purchase the form of assistance that best suits the needs of their family. Well, yes it will, except for those under income management, it will be presumably a Centrelink officer or somebody who will be telling them, yes you can or no you can't, um, or potentially will be able to. Anyway, it depends a bit on how that pans out in terms of the flexibility, and we don't know that uh, in a lot of detail yet. So the Democrats believe, particularly for a payment that's meant to provide maximum flexibility for a carer to decide for themselves how they, what they should spend the money on to help the needs of their child, um, to be then be, on the one hand, introducing that for maximum flexibility and choice, and then at the same time saying, well, for this chunk of people, Aboriginal people in the Territory, actually, no, we're going to constrain your choice through this other mechanism, I think is contradictory. Um, and, and it will be interesting to see over time, and it probably is too early to tell, you know, how you know, for some of these areas that are seen as being of assistance for children, I don't want to revisit the, the whole wider debate, but you know, one, one of the problems, certainly one of the issues that come up often with carers is, well, we can only get this type of assistance, or we only get the subsidy for this sort of assistance, um, but the government's decided it's what's needed for our child, and maybe it is what's needed for most children, but you know, we are convinced our child is different. We want this type of assistance, but we're not eligible for assistance for that. Um, you know, to use the autism spectrum example again, that's a, that's a real issue for some. Uh, they can only get some type of supports and not other, and it doesn't suit their child, and they're either being forced to take the type of assistance that actually doesn't suit, or they've got to pay full bucks with no assistance at all for another type of support that's not recognised as being valid. Now, you know, that's always a, something in the whole health field, and, that uh, you, you've always got to balance when you're looking at um, taxpayer-funded assistance or subsidies or support. I appreciate that. That's never easy, but uh, you know that's the whole point of these sort of thousand-dollar payments. The, the parent knows best. We're letting them decide, um, and then with income quarantining or income management, we're saying, well, no, actually, you don't. Uh, and particularly, I think when that's something that just applies across the board to um, everybody purely on the basis of where they live. Um, and certainly some believe on the basis of their skin colour, um, then I don't think it's terribly good precedent or practice, certainly at least until we see how it operates. So that, that's the rationale behind the Democrats' amendment. Obviously, it being um, the time of day it is, I won't um, divide on it or anything, but uh, I thought the appropriate to, 
to raise that point and, and some of those concerns. Senator McLucas. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy um, Chair. Um, the, as Senator Bartlett has indicated, this, um, this amendment or the, this change proposed from government uh, is to treat uh, the disability assistance uh, uh, payment in the same way that other payments are being treated under the Northern Territory uh, intervention legislation. Uh, we look at this uh, measure in the same way that we look at uh, how we treated those measures. Uh, we strongly support the principle that family payments, whatever they might be, should be paid for the benefit of children. We also support an in income management system that provides uh, the essential, uh, uh, the essential uh, elements that a child needs to grow up a, in a, a healthy and happy and safe environment. We also support, therefore, uh, quarantining of welfare payments with this proviso that they should not be open-ended they and they should not be arbitrary. It only must target parents who are putting their children at risk. So examining this uh, proposal and assessing Senator Bartlett's amendment, uh, we won't be supporting Senator Bartlett's amendment because uh, the proposal from the government is consistent with those principles. Uh, and therefore we support the child disability assistance measure being treated as other social security uh, payments have been treated uh, uh, in the um, uh, legislation we debated uh, in the last sitting. But while I'm on my feet, I could not... Uh, I have to respond to Senator Colbeck's allegations and I am very mindful of the time. Uh, but Senator Colbeck only uh, told part of a story. Let's be very clear. The offer from the, the Commonwealth to the states, the original offer, was no increase, no increase at all on the base CSTDA multilateral agreement. The increase that was offered, the only increase, was a very small indexation which we identified during the inquiry does not meet the uh, increase in costs of delivering the current services. And many witnesses to the inquiry said that is in fact a cut. That's the first fact. The second fact was that earlier this year, Minister Bruff offered to the states dollar for dollar funding for supported accommodation. That was on a bilateral basis uh, outside of the multilateral um, negotiations. States were told to go back to their treasuries, find new money and come back to the Commonwealth uh, with an indication of what money could be provided by themselves to match on a dollar for dollar basis. In that original correspondence and, and uh, messages through the negotiations to the state, there was no indication of a cut off date or a closing date for those applications to be received. So it is disingenuous in the extreme, Senator Colbeck, and it is part of the classic blame game to be saying that your state didn't even respond to the letter. The rules changed halfway through the game. On the 4th of July this year, the minister withdrew the offer, but the original offer did not say it would close on any certain date. So I've, I put it on the record that it is disingenuous of you uh, to be saying, my state didn't even answer. You don't know what your state had been doing from the time that that letter was originally received to a bolt from the blue, 4th of July, sorry, the deal's now off. That's, that's what happened. And for you to be accusing me of, uh, of engaging in the blame game without only telling part of the story uh, is disingenuous. I do hope that that's the end of the debate Senator, that we I know have. Those, those comments were made through the chair. So, yes. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Chair. Um, the government won't be supporting the amendments of the Democrats. Uh, the, uh, the management regime, income management regime, has been put into place for a reason, and uh, the government's view is that it should not matter if the child has a disability. The intent of the uh, is still to ensure that the funds are meant for the children's welfare and that they use for that purpose. So uh, with that, um, uh, I indicate that the government won't be supporting the Democrat amendment. 
Senator Bartlett. Um, I'm not sure. I appreciate this is you know, lunchtime debate and all that, and I know you're this isn't your specific portfolio. You may or may not be able to answer this, but I would like to ask just one question in regard to that matter. Clearly, you know, people will be entitled to that $1,000 lump sum. I'm, I'm sorry, Senator Bartlett. Clearly, the um, you know, people are entitled to that $1,000 lump sum payment, and you know they. Will... Senator Carr, I cannot hear Senator Bartlett. Senator Bartlett. Um, Non-controversial can mean different things in different contexts. I think, Senator. Um, the uh, well, if you want to move to take it out of non-controversial, feel free. The the um, let me start again. Sorry. The, so people are entitled to that thousand dollars as a lump sum. You're saying that, you know the intention is to make sure they spend it on the, the child's welfare. Uh, I, I guess the one thing I'd like to establish is if um, the income management regime, as I understand it, has a pile of list of things that people are able to spend um, money on uh, in you know, necessities for one of a more um, precise term. Uh, will people actually need to check what they spend this thousand dollars on if they want to buy some counselling for their child or some therapy? Um, will they actually need to go to Centrelink and say, yes, I want this therapy and is that okay? Um, or is that just going to be, you know, therapy will be seen as a, a given that they can spend it on that and they won't need to go and check with Centrelink about uh, what type of therapy it is and whether it's appropriate for that child and those sorts of things? You can take that on notice if need be. I appreciate you not to, um, you know, it's not your portfolio. But. Minister. Uh, I, I think I can perhaps give an indication to you, Senator, through you, Chair. Um, in all of the measures, individuals discuss their financial commitments and required expenditure with Centrelink, and consideration will be given to them, by them um, to medical or care requirements as part of the process. If you want any further information, I'm happy to take that uh, for you on notice, but that, uh, that there is a requirement uh, for, the for the commitment of required expenditure with Centrelink as part of the, uh, as part of the management process. The, the question is that Schedule 1 items 9 to 13 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs Legislation Amendment Child Disability Assistance Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to social security and for related purposes. Clark. Government business order of the day number nine, families, community services and indigenous affairs legislation amendment, further 2007 budget measures bill 2007, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Mill. Minister. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. This bill furthers the government's commitment to supporting older Australians and families with children, whilst also increasing fairness and support for humanitarian and other entrants into Australia. Older Australians will benefit from changes to the pension bonus scheme and by improvements to the legislative treatment of funeral investments in the context of social security and veterans affairs payments. Families and children will benefit from extensions to multiple birth allowance. And lastly, it expands crisis payment to humanitarian entrants and it simplifies and improves the operation and integrity of the assurance support program. I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to social security, veterans affairs and family assistance and for related purposes. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. 
question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to social security, veterans affairs and family assistance and for related purposes. Clerk. Government business order of the day. Social Security Legislation Amendment 2007 Budget Measures for Students Bill 2007. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Carr. Yes, um, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to incorporate my second reading speech and to formally move the second reading amendment standing in my name, which has been circulated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister? I'm so I don't think so. Minister. Uh, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Um, the purpose of this bill is to amend uh, three acts the Student Assistance Act 1973, the Social Security Act 1991, and the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997. These measures contained in the bill enhance the delivery of income support for students and provide a significant benefit to students and their families at a cost to the budget of $135 million over four years. These measures demonstrate the importance the Australian government places on ensuring that all Australians, regardless of age, location or background, have the opportunity to participate in education and training and contribute to the nation's continued prosperity. The Australian economy depends on its most precious and important resource, its people. A well-educated and skilled population increases workforce participation and allows every Australian to make a contribution to the wider, the broad Australian community. In closing, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues on the Employment, Workplace, Relations and Education Standing Committee for their inquiry into these bills. And I note that all parties represented on the committee supported the passage of the bills. Um, Madam Acting De Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Dr Spoyer. In that case, Madam Deputy President, may I seek leave to give my second reading speech? Uh, sorry, I didn't realise uh, that uh, I had limited time. Is that agreeable to the chamber? Yes, we've got Senator Carr's amendment in front of the chair, Senator Dr Spoyer, so we'll move into, if you don't need to seek leave, you can move into your second reading speech. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I, um, I'm keen to speak to this legislation because it's been a long time coming and uh, it's one that uh, uh, the Democrats do uh, support um, and commend the government for, albeit belatedly. Uh, this bill, of course, implements some of the student income support measures contained in the last budget, including, and most importantly, as far as we're concerned, extending rent assistance to Austudy recipients and allowing certain postgraduate students to access Austudy and youth allowance. We do welcome these changes, particularly the extension of rent assistance to Austudy recipients. It's something that I've campaigned for along with some others in this place, for many, many years. Combined with other student income support measures in the budget, these measures constitute a $222 million increase for student income support over the next four years. This is well overdue. Um, Madam Deputy President, as has been highlighted, uh, in fact, only in today's paper, I think page five of today's Australian, you've got a number of backbench members of the coalition pointing out that debt levels for Australian students are high. We also have to recognise that um, the affordability of education has plummeted in some ways. Hex fees have increased substantially. Uh, the introduction of full fee degrees uh, have further entrenched a user pay system in this country. Across this system, across the country, students, uh, graduates owe a grand total of $12.9 billion to the government. More than 2,000 Australians have individual debts of $40,000 or more. Madam Deputy President, in 1997, after the Howard government raised the age of independence for income support to 25, after the Keating government, remember, had implemented a gradual reduction in that age, uh, with uh, down to 22. In 1999, the Prime Minister promised there would be no $100,000 degrees under his watch. Now we've got more than 100 degrees that cost more than that amount and some that cost around $240,000. That's massive. In 2006, 30,200 domestic students paid full fees for their undergraduate degrees. Last year, it's more than double the amount in 2005. So this is expanding. This year, of course, the government brought in legislation that theoretically allows universities to establish full fee-only courses. 
All of these skyrocketing costs for students occur against a background of the rising price of essentials in the community more broadly, such as petrol, such as food, rent, etc., leading to a rise in financial stress among the student population. Now, Madam Deputy President, if anyone doubts that, you only have to look at the recent survey by Universities Australia, the report, Australian University Student Finances Study 2006. According to this report, one in eight students regularly go without food or other essentials because they can't afford them. The average number of hours worked by full-time undergraduate students is now 14.8 hours, 14 hours per week. There has been a suspicious decline in the proportion of full-time undergraduates receiving youth allowance or Ausstudy, from 42.4 per cent in 2000 to 35.2 per cent last year. And I've got very, I can't believe it's due to a lack of demand. Other studies have shown that the cost of tertiary education is a significant barrier to rural students, with 47 per cent indicating that it would be difficult for them to support themselves at university. So this state of affairs is clearly not in the interest of individual students. If students are worrying about their finances, uh, not being able to afford food or other essentials, or they're working significant hours each week, their studies are highly likely to suffer. That's not in the national interest. Our country, of course, is going to depend on highly skilled workers to remain internationally competitive into the future. So how can you be focused on the economy on the one hand, but allow a system to develop where the employees of tomorrow reject tertiary study due to cost or have education distracted by their financial considerations? What does it say about the future workforce if entry into university is going to be increasingly determined by your wealth rather than your merit? Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sad that this is an area where the government hasn't been more active. And while the two key measures in the bill today are an improvement, they represent government outlays of $86.9 million and $43.3 million, respectively, spread over four years, so a relatively small amount in the context of the higher education budget. And of course, these two issues alone will not significantly address this pressing issue of affordability. Madam Acting Deputy President, as senators here would know, in 2004 I initiated a student income support inquiry through the Senate, uh, through the Senate committee. It was tabled in June 2005, so albeit with the interruption of a federal election in the middle, um, it had 15 recommendations tailored to relieve student financial stress. The government still hasn't responded to this inquiry. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, maybe this is a question to the um, acting minister today. When is the government going to respond? If the convention is three months, then we've well and truly passed that stage. June 2005, September 2007, years. The first inquiry ever to look solely at the issue of student income support. I think that's a clear breach of Senate protocol, but more importantly, it suggests to the sector, to the community, not just students and aspiring students or graduates, but to Universities Australia and to other peak organisations, that the government doesn't care about this pressing issue. And as I've said repeatedly, in fact, in this Senate this week when we were discussing the Higher Education Endowment Fund, we know that this is a key, key indicator in ensuring that people can participate or enter into education at all levels, but higher education in particular. Student income support. It's got to be adequate, it's got to be accessible. So we're familiar with what I consider, what I perceive as a disregard shown by the government um, in this particular area of policy, but this is really a blatant example uh, of uh, disrespect for these particular issues. There were 140 submissions, by the way, to that Senate inquiry. Of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, there's much more the government could do to address some of these issues, and obviously we don't have time today to address those, but uh, scholarships, all scholarships could be tax-free. I know that Universities Australia and other groups would uh, uh, acknowledge that. Of course, reduction in the age of independence, ideally 18, you know, even, even 21, even 22, where the you know, Keating government was at. It's still quite arbitrary in terms of how we define uh, sort of your eligibility for adult versus other benefits. I mean, there's plenty of legislation, Madam Acting Deputy President, social security legislation, where you're defined as an adult at the age of 16 if it saves money for government, but it doesn't seem to work the other way when it comes to being eligible for payments, particularly payments that would actually assist you in what we should be considering an investment in the future, not a cost. Obviously, the um, peg, pegging the rate of off study youth allowance to a level equivalent to the Henderson poverty line. Um, there are a range of measures, and of course I do refer to and recommend that Senate inquiry, its report. 
Madam Acting Deputy President, the Democrats have long argued for and believed in an equitable and well-funded higher education system. We certainly oppose and have for a long time this increasing shift towards deregulation of the sector and certainly an additional uh, reliance upon private funding. So I hope that the government doesn't think that these measures are enough in themselves. This is not an attempt to sort of fob off students and others before an election, and I don't just mean students, I mean the broader community. I think that there are serious issues out there that have to be addressed by the government in relation to university study, and judging by the remarks that I saw in the paper today, I think from uh, Dr Mal Washer and others, I mean these are concerns that are held across the political spectrum. I think, uh, to paraphrase one of the comments I read this morning, something along the lines of, you know, why do we have this booming economy and yet we've got so much debt? You know, it's not right that our future you know, students, graduates, you know, the skill set of tomorrow are being burdened with such massive individual debt, you know, the size of a mortgage in order to, um, to access education, especially when theoretically through a progressive taxation system people should be repaying uh, their money into uh, government coffers and contributing to the community. So yes, this bill is important. These measures are essential, but there are a broad range of other measures, a suite of reforms, Madam Acting Deputy President, that have to be introduced to address this measure. And once again, I appeal to both sides of, uh, of Parliament to, uh, uh, to, to consider these issues. Uh, it's not just the, uh, the government. There's also an aspiring government here, and I wouldn't mind hearing a bit more detail from them about what they propose when it comes to student income support as well. Thank you, Senator. The question is that Senator Carr's second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the provision of benefits to students and for related purposes. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the provision of benefits to students and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 10, Superannuation Legislation Amendment Bill 2007, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Murray. Thank you. Uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, the Superannuation Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 proposes amendments to Australian Government civilian and military superannuation schemes contained in six related schedules. The overall purpose of the bill is to harmonise choice and super schemes for Australian Government employees and to ensure that Government superannuation schemes are in accord with recent amendments to the Australian superannuation system enacted via the simplified superannuation legislation. The requirement for contributing members of the Commonwealth Superannuation Scheme to make member contributions to the CSS is removed from 1 July 2008, thereby making all member contributions broadly voluntary and providing members with the same flexibility and incentives to contribute to superannuation that are available to the broader community. Eligible members of the public sector's superannuation scheme will be allowed to elect to leave the PSS and join other superannuation arrangements for the payment of future contributions, which will provide eligible members with the flexibility for future contributions that is already available to most of the work Australian workforce. Members of the CSS will be able to obtain early release of their funded account balances on severe financial hardship and compassionate grounds from 1 January 2008. Previously cancelled spouse pensions will be prospectively restored from 1 January 2008, and an amendment ensuring entitlements to benefits in the Defence Force Retirement Death Benefits Act scheme relating to post-retirement marriages is consistent with the treatment in the civilian schemes that is proposed and an anomaly in the, an anomaly in the treatment of the benefits payable in the Act scheme upon marriage breakdown is also rectified. The committee report into this bill proposed five key recommendations which adequately summarise key concerns arising from this bill. I note the government agrees with three of the recommendations. Committee recommendations are minor in the context of the overall benefits proposed by the bill. Australian policy, uh, Democrats' policy has consistently sought for flexibility and choice in superannuation legislation. These amendments will finally provide choice and greater flexibility for civilian government and military employees, finally harmonising super choice for both government and non-government employees. 
Turning to my amendments, they aim to implement the Herioc Same-Sex Same Entitlements Report recommendations. They are drafted in the absence of government initiatives to address those recommendations. Democrats have followed Herioc's suggested amendment form as closely as we can. I would be delighted were the government to substitute their own amendments for mine, but there is no sign of that moral courage yet. I move these now because this issue is urgent and this unwarranted discrimination is overdue for correction. 58 federal laws were identified by Herioc as needing similar amendments. Specifically, the Democrats' amendments will implement the Herioc de facto relationship definition. Our amendments are in line with Herioc's preferred approach for a dual system, one which recognises heterosexual and marital relationships and a separate second set that, that acknowledges same-sex relationships which are non-marital. The Australian Democrats propose amendments which will remove unnecessary gender disc uh, uh, sexual preference discrimination. If the government decides not to support the Democrat amendments, it will be because it does not support the removal of clauses in superannuation legislation that discriminate on the basis of sexual preference. In other words, the coalition will be continuing to uphold homophobic laws. Given the strong cross-party for support for ending unjust discrimination, including from many, many members of the Cabinet and the, uh, uh, and the coalition parties, this would be a very sad and wrongful outcome. Herioc has identified these particular acts as needing amendment to end this unjust discrimination. From page 380 of the Same Sex Same Entitlements Herioc report, I take the following quotes as discrimination under superannuation laws. A federal government employee surviving same-sex partner cannot access direct death benefits. Lump sum or reversionary pension are available to a surviving opposite sex partner unless the employee joined the public service after the 1st July 2005. The surviving child of a lesbian co-mother or gay co-father who was a federal government employee will not usually qualify for direct death benefits, lump sum or reversionary pension available to the child of a birth mother or birth father. It is harder for a surviving same-sex partner to qualify for death benefits in private superannuation schemes as a person in an interdependency relationship than for a surviving opposite-sex partner as a spouse. A surviving same-sex partner cannot usually qualify for a reversionary pension in a private superannuation scheme which is available to an opposite-sex partner. It is harder for a surviving same-sex partner to access death benefits from a retirement savings account as a person in an interdependency relationship than for a surviving opposite-sex partner. It is harder for a surviving same-sex partner to access death benefits tax concessions than for a surviving opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot access the death benefits anti-detriment payment available to an opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot engage in superannuation contribution splitting and the associated tax advantages available to an opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot access the superannuation spouse tax offset available to an opposite-sex partner. A surviving same-sex partner of a federal judge cannot access the reversionary pension available to a surviving opposite-sex partner. A surviving same-sex partner of a Governor-General cannot access the allowance available to a surviving opposite-sex partner. And chapter 13 in the report on superannuation provides more detail about these and other superannuation entitlements. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Madam Mecklen, Deputy President. Uh, the Superannuation Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 makes a number of enhancements to the Australian Government's civilian and military superannuation schemes. The bill removes from 1 July 2008 the requirement for contributory members of the Commonwealth Superannuation Scheme, the CSS, to make member contributions to the scheme. As a result, member contributions will become voluntary. This will provide members with the same flexibility and incentives to contribute to superannuation that are available to the broader community. The bill also allows from 1 July 2008 eligible members of the PSS to elect to, to leave the PSS and join, other super, and uh, join another superannuation arrangement for the payment of future contributions. A member's eligibility to join another superannuation arrangement will be determined by the choice of arrangements that their employer has in place. From 1 July 2008, the bill will enable members of the CSS to obtain early release of their funded account balances on severe financial hardship and compassionate grounds to the extent allowed under the superannuation regulatory framework. The bill will also facilitate from 1 January 2008 the prospective restoration of pensions for persons whose spouse pensions provided under certain closed Australian government civilian and military superannuation schemes were cancelled upon remarriage. Upon valid, applic valid application, spouse pensions cancelled on marriage prior to 1976 in the civil, civilian scheme and prior to 1977 in the military schemes 
will be prospectively reinstated. Changes to the CSS as a consequence of the government's better super reforms are also included in the bill. The main amendment will ensure that con the continued payment of employer productivity contributions where a member has not provided their tax file number. This is consistent with the arrangements in the broader community where, em where employer contributions would still be payable even though the member has not provided their tax file number. The other amendments are technical and take account of the payment of amounts from the CSS fund in relation to these to release authorities issued by the Commission of Taxation to reflect the changed super superannuation terminology. The bill also ensures that entitlements to benefits in the military superannuation schemes relating to post-retirement marriages is consistent with treatment in the civilian schemes. The bill also addresses an anomaly in the family law provisions of the Defence Force Retirement Death Benefits Act 1973 to allow the family law orders to be applied as intended. The bill's bill was referred to the Standing Committee on Public Finance Administration for inquiry. The committee made five recommendations. Recommendations one and two require the government to instruct the trustee of the scheme and the Australian uh, Reward Investment Alliance in relation to pro providing information to members of the public sector <coughs> superannuation scheme about implications of reducing the member contributions to zero and promoting the changes that enable spouse pensions that were cancelled on remarriage to be restored. The government in agreed in principle with both recommendations. However, the government could not agree with the exact wording of the recommendations as the regulatory legislative framework established under the Superannuation Industries Supervision Act 1993 does, do, does not permit the government to instruct the trustee of a regulated superannuation scheme. The government acknowledged the intention of recommendations three and four, that individuals not be financially disadvantaged by the commencement of policies in the bill. However, the government is concerned that providing for the retrospective effect of these policies may have in unintended detrimental effects on individuals. The government considers that the broad desired outcome of, can be achieved effectively through alternate mechanisms. The government agrees with recommend, recommendation five that the bill pass the Senate. Um, can I also indicate to Senator Murray that the government won't be supporting um, his amendments. Um, I acknowledge his comments uh, in relation to uh, overall perspectives in relation to uh, those amendments. Um, I can assure him that there is work being done on progressing that. Uh, but at this point in time, we're not in a situation to uh, support the amendments. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and for related purposes. The wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole. Being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Murray. Uh, Madam Chair, we don't need to rework the, uh, the arguments. Uh, we've heard them uh, both the other day and today. So in the interest of uh, progressing um, debate for the bills remaining at this period, I move 5042 revised. Uh, it is five pages, but just one amendment. Uh, and I won't speak further to it. Thank you, Senator. The question, is the be the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Superannuation Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Mr. Move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. I, rem Mr. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 11, Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Bill number 1, 2007, second reading, adjourned debate. 
Minister. I table a replacement explanatory memorandum re re relating to the Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007. Senator Murray. Um, Madam Chair, I, uh, sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President, sorry, I seek leave to incorporate a second reading speech into the Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the, this Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007. Well, I'm happy to incorporate it if you're happy to accept it. Well, if you're happy to accept it, I'll seek leave to incorporate. <coughs> quite, quite, seek leave to incorporate my is, uh, is summing leave, up speech. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Financial Management and Accountability Act 1997 and for related purposes. Minister. Does the bill be read a third time? The question is that the bill. Senator Murray. Uh, we need to move into the committee stage, Madam. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stands printed. Senator Murray. Madam Chair, I seek leave to move amendments uh, one to three on sheet five two seven zero together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Murray. I move Murray. those amendments. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. <laughs> Those that have been say aye against say no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill standard is printed. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. I remove the, I move the, <laughs> I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Financial Management and Accountability Act 1997 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Australian Technical Colleges, Flexibility in Achieving Australia's Skills Needs Amendment Bill number two, 2007, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Carr. Uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to incorporate my second reading speech and I formally move the second reading amendment which has been circulated in my name. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senators Crossan, Wortley, and Carol Brown, and Polly, oh, and Bishop, uh, I seek leave to incorporate their remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, thank you, Madam Minister. Deputy President. I um, uh, seek leave to incorporate my summing up speech and commend the bill to the Senate. It's leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion, second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Technical College's Flexibility in Achieving Australia's Skills Needs Act 2005 and for related purposes. Minister. Move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. Think the ayes. Oh. Senator Carr. 
question is that the second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Technical College's flexibility in achieving Australia's skills needs. Act 2005 and for related purposes. Minister. The bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Technical College's flexibility in achieving Australia's skills needs. Act 2005 and for related purposes. Minister. I move the sitting of the Senate be suspended until 2 p.m. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Sitting, sitting of the Senate is suspended until 2 p.m.
Order. Uh, questions without notice, Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to <coughs> Senator Betts, Minister representing the Minister for Environment and Water Resources. And I would ask, can the minister confirm that the Howard government has slashed renewable energy research programs, closing down the Energy R&D Corporation, the CRC for Renewable Energy and the Renewable Energy Commercialisation Program? Isn't it a fact there is now almost no federal funding for research into renewable energy technologies? Isn't this why many world-leading renewable technologies that originated in Australia, like the evacuated tubes for solar hot water, solar thermal concentrators, silver cells for solar electricity, have been forced overseas? Why has the Howard government abandoned Australia's world-leading research into renewable energy and forced our leading scientists to move overseas? Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. The uh, brief answer to the Honourable Senator's question is no, but allow me to expand on it. Comprehensive uh, strategies are in place, underpinned by almost $3.5 billion worth of investment, contributing to an 87 million tonne a year cut in emissions by 2010. Recently announced initiatives by the Howard government has included $336 million green vouchers for schools, $252 million solar hot water rebates, etc. Et but uh, we also have invested uh, $15 million in the Future Gen International Partnership. We have uh, invested uh, $70.7 million, $5 million for the Asia Pacific Network for Energy Technology. 50 million to support further actions through the APP and 15.7 million for increased regional expertise in forest management. And uh, so, Mr. President, the list goes on. The Australian Labor Party can try and make the claim, as he does all the time, that somehow it has been the champion of uh, climate change. The simple facts are these. We were the ones that introduced the Australian Greenhouse Office in 1998. Thereafter, thereafter, there were literally years, a full 12 months would go by without the Labor Party asking a single question about climate change or global warming. Indeed, if you do a search of Hansard from 1998 up until May 2007, the vast majority of questions in this area have in fact been asked by coalition senators. The only time that the Labor Party have asked more questions on this issue than the coalition has in fact been in the last 12 months. And that is why I coined the phrase of Kevin's come lately to this issue, because it was only with Mr Rudd did they finally decide this might be an issue. Before that, we as a government had been developing policies and investing Australian taxpayers' dollars in ensuring that we were well positioned around the world in relation to these issues. We have, Mr President, and we have a very good record. And Mr President, uh, all I would suggest to uh, Senator Carr is that rather than accepting questions from the uh, Question Time Committee, he and Senator Sherry has interjected embarrassingly for Senator Carr to say that Senator Carr had, had actually crafted the question himself. And Senator Sherry is confirming that. In that case, Mr President, the fault does not lie with the Question Time Committee. Chances are Senator Sherry is a member of it and he wants to defend himself. And so if it, and so it, so if it is all Senator Carr's work, Mr order, President, order, I suggest order, that his supplementary order. might be pe pe Point of order, Senator Carr? Yeah, the point of order. Order. Mr. Mr President, the minister was asked a specific question about the government closing down the Energy R&D Corporation, the CRC for Renewable Energy and the Renewable Energy Commercialisation Program. The question went to why was the government forcing Australian scientists, who are expert in renewable energy, overseas? The minister has failed to answer. Can you draw him to the question? The, 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 the minute, order.
Order. Order. Senator Betts, do you have anything to add to that previous answer? Yes, I have. Oh. <laughs> Senator Carr, supplementary question? Uh, I'd ask the minister again, uh, Mr. President, if he could answer the question about the closure of these research programs and the government's policy to force Australian scientists overseas. I'd further ask, is the minister aware that Pacific Solar sold the rights to its silicon on glass technology to a German firm which is now developing and commercialising this technology? Don't Australians now have to import evacuated tubes for solar hot water from China, even though this technology was first developed at Sydney University. Doesn't the Howard government's failure to keep these great innovations in renewable energy in Australia show that after 11 long years it still hasn't taken seriously the question of climate change? Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thought I had outlined uh, quite fully in my answer to the previous uh, question that we do take the issue of climate change very seriously. And that is why we have the raft of investments that I just referred the Honourable Senator to. But of course what happens is you have a pre-written supplementary question which has to be prattled out irrespective of the answer that is given. And that is the uh, difficulty that the Australian Labor Party uh, suffer from. But the situation is, Mr President, that uh, we as a government have been uh, instrumental in the uh, Solar Cities uh, program, for example. We have been. Uh, Order, Senator Carr. Uh, and the poor honourable senator, interjecting as he does, I thought was a senator that allegedly represented the state of Victoria that has actually entered a partnership, the state Labor government has actually entered into a partnership with a federal coalition government Order. to develop a Order. solar city your in his Your state. time has expired. Before I call Senator Humphreys, I understand the Leader of the Government has a statement regarding ministerial arrangements. Thanks, Mr <laughs> President. I missed the call earlier. I did want to make sure that the Senate was aware that Senator George Brandis, the Minister for Arts and Sport, uh, is absent from question time today, as I guess is obvious. Um, Senator Brandis is fortunate enough to be representing Australia at the World Anti-Doping Agency meeting in Montreal in Canada, and I'm sure we all wish we were with him. Um, during Senator Brandis's order, absence— Order! 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 Senator Conroy. During Senator Brandis's absence, Senator Don Helen Coonan has agreed to take questions in relation to the arts and sports and the education, science and training portfolios. Thank Senate, you, Mr President. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, indeed, my question is to Senator Coonan, in this case uh, representing, the minister, uh, representing the Assistant Treasurer. Uh, would the minister outline, please, to the Senate how the last 11 years of sound economic management have delivered benefits to all Australians? Could she also outline, in particular, how the government proposes to build on the strong economic performance of the last 11 years to deliver benefits to older Australians? And uh, could she also tell us, are there any alternative policies? Senator Coonan. Good question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And I thank Senator Humphreys uh, for his question and note that when the coalition was elected in 1996, the unemployment in the ACT was 7.7 per cent. And after 11 years <laughs> of sound economic management that Senator Humphreys refers to, the unemployment today in the ACT stands at just 2.8 per cent. The sound economic management of the Howard government has, of course, allowed us to deliver real benefits to all Australians and to invest in the future to ensure that we as a nation continue to prosper. It's allowed us to pay off $96 billion of Labor's debt and save right. in the order of $8 billion annually in interest. And as we strive to do even better, we should not forget the economic mismanagement of Labor governments past, where out of 13 budgets they ran deficits in nine of them. There is no clearer example of how sound economic management enables Australians to directly benefit than the recent better superannuation reforms. From today, an estimated 300,000 older Australians will be able to access the pension for the first time or will receive a higher pension. Today we are cutting the taper rates at which pensions are reduced by half 
to $1.50 for, uh, $1 for each $1,000 of assets above the allowable limits for the full pension. Mr. President, we are also substantially lifting the allowable asset limits, at which point the pension begins to be reduced. As a result, the maximum single pension will rise, single rate pension will rise by $12.60 to $537.70 per fortnight, and the partnered pension rate for each member of a couple will rise by $10.60 to $449.10 per fortnight. And as a result of the reform to indexation. Pensions will again rise above the inflation rate, which means that the Howard government is actually delivering, in real terms, a sustained increase in the standard of living of older Australians. These significant reforms Mr. President, are only possible because of sound economic management over the last 11 years. And if we were to have ducked the tough questions that have set Australia up to build on our prosperity and to lock in our future prosperity, we'd not be in a position to reform the pension scheme and to deliver such significant increases to pensioners and particularly older Australians. And, Mr President, uh, as the storm clouds gather once again over the international economy, strong and experienced hands are now more than ever required on, uh, on the rudder of the Australian <laughs> economy. Mr Rudd's startling admission yesterday that he could not even name one single tax threshold correctly, let alone name any of the actual tax rates, proves once and for all that he is an opposition leader on trainer wheels. Australians have every right to ask if you don't know or care enough about how much tax ordinary Australian wage earners pay, how could you trust Mr Rudd with your Order. mortgage? Order. You can't run an economy on spin alone, and this latest failure just highlights that Mr Rudd is not fit to run Australia's $1.1 trillion economy. And finally, Mr President, it is wonderful that uh, Rip Van Winkle, Senator Faulkner, has finally woken up. Order. When you've finished, Senator Evans, your colleague will get the call. Senator Carol Brown. My question is to Senator Abetz, Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources. Is the Minister aware that the 2005 Tracking the Kyoto Target report forecasts that Australia's greenhouse gas emissions would rise by 22 per cent between 1990 and 2020? Doesn't the 2006 edition of this report show that our emissions will rise by 27 per cent between 1990 and 2020? five per cent more than predicted previously. Can the minister explain why the government's own projections of greenhouse, em greenhouse emissions are getting worse? Doesn't this show that after 11 long years in office, the Howard government has failed to tackle our greenhouse emissions? Why, hasn't the Howard government so why has the Howard government so comprehensively failed to reduce emissions to help combat climate change? Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't know where Senator Brown's been hiding in recent times, but uh, she would be aware, for example, that uh, at APEC we raise the issue of climate change as a very important issue for world leaders. And interestingly enough, it was the Australian government, under the leadership of Prime Minister Howard and Foreign Minister. Alexander Downer and Environment Minister Malcolm Turnbull that actually put it on the agenda. Now, when the alternate Prime Minister, Mr. President, had the opportunity to engage with the United States President on this issue for a full 45 minutes, what did Mr. Rudd do? Did not mention the issue of climate change. Did not issue the mention. Uh, did not mention the issue of climate change. Why? Because, Mr President, for cheap domestic purposes he seeks to raise climate change, but when he can actually do something about it, like engaging positively with the President of the United States, he squibs it. He squibs it. He's unable to deal with the issue. Now, Mr President, for the first time ever, because of Australia's handling of this issue, we were able to get the countries of, the, uh, of Russia. China and the United States to sit down together 
and talk about this issue in a very, very constructive way. And Senator Carr can interject and says it's all aspirational and all sorts of things. But can I tell you this? Talking about climate change at least is better than not talking about it, like Mr. Rudd did. Like Mr. Rudd did. And that is, Mr. President, a classic case. A classic case of Australia taking the challenge of climate change very, very seriously. Now, Mr. President, the Climate Institute's analysis should focus on the energy sector, where its consultants have expertise and where available data might be uh, more reliable. But the government's emission projections to 2010, released in December last year, uh, draws on detailed economic modelling of all sectors prepared by Australia's leading experts in the field and show that Australia is performing well against its Kyoto target. The latest national greenhouse accounts provide complete and comprehensive data on Australia's greenhouse emissions and show that Australia's greenhouse gas emissions were 102.2 per cent of 1990 levels in 2005. And these results are consistent with the latest projections. Both Australia's national greenhouse accounts and emission projections are prepared by the Australian Greenhouse Office according to international guidelines and subject to international review. Australia has produced annual inventories, as I understand it now, uh, for quite some time. And so, Mr. President, yes, we are always <coughs> monitoring, we're always looking at this. Uh, Issue. And indeed, later this day, later this day, this Senate will be debating legislation dealing with this very issue. And so, what I invite Senator Brown to do is to have a look at the actual record of what's happening. Now, this is Senator Carol Brown, the more sensible of the two Senator Browns, might I add. But uh, on this occasion, she hasn't covered herself in glory with the uh, question that's been provided to her. But having said that, Mr. President, we as a government do take climate change very seriously. We have taken the appropriate uh, action, and that is why, in the world arena, we are regarded as leaders, and that is why the APEC community Order. was so willing to engage Order, with Minister. us in Sydney the time just has recently. Expired. Supplementary question, Senator Carol Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. Doesn't the fa fact that the Australia's emissions keep getting worse, even after all the warnings about climate sh change, show the need for a clear target for emission reductions? Doesn't the government's total failure to provide business and consumers with the certainty of a clear target undermine the effort to seriously tackle climate change? Senator Betts. Mr. Mr. President, we were, talking, we were just told about Australians being concerned about reducing emissions. Guess what? Just recently, we as a government circulated to every household in Australia what they could do about this issue. And who were the ones that condemned us? Who were the ones that condemned us? The Australian Labor Party, the people that today are now feigning concern about this issue. See, the Labor Party can't have it both ways. Either it's a matter of national significance for every single citizen in Australia, and therefore they should be assisted in engaging on this important issue. But then when we do it, we are condemned. We raise it at APEC. Mr Rudd doesn't raise it at APEC, but of course they're the alleged champions. Mr President, it is another classic case of Labor saying, do as we say, not as we do, whereas we are actually taking the hard actions, Order. engaging with people Order, to ensure we get good results. Order. 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 Senator Joyce. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Community Services, Senator Scullion. Will the minister inform the Senate of the, on the progress of the national emergency intervention in the Northern Territory and any recent developments? Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, uh, I'd like to thank the senator for his question and, and acknowledge the advice that he's been provided to government in regard to Indigenous affairs over some time, particularly his experience with Indigenous people in his hometown of St George. Um, on Tuesday, um, I informed the Senate of a suite of measures totalling some $740 million 
uh, that are going to address the longer-term needs of, of the Northern Territory. Uh, some $540 million to repair and build housing in remote communities over the next four years, $100 million for more doctors, nurses and allied health professionals and specialist services, $78.2 million over three years to convert CDEP positions to real jobs, up to $30 million to be matched on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis to assist the Northern Territory Government to meet their obligations in this regard, $18.5 million over two years for 66 additional Australian federal police. Uh, Mr. President, uh, today I'm pleased also to announce the negotiation of another 99-year lease, this time over the township of Ski Beach. Uh, Ski Beach is, an, is a township adjacent to the mining town of Nullumboy um, in the north and east, northeastern area of the Northern Territory. Negotiations will proceed with the Gumach people to bring better services and economic development to the region. The 99-year lease negotiations are proceeding at the urging of Galaroy Unipingu, who took the initiative to approach the minister over a 99-year lease over his home community. This 99-year 99 99-year lease to the Australian government over the township itself will bring a solid foundation to take advantage of the economic opportunities, allowing residents to participate in the Australian economy and provide for normalised land-based tenure. This will also be the first time. Uh, for the chance for home ownership and also the reality is given we know in places like New Yew in the TV Islands, which has been agreed in principle also on Groot Island, which is uh, not far from Nullumboy. Negotiations will con commence immediately with the aim of having the new arrangements in place in early 2008. When it proceeds, the secure tenure which the 99-year leases will bring will remove the need for a statutory five-year lease. Uh, that was provided under the Emergency Response Act in the Northern Territory. This lease will, of course, Mr. President, uh, provide, uh, move uh, land from ownership in a collective sense um, to the prospect of individual owners and ownership and control. So, for the very first time, Mr. President, uh, these Aboriginal Australians will be able to directly control what happens on their own land and will be able to invest in their own future and their family's future and that economic prosperity, Mr. President. It is actually interesting that there are a great deal of opportunities that have, uh, uh, have been around the place here in around Nullumboy. Ski Beach faces uh, the, the, the water, and on the other side, as you look across the bay, you can actually see that the mining township. Of course, there are a great deal of yachts. There's, a, there's a, an emerging maritime industry there. We currently don't have a small slipway, so there's an opportunity for a slipway, for chandleries, for a high boat businesses, and for other tourist enterprises. But again, Mr. President, the bottom line is enterprise. The, uh, the government is more than happy to support Aboriginal communities and their aspirations for economic independence. We have, a, we have a plan that has been developed in consultation with Indigenous Australians, and we have another interjection from uh, Senator Crossan, uh, Mr. President, disappointingly again saying, are we going to be providing money for that? We are providing an environment where Indigenous Australians enjoy the same level of opportunity as other Australians. This is a fantastic initiative by a government that is happy to provide leadership, not froth and bubble and media stunts, Mr. President. This is a government about making absolutely sound decisions, sticking to them and implementing them. Order. 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 Senator Wortley. Mr President, my question is to Senator Abetz, Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources. I refer the Minister to briefing notes provided to the APEC Finance Minister's meeting in Coolum that say about climate change that, and I quote, to complement market-based mechanisms, there is also a role for regulation and direct government intervention to assist in the development of low emission technologies. Don't leading business groups support this view? Hasn't the Australian Business Roundtable on Climate Change expressed support for policies that actively encourage the development of renewable energy technologies? Why is the Howard government ignoring business by calling for state-based targets to be abolished and refusing to increase the mandatory renewable energy target from the current pathetic 2 per cent level? Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The uh, reason for the request for the states to abolish uh, their uh, uh, mandatory uh, targets is because uh, 
That is what the uh, Prime Minister's task force, in fact, actually recommended, and in fact, businesses would prefer there to be the one target for all of Australia rather than all the various uh, state targets, which, uh, if I might say, is a bit of a mishmash. And I think uh, most uh, people who are concerned about industry are concerned that there be one, uh, one agreed a target right around Australia, because otherwise, uh, if you happen to have an aluminium smelter, let's say in Tasmania, you might have to pay more for energy than if you had an uh, aluminium smelter in uh, in uh, Queensland, simply on the basis of uh, the targets. And so uh, it makes good sense. But we, as a government, have uh, said time and time again that uh, things such as mandatory renewable energy targets have their purpose, and indeed. We introduced them and uh, I think they have served a very useful purpose. In relation to regulations, well, uh, today this uh, Senate will be debating legislation uh, requiring reporting uh, conditions on uh, particular businesses above a certain threshold. And so all those factors to which the Honourable Senator is referring to <coughs> are factors that we have taken into account, we have dealt with and we are dealing with in a comprehensive way, which in fact has the backing of the Prime Minister's Emissions Task Force. And if I might say with great respect to the Honourable Senator, that Emissions Task Force brought together the best brains available to us in relation to this area. And that is why we as a government are being very heavily influenced by its advice to government rather than the stunt a day from the likes of Mr Garrett, who one day would close down our coal mines and kick 36,000 people out of work, and then when asked, what about the jobs, he said that's hypothetical, as though coal mining jobs are somehow hypothetical. They are real jobs sustaining thousands of families and hundreds of communities around Australia. And, and, uh, Mr. And Mr. Uh, Order. Now, Mr President, the arrogant leader of the opposition continues his interjection. As soon as one of his senators gets into trouble, we get the arrogant barrage. But uh, wh what I would say to the honourable senator, who is in fact actually listening to my answer, unlike you, uh, Senator Evans. Mr President, am I going to get a chance to address uh, Senator Wortley's question Continue without the answer. ongoing arrogant barrage Order. of the Leader of the Opposition. Continue. So what I am suggesting to uh, Senator Wortley and the few like her on the Opposition side who I think might actually be interested in this topic that uh, she should read the Emissions Task Force. I do have a copy available in my office and I think she would find that it sets out a blueprint that will be within this nation's interest for many years to come. Supplementary question, Senator Wortley. I do have a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that renewable energy under the Howard government will decline as the proportion of electricity consumption over the next decade? Does this minister consider the decline of renewable energy to be a successful outcome? Doesn't this in fact show that after 11 long years in office, the Howard government still isn't serious about climate change. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The one thing that I did like about the Honourable Senator's question was the suggestion that in the next 10 years of the Howard government there might be a particular decline in uh, renewable energy. What I would say to the Honourable Senator is that I hope that the first part of the question is right, that, that we will see another 10 years of Howard government, but I would also hope that uh, renewable energy will continue to grow and increase. And that is why such initiatives, such as in uh, the Honourable Senator's neighbouring state of Victoria of solar cities, is so very important. Something that the Labor senators Order. opposite don't want to hear about, but I, can, but I can tell them and advise them that their own state Labor government in Victoria wants to know about it, because they have actually partnered with us, Mr. President, in this very important initiative. And uh, what I would invite the honourable uh, senator to do, Order. if she can still hear my answer Order. above the arrogance senator of the Sherry. leader of the opposition, uh, demonstrating his arrogance. Well, time is expired. 
Order. Senator Sherry. Order. Senator Bushby. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Abet. Will the Minister Will the Minister update the Senate on the latest information about workplace agreement making in Australia? What does this information say about the Howard government's modern and flexible industrial relations policies? And is the Minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Betts. Mr President, can I uh, congratulate Senator Bushby on an excellent first speech yesterday and uh, say that uh, he has followed up superbly today with an excellent question uh, being his first one. And, uh, Mr President, I note from his maiden speech last night that uh, the question that he's asking a question about today is a matter in which he is genuinely interested. Mr President, yesterday the latest official report on agreement making in the Australian workplace was released. Like a number of reports before it, this report totally debunks the false claims being made by the ALP and the ACTU about, in particular, Australian workplace agreements. So let's compare what the Labor Party has been saying has been happening with what is actually revealed in this document. Let's start with working hours. Those on the other side were asserting, Mr President, that people are working longer hours. In fact, that is wrong. Average weekly hours worked are now at 37.3, albeit minimal, but a decline from 37.4. How about wages? The ALP and ACTU falsely claim the AWAs are forcing down wages. Well, wrong again. Average hourly total earnings on non -managerial for non-managerial employees on AWAs <laughs> actually increased by 12.8 per cent. They did not decline. But what about wages under AWAs compared to collective agreements? The rise under collective increments or agreements 4.1 per cent. So that AWAs 12.8 per cent, collective agreements 4.1 per cent. And of course, Mr President, I could go on further. What does all this say about the Howard government's flexible modern workplace relations system, Mr President? It says it is working for the benefit of Australian workers and their families, and it says that the false scare campaign against it is exactly that—false. Yet despite all this, Labor still maintain their ridiculous position that they will rip up AWAs, the central feature of our modern industrial relations system. They will rip up these modern, flexible arrangements, which provide 8.7 per cent more for workers than under collective agreements. So why, Mr President, would Labor persist in defying common sense on this? Well, Mr President, I think we know the answer. It's the trade union movement. And I came across a very interesting quote yesterday, and uh, I would invite those opposite to guess who said it. The trade union movement keeps the parliamentary Labor Party in touch with the values and aspirations of working people. It is their greatest source of cohesion. And I might be able to say, Mr President, that without the union movement, the Labor Party would rely on a rainbow alliance of single issue groups, environmentalists, peace activists, gays and civil libertarians. But of course I don't have to say that. Because the person who said the quote actually said that as well. So, with the Labor Party, if it's not the trade union movement, you get a rainbow coalition of environmentalists, peace activists, gays, and civil libertarians. So, that's the choice in the Labor Party. And do you know who said it? Senior frontbencher Dr. Craig Emerson, who would be the small business minister under a Rudd Labor government. Can I say to those listening, Mr President, that that is the scary prospect of a Rudd Labor government, whereas we on this side, Mr President, understand the needs Order. of the 80 per cent of workers Order. who Your are not in trade expired, unions. Senator Betts. Supplementary question. Senator Bushby. Minister, as you have indicated that there have been significant improvements in industrial relations policies, could you elaborate further on how these changes have contributed to an increase in the number of Australians in work? 
Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President, a very, very important supplementary question. There were, since the changes in March 2006, over 417,000 Australians now have a job. 417,000 yeah, Australians. Yeah, yeah. And, Mr. President, you can argue about how many were actually as a result of our changes, but as an absolute minimum, some of those commentators who are as harsh as one might expect on us say that at least over half of them are as a result of the abolition of the unfair, unfair dismissal laws. And of course, the Labor Party would reintroduce that regime and see all those people that have gained employment as a result of us taking tough initiatives lose their jobs and lose the opportunities that have been provided to them. And, Mr President, that, I think, is one of the great achievements of the Howard government. Real wages growth, lowest rate of industrial disputation and a 33-year low in Order. unemployment, and that is a Order, huge Senator social Betts. dividend for this country. Expired. Order. Order. Senator Sherry. Order. Order. Senator Fielding. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Order. Senator, Senator Johnston. Fielding. Senators on my left, I cannot hear Senator Fielding's question. Order. 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 We will not proceed until the Senate comes to order. Senator Sherry, I will not ask you again. Senator Fielding. Thanks, Mr. President. I'll start again. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Johnston. Minister, as you are aware, in December last year, the government changed the law so that recreational fishermen caught dropping a line in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Green Zones would no longer receive criminal convictions. While the government fixed its mess, there are still 324 fishermen who were prosecuted before the law was changed and who now have all criminal records. Minister, given the government has only partly fixed the problem Order. and given it now admits this breach is not criminal activity, Will it now rescind the criminal convictions of these 324 fishermen and grant them all a pardon? Senator Johnston. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and may I thank Senator Fielding for what is a very important question to those 300 fishermen who now feel aggrieved given that there has been an amendment to repair a situation that was quite anomalous. Um, can I also pause to thank Senator Boswell, who has been arguing uh, the case of those 300 fishermen for some long time now, and, uh, and I can assure Senator Fielding that I have addressed those issues with open ears. Now, I have to say that where we have convictions recorded, often on pleas of guilty, uh, in a belief that a certain set of circumstances uh, prevailed, it is now not possible to go back and review those matters because ignorance of the law is not an excuse, can I say, and there's a number of High Court cases that substantiate this. There is clearly, I think, in agreement with you, Senator Fielding, an injustice done to those 300 um, convictees, if I, if, I, if I may use that expression. Now, what I am currently doing is uh, entertaining my department and the Attorney-General's department with the request of Senator Boswell and, indeed, may I say, but I'm hoping for an answer any moment, and, and this oh, afternoon right. I have a meeting uh, with respect to precisely that problem, <laughs> and, uh, and I anticipate, through you, Mr. President, I anticipate being in a position to address whether or not it is appropriate that pardons in the face of this anomalous and unjust situation can in fact be granted. Now, I'll make sure, if I may, through you, Mr. President, inform Senator Fielding, because I do appreciate his question and his interest in this subject, because it is clear. Yeah, order. That Senator Johnson, just stop for one minute. Senators on my left, if you wish to conduct conversations, could you please leave the chamber? It is disorderly and there's far too much audible noise, and I cannot hear the minister's answer. Senator Johnson. Mr. President, Not now. I'm very. Uh, 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 enlivened by a problem where 
300 people have received convictions now with the benefit of hindsight, which appear very unjust. And as I was saying to, uh, to uh, Senator Fielding through you, I am seeking to uh, obtain a, a method of being able to uh, adjust that and arrest that and remediate that injustice in a way that is within the law and acceptable. Now, it is a very difficult problem, but we are approaching and I do thank Senator Fielding for what I think is a very good question. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question, Senator Fielding. Yes, I do, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, as you have uh, indicated, uh, many of these fishermen have suffered enormously by being deemed a criminal in the eyes of the law. Their employment prospects, ability to get insurance or even open a bank account have all been affected. And I would be asked I kept fully informed with where it's progressed. Senator Johnston. Um, Mr. President, that's precisely the motivation behind why we are attempting to. Uh, remediate this situation. These men now do have um, a record of, of a breach of the criminal law. Uh, their travel plans and whatever you are affected, they have to declare that they have convictions against their name in circumstances where they should not have to do that in the circumstances that have evolved with respect to those offences. And I can assure Senator Fielding I am very motivated to, to, to repair this and uh, doing everything I can to see what avenues are available. And I will be back to him shortly, I hope, with a solution. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. My is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Ellison. Last week, the Prime Minister announced a $330 million Veterans Affairs Disability Pension Enhancement Package, further highlighting the government's continuing support for our valued veterans. Will the Minister outline to the Senate? significant new measures to further assist the nation's widow, war widows and widowers. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Fisher for what is a very important question for our war widows and war widowers and acknowledge Senator Fisher's interest in the area of veterans affairs. Mr President, uh, the Howard government acknowledges the heavy price paid by our war widows and war widowers in the premature loss of a spouse and uh, also in relation to um, the, the, the physical condition they suffered later uh, from service-related uh, issues. Uh, Mr President, uh, we are committed to ensuring that our war widows and war widows are supported. And that is why I am very pleased to inform the Senate that the Minister for Veterans Affairs has announced a package which will greatly benefit the 114,000 war widow, widows and war widowers in Australia. Uh, in short, uh, uh, war widows and war widowers receive currently uh, a pension, a non-index uh, pension component of $25 a fortnight, formerly called a domestic allowance. Th this component will increase by $10 a fortnight to $35 from March 2008. Mr. President, this package will bring uh, to a total $470 million of packages recently announced, and Senator Fisher mentioned uh, the $330 million package recently announced by the Prime Minister in relation to the indexation of payments to veterans generally. Mr. President, uh, uh, this payment uh, in relation to war widows and war widowers will now be indexed with reference to both the consumer price index and the male total average weekly earnings uh, from March 2008. The non-index $25 pension component has remained constant uh, since it was first introduced in 1946, and this has been a great area of concern uh, for those uh, war widow widows and war widowers who have been uh, in receipt of that. The government has therefore responded positively, Mr. President, and uh, with these new measures, we will increase the value of this pension component and ensure that its real value is maintained through indexation. This is very good news for that sector of the community, 114,000 war widows and war widowers who will benefit from this. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the commitment of the Howard government to the veterans sector is underlined by the fact that more than $1.6 billion in new funding has been allocated to veterans affairs in the last 18 months. That is a significant increase in funding. In fact, Mr. President, Despite declining veteran numbers, the Department of Veterans Affairs budget has increased from $6.5 billion in 1996 
to more than $11 billion today. And, uh, Mr President, I thought the opposition would be interested to know that, because this is of great concern and interest to our veterans community in this country. A substantial increase in funding over the last 11 years, of from $6.5 billion to $11 billion, to ensure that our veterans are supported and those war widows and war widowers who paid the heavy price of a premature loss of a spouse because of the service they, this country are now supported. And Mr President, it is important that we continue to support this sector of the community which paid such a price. This announcement today, as I say, takes the total package of recent, recent announcements, announcements to, to $470 million of new initiatives. And this is good news for the veterans community who well, well deserve uh, these initiatives. And uh, I applaud the minister for his announcement today and continued commitment to the, the veterans uh, sector. Thank you, Minister. Senator Crossan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to uh, Senator Coonan, the minister representing uh, uh, the uh, Minister for Communications, IT, Technology and the Arts. And I refer the minister to her claim yesterday that Telstra had Mr John Utting on its payroll. Can the minister confirm that she today received a letter from Telstra expressly stating that neither Mr Utting nor his firm have any financial relationship with Telstra? Hasn't Mr Utting confirmed this in a letter to Telstra today which states, and I quote, neither MUR Research nor I have either a current or recent financial relationship with Telstra? Can the minister now confirm that Telstra has had only one pollster on their books in recent years, namely the Liberal Party's pollsters Crosby Texter? And will the minister now correct the record and apologise to Mr Utting, Telstra, the Senate and the Australian people for her false claims in question time yesterday? Order, order, order. I will not call the minister until there's order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I don't know who Telstra has uh, as their uh, pollsters, and uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, the Labor Party can ask Telstra who their pollsters are. They, they certainly don't tell me. Um, I don't. Order, Senator Coonan. Take seat. I'm not going to let the minister continue until there is order on this side. It is your question time. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do not have letters from uh, either Mr Utting or Telstra uh, with me. I understand from my office that there are some letters in my office. Uh, I, would certain, I would certainly wish to have a look Order. at them before I make any response, given the aggressive stance taken by uh, Telstra towards me personally Very and to the wise. government, I think it only appropriate that I have an opportunity to consider the contents of any correspondence that might be addressed to me, and that is what I will do. Uh, if any uh, correction is required, it will be made, Mr President, and uh, I fully expect that what I will have received from Telstra Order. is an unequivocal commitment that they will stop meddling with the Labor Party and meddling with the election, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that they will retract uh, allegations that they have made against me, and that yeah. they will continue to behave like the major corporation they are and be completely out of the election as far as a partisan participant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Order. 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 A supplementary question, Senator Crossan. Um, Mr. President, isn't it uh, true that, in fact, yesterday uh, this minister told uh, the Senate in question time, and I quote from yesterday's Parliament, "We all know that Telstra have John Utting, <coughs> Labor's pollster, on their payroll. And why is it then that when the minister can't win the policy debate, she resorts to bizarre personal attacks on Telstra in the Parliament?" And doesn't the minister's increasingly desperate and paranoid behaviour show her complete incompetence in the fact that she has lost control of her portfolio? Order. 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 Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and isn't it extraordinary that Senator Conroy doesn't have the guts to ask uh, either right, that yeah, question? Right. And he gets poor old Senator Crossan to try to be uncivil right. uh, 
in asking a question in question time. This just shows the pathetic approach of Senator Conroy and the Labor Party to telecommunications. They can't win a policy debate, and all they can do is to try to get into bed with Order. Telstra and to try to win an election by those means. Order. Order. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Minchin. I draw the Minister's attention to the I draw the Minister's attention to the resolution agreed to without dissent by the Senate this morning, supporting the establishment of a Royal Commission into the sexual assault and abuse of children throughout Australia. Can the Minister advise the Senate if and when the Prime Minister will be responding to or acting on this very important and significant resolution? Senator Minchin. Uh, uh, Mr President, could I um, first um, acknowledge Senator Bartlett's um, quite uh, long-term, consistent and diligent application of his time and energy to uh, this greatest of evils, the sexual abuse and of children and abuse generally of children. Um, I'm sure there's not a senator in this place who does not share his overwhelming concern for this, as I say, great public evil. Uh, that is abroad in our community, regrettably. Um, it was um, uh, the fact that we were happy to join with uh, Senator Bartlett and his colleagues in supporting the uh, resolution this morning as a mark of our good faith and uh, our concern as a government um, to do all that we possibly can to deal with uh, child abuse in our community. Um, and indeed, this subject is of considerable notoriety this week, given the appalling case of the person who had came from New Zealand with his daughter, his three-year-old daughter, having um, uh, that uh, child's mother having apparently been murdered in New Zealand and the child being left alone and abandoned at a Melbourne railway station. Uh, in other words, child abuse can take many forms, and that's one of the most appalling forms of child abuse uh, that I'm aware of. And of course, uh, while all of us are concerned about it, uh, those of us who are privileged to be parents, um, uh, of which I'm one, uh, feel it most particularly and um, feel enormous anger and despair when we read almost daily of most dreadful cases of child abuse in this country. Uh, regrettably, one of the phenomena of the um, breakdown of marriage seems to be that child abuse increases when single mothers um, who find themselves in new relationships uh, find that their new partners uh, do not have the same respect for children that uh, parents always have. And it is despairing to read of cases uh, almost every week uh, where uh, child abuse occurs within the family environment, often in those sorts of situations. Um, Mr President, whether or not the uh, commissioning of a royal commission for a major national inquiry into this matter is the best way about it, I think is a matter for legitimate debate. Uh, whether such a, a royal commission uh, is the best way to go about uh, dealing with this from a national government level, I think is something we're prepared to consider. That's one of the reasons we did agree to the motion, where we will consider that question. Uh, I can't give a timeline or a, a specific um, determination as to when we might respond. But in the meantime, the government, I think, has shown its good faith, and we accept that this is very much a bipartisan issue, and we would not seek to. Uh, uh, suggest that there should be any partisanship or that we're better or worse than anybody else. I, I accept the good faith of all parties on this issue, but I think our good faith uh, and determination to do something about this has been demonstrated most particularly, of course, with our intervention in the Northern Territory. That has been motivated uh, entirely by our concern for the continuing reports and evidence of appalling child abuse uh, in communities, most particularly in the Northern Territory, and it was by that motivation that we have engaged in uh, this intervention. I, frankly, as someone brought up as uh, a member of the Anglican Church, am staggered to find the uh, uh, Anglican Archbishop of Sydney questioning our motives and questioning that intervention. I think it's one of the finest things that our government has done, and we welcome the support that we've had from across the board uh, for that intervention, which, as I say, is motivated by, by our concern for the welfare of the children concerned. Uh, we are, uh, while much is said about the whys and wherefores and, um, of uh, 
uh, what is called cooperative federalism. I do note that um, we have been working very closely with uh, state uh, and territory ministers through the Community and Disability Services Ministers Order, Conference Minister. to deal with this Time issue at a national level. Supplementary question, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd, I'd remind the minister and the Senate that the uh, coalition members expressed support. Uh, read the actual part of the resolution. Expressed support for the long-standing call for a comprehensive royal commission into the sexual assault and abuse of children throughout Australia, especially in institutions. Uh, but whilst I note so this is a, a mark of good faith, uh, I think it suggests it might be problematic if the uh, extent of action consists of expressing support for resolutions and not actually acting on them. Uh, could uh, the minister indicate uh, whether there will be uh, uh, an indication from the government uh, before the election date, at least, about uh, how this support uh, for the long-standing call for a royal commission may be translated into action, even if it's not specifically matched that caused that call for in the resolution. Some other form of action, which does actually deal with child sexual abuse and assault, on a, a more comprehensive nationwide way, rather than an ad hoc case by case basis. Senator Minchin. Well, Mr. President, as I was saying. Um, before my time expired uh, in answer to the first question, um, through the relevant um, State and Territory Ministers' Conference, there is um, an agreed national approach to child protection, which I would assert on behalf of those ministers is a comprehensive approach by all relevant levels of government to protecting Australia's children. Um, it, it, is, uh, it was, as I say, a mark of good faith that coalition senators were happy to join in supporting the motion. Uh, today with respect to a royal commission, but of course that would be a matter for the cabinet to consider that motion and determine what further action the national government might choose to take on this matter. But I just want to reassert our bona fides on this matter, our deep and abiding concern to ensure that as a national government we do everything we possibly can to ensure a proper nationwide comprehensive approach to the protection of Australia's children. Senator Kirk. My question is to Senator Coonan, Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I refer the Minister to the release of Iraq Body Counts assessment that over 79,000 civilian deaths have now occurred since 2003. I also refer the Minister to United Nations assessments that over 2 million Iraqis have fled their country and over 1 million Iraqis have been internally displaced. Does the minister agree that Iraq is a human and security catastrophe? What humanitarian assistance is the government providing to relieve the suffering in the refugee camps that now exist in Jordan and Syria and the displaced persons camps that are increasing in size within Iraq? Senator Coonan. Uh, thank, you, um, to, uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Senator uh, Kirk for um, an important question. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, any civilian death is one too many. I think we all agree with that. And um, there are no authoritative estimates of the total number of Iraqi civilian casualties, due in part, of course, to the complex uh, nature of the violence in Iraq. Estimates of civilian ca uh, casualties and the methodology behind them, of course, vary very widely. Uh, for example, the UK website, the Iraq Body Count, estima estimates that, as of the 6th of September, between 71,302 and 77,852 civilians have been killed since March 2003. And the United Nations Assistance Mission for Iraq estimates some 34,452 were killed in 2006. But I repeat that uh, any civilian death is certainly one too many. The multinational force in cooperation with the Iraqi security forces have strenuously sought to avoid civilian casualties in accordance with international humanitarian law. And, uh, in stark contrast, uh, terrorists and insurgents have set out to kill and maim civilians and those in Iraqi security forces. The multinational force in Iraq will continue to work with Iraqi security forces to prevent such attacks and apprehend their perpetrators. Uh, Senator Kirk um, has also uh, asked what uh, we're doing to assist Iraqi refugees and internally displaced persons. And of course, uh, we're concerned, uh, very concerned about the humanitarian situation facing many of the Iraqis, over two million. 
uh, my brief note says, uh, residing in neighbouring countries and over two million internally displaced. Many of these were displaced under the uh, Saddam Hussein regime right. due to war, human rights abuses and the deliberate expulsion of citizens from their homes. Australia has provided over 75 million in humanitarian assistance, including for Iraqi refugees and uh, IDPs since 2003. And Mr Downer announced, in, uh, announced on the 14th of February 2007 uh, six million dollars uh, to assist Iraqi refugees and $3 million uh, to the United Nations HCR and $3 million to the IOM. The Australian uh, delegation uh, was, of course, represented at the Australian UNHCR conference on Iraqi refugees and internally displaced uh, persons and was led by the ambassador and the permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva. It included officials from the Department of Immigration and Citizenship and AusAid, so uh, the personnel making up the uh, representation were very well placed to uh, have Australia's input and to record Australia's concern about this most important matter. A supplementary question, Senator Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Given that Christian families are being persecuted and brutalised on a daily basis by all factions, oil production has been slashed, Iran has been emboldened and international terrorism has been made worse, can the minister indicate whether she thinks the Australian government's assistance is having any impact at all? Senator Kernan. Well, um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we've often uh, spoken in this chamber about the importance and relevance of the Australian uh, troop commitments. Um, Australia, as uh, I've said, I think uh, last week, sometime in answer to a question, is committed to staying in Iraq until the Iraqi security forces no longer require our support. Um, the government decided in August to extend our troop commitments until the 30th of June 2008. Uh, it's important that uh, we stay and we, that we get the job done, and uh, its uh, our coalition partners have expressed their strong appreciation for Australia's uh, uh, very valuable contribution. The ongoing presence of Australia and other members of the coalition in, in Iraq is uh, at the request of the government in Iraq, and uh, we certainly do not intend to leave until, uh, until that particular job is done. I ask the further questions to be placed on the notice paper. <laughs> Senator Ellison. Mr. President, I answered a question yesterday uh, from Senator Seward in relation to uh, petrol sniffing and opal fuel. I undertook to get back to the Senate in relation to three road houses which were mentioned, and uh, I now have that information. I table that information and seek leave to incorporate it. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I move to take note of answers provided by Senator Betts to questions asked of him today in his capacity as Minister representing the Minister for the Environment. Mr. President, today a number of questions were asked of Senator Betts, which sought to uh, draw the government on what it was doing in relation to climate change. And quite frankly, it again reinforced the message that the government doesn't understand climate change, has no plan for tackling it and has been dragged reluctantly by the community to confront the issues of climate change. The government for 11 years did nothing in the face of those challenges, and it is only in recent times when the community proved that they were way out in front of the government, that the community concerns were so, uh, so strong, so loud, that the Prime Minister finally agreed to uh, establish a task force to look at the question of climate change and uh, propositions for uh, a carbon emissions uh, trading system. Now, what we uh, uh, heard in, from the minister today, uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, was that the government uh, has no idea about what's going on in terms of uh, the climate change challenge. We, we know they haven't ratified Kyoto. They, we know they stand outside the international community. We know they've let the MRET uh, run down to the point of making no practical contribution to, uh, to renewable energy in this country. We know that solar research has been cut by the government to the point that the major uh, uh, leading solar research technologies that were developed in this country have been forced overseas and that Australia's leading silence, uh, scientists in solar, uh, solar matters are now working overseas. 
due to the lack of funding, the lack of interest by this government in solar energy. I mean, we're at the situation now where Germany leads the field on solar research. Australia has dropped back. Our resources in this area have been cut back dramatically. And a country that once led the world in the, in the solar research effort is now very much following. There are many good scientists still left in this country, but the, but the funding is not there to provide the leadership in that area that we should be providing. Mr President, the government just doesn't get it on climate change. It is a reflection, I think, of uh, the lack of leadership, the failure to come to terms with modern issues, the, the, the failure to come to terms with the future challenges uh, that Australia faces. Because the government just doesn't get it, they can't, they can't come to terms with leading the Australian community in tackling climate change. Now, to be fair, there's a, there's a fundamental pr problem inside the government. They don't believe that climate change is caused by human activity. The Leader in the Senate, Senator Minchin, Senator Betts himself, the Prime Minister, uh, the Industry Minister, Ms McFarlane, they actually don't believe uh, that the science about climate change is right. They are climate sceptics, and I think Senator Bernardi and others are of the same view. The Liberal Party is full of people who actually don't accept the science. Now, that's fine, but it makes them totally incapable of leading the response Australia needs to make to climate change. My view, and I think the view of most Australians, is the evidence in, is in. The science is now widely accepted in the world as that human activity is making a huge impact on climate, that we cannot go on emitting carbon at the rates we are, that we need to, have, we need to respond. But if you don't believe it, you can't respond. You can't provide the leadership necessary. So I, I accept that the government has a fundamental problem. They don't believe it. Therefore, they are totally hamstrung in terms of responding. And so the Prime Minister had to be dragged into doing something, as, the, as Crosby and Texter kept reinforcing to him that, in fact, Australians understand it's a problem, Australians accept the science, and that something needs to be done. But the government has failed to act in a way that would uh, provide the leadership in tackling climate change. And one of the things, Mr Deputy President, that struck me when I uh, took on the shadow uh, ministerial responsibilities for resources and energy uh, in late last year is that business get it. Business absolutely get it. Business wants the certainty of knowing what's going to happen in terms of climate change in this country. They want the certainty of knowing whether they're going to have a carbon emissions trading system. They want a price on carbon. They want to know that we're going to seriously tackle climate change because it's affecting them very fundamentally. They cannot make huge investment decisions in Australia until they know what the price of carbon is, until they know what the targets of an Australian government uh, has set and what commitment there is to renewable energy in this country. They are crying out for leadership from the Australian government. They're not getting it, but they will get it for Labor, from Labor because we will set targets, we'll sign up to Senator Kyoto Evans, and we'll establish, establish an MREC scheme. Senator Eggleston. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Um, you know, we hear this, 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 this sort of mantra from Labor time and time again that the Howard government has done nothing about greenhouse or climate change. And it is absolute nonsense, as we have said time and time again in this chamber. Usually, Senator Evans gets his lieutenant, Senator Wong, or one of the other people in his party to put up this nonsensical argument, presumably because he's too embarrassed uh, to persist um, with it. But today, Senator Evans has jumped in uh, with the absolute nonsense claim that the Howard government has not done anything about greenhouse issues or climate change. Senator Evans is fully aware that one of the first things the Howard government did when it came to office in 1996 is establish the world's first greenhouse office. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if the Labor government, the previous Labor government, had any awareness of climate change, it was open to them to do so during the 1990s to establish a greenhouse office, but they did not do anything. And in fact, it's a matter of great pride within the coalition that the coalition can say that it established the first greenhouse office for a government anywhere in the world. Now that really 
probably should be enough to completely destroy the credibility of the rest of Senator Evans's remarks. One of the other comments he made was that we're doing nothing about renewables, but of course uh, we have had a very strong renewable energy program and we've committed almost $3.4 billion to initiatives that directly address climate change and over a quarter of a million for more indirect uh, measures. The Howard Government Energy White Paper is the most definitive statement on lowering greenhouse gas emissions this government has ever seen. The strategy includes, for Senator Evans' information, a $500 million low emissions technology demonstration fund, the $100 million renewable energy development initiative, so much for the Howard government, Senator Evans not doing anything about renewable energy, and most uh, significantly in terms of what Senator Evans just had to say, the $75 million Solar Cities Initiative, which very much uh, underlines our commitment to seeking to develop the science and technology to enable solar energy to be used in this country, because, of course, Australia is blessed with abundant sunshine, and if we can develop the science of uh, solar um, uh, energy to a degree that it can be used to power um, cities and plants and uh, provide lighting along highways, then Australia will have uh, developed a very useful technology indeed. And in Victoria, we have set up the largest solar energy plant in the world at the cost of many millions of dollars. And Senator Evans, rather than criticising the Howard government in this chamber, should give credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. And the Howard government surely deserves credit for its, an imagina its imaginative initiatives in setting up uh, solar city programs around this country. Uh, the government's climate strategy uh, has also stimulated significant private investment in low emission technologies. One of, one of Senator Evans' criticisms, again, was that business wasn't happy with the government's uh, policies on climate change, but the mandatory re renewable energy target is expected to leverage $3.5 billion in private investment over the coming years. And lastly, the Prime Minister recently announced the next major plank of our climate change strategy is a national emissions trading scheme due to begin in 2012. And Senator Evans knows that, and his remarks about us not having a, an emission trading scheme are quite wrong and quite misleading. And again, the government deserves Senator Eggleston, to be congratulated. Senator Eggleston, your time has expired. Yeah. Senator Kirk. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given today in question time, also in relation to matters relating to uh, climate change. Mr Deputy President, the absolute bare truth of this matter in the climate change debate is simply that this government, the Howard government, has had 11 years to take resolute action on climate change, and it has done no such thing. What has it done? It, uh, it denies, it runs sceptical lines, and then it tries, as a last res resort, spin. The fact is, is that it has spent millions, not billions, of dollars on climate change. In fact, it has spent less than 0.05 per cent of the annual federal budget on climate change spending. <coughs> in fact, here's an inconvenient truth. During this term of the parliament alone, the Howard government will spend about the same amount on advertising, that is about $850 million, as it has spent on climate change since 1996 that is $867 million. So in the course of the last 11 years, it spent $867 million on climate change, yet just in the term of this parliament alone, it spent almost exactly the same amount of money on government advertising. 
As I said before, the government spent less than 0.05 per cent of the annual federal budget on climate change. This amounts to about $5 a year for every man, woman and child in Australia. It's an absolutely minuscule amount, Mr Deputy President. As we've heard today, the government's problems on climate change are systemic. The government can't bring itself to accept that we should ratify the Kyoto uh, Protocol and that we as a nation should be sitting at the table and influencing the negotiations surrounding this matter. This government cannot bring itself to accept that a target is a perfectly reasonable public policy position to have. And as we heard uh, Senator Evans mention, a number of government members can't even bring themselves to accept the fact that we, we as human beings, have created greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to global warming. We know that there are a number of climate change sceptics within the government. And uh, in the time I have available, um, I don't have time to mention them all. The uh, government simply will not recognise that global warming will produce significant impacts on our economy, our environment and our society. Mr Acting Deputy President, it's time that the government took some responsibility for this here in Australia right now in 2007. And that is the bottom line in this debate. By contrast, Labor has indicated that it is ready, willing and able to tackle this dangerous problem of climate change. There are many things that the Labor government, that a Labor government would do. For example, we would restore Australia's international leadership on climate change. We would immediately ratify Kyoto and provide $150 million within our aid budget to assist our Pacific neighbours to adapt to climate change. A Labor government would develop a carbon market and reform our institutions. We, in contrast to this government, would lead by example. We would drive a clean energy renewable revolution. Labor would increase the mandatory renewable energy target that is now languishing under this government. We've seen that the renewable industry has had to go overseas in order to make a go of it. Labor, in contrast to this government, would be, as our shadow minister has said, Peter Garrett, on a number of occasions, we would be fair dinkum about climate change. We would meet the climate change challenge, something that this government, a tired 11-year-old Howard government, has no possibility whatsoever of doing. Thank you. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Senator Kirk spoke of taking resolute action, suggested that this government over 11 years has not taken resolute action. Well, Mr Deputy President, I would contend that this government for 11 years has consistently been taking resolute action on the matters around climate change. As my good friend Senator Eggleston pointed out, this government, within just 18 months of being elected, had launched a package of investment to address climate change initiatives in 1997. This government quickly followed that up with the establishment of the Australian Greenhouse Office. And this government has since then committed some $3.4 billion in investment to address the challenges we face as a result of climate change. These are real investments, real measures taken by a government that recognises that it needs to address this issue. But rather than the rhetorical flourish we hear from the other side of the chamber or the hyperbole we hear from the crossbenchers on the subject matter, this is a government that's looking to address it with meaningful, real, practical measures, with sensible policy outcomes that will affect change for the long term to fix this issue, but will not along the way cause enormous pain to the Australian economy. If there is one thing that Senator Kirk said that I do agree with, it's that the issue of climate change has the potential to have an impact on the economy. Yes, it does. And managing the threats of climate change has the potential to have an impact on the economy. And that's why this government, which has demonstrated over 11 years that it can invest in climate change, it can affect change along the way, 
whilst also delivering strong economic growth and benefits for all Australians, is, a, is best placed to continue to confront these challenges into the future. This is a government with a track record of strong economic management as well as a track record of addressing this very important issue. That's the tandem approach we need into the future. Now, of course, we hear an awful lot about ratification or otherwise of the Kyoto Protocol, which of course is due to expire in 2012 in any event. But this government, taking sensible steps, has ensured that we can hold the principled ground of not ratifying because we have concerns that Kyoto will not deliver for the world what is required in ensuring that other emitters are tied to targets as well. But within Australia, we have worked hard to meet the targets that were set under Kyoto for us in any event. Labor keeps trying to claim that we won't meet those targets. They hope that by saying it often enough, that will be the case. They're obviously being extremely pessimistic in their approach to this, because the data shows that of Australia's target of achieving 108 per cent of emissions at 1990 levels, we are on track. We are just 1 per cent over target for that target by 2012. We are well and truly on track when compared to numerous other countries, when compared to New Zealand, who are 13 per cent above their target, a country, of course, with a Labor government, a country that has ratified Kyoto but is not managing to achieve its targets. So it is no point, Mr Deputy President, in us having targets if we're not able to meet them. This is a government that's happily said we will meet the target, but also that we expect the rest of the community to play its role as well. Now we heard from both Senator Evans and from Senator Kirk, Senator Evans saying that this government stands outside of the international community and Senator Kirk saying that we should be sitting at the table with the international community. Well, I'm not sure, frankly, where they've been recently. We saw at the APEC summit this government taking a leadership role in placing climate change at the forefront of discussions. We are committed to developing the post-2012 arrangements for climate change management in the world. That's why this parliament, hopefully later today, will be passing the first framework for greenhouse gas reporting as part of our emissions trading scheme, which will ensure that this country is playing a leading role into the future in this very important policy area, not just at home, where we will set the standard, but also abroad in ensuring that both developed and developing countries play their role into the future. Senator Polly. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. Um, I rise too to take note today on the important issue of global um, uh, warming and climate change. And can I first just um, make mention of Senator Eggleston and now Senator Birmingham's uh, contribution to the debate? And uh, can we uh, address the issue where Senator Eggleston would like people to give the Howard government some credit for what they've done on climate change? Well, I just think, geez, you know, that's that's a really long bow to expect the. Uh, Australian community to acknowledge what is very little that this government has, has done over 11 very long years. Can I say that in terms of uh, the contribution by uh, my uh, senators on the other side, uh, they're champions at actually taking credit for anything that's good, whether it's a state government and the way the states have uh, managed the economy. But when it comes to taking responsibility for the lack of action, then we see this government running a mile. They run a mile and they're the champions of the blame game. It's uh, Kevin Rudd and the Labor Party have actually showed leadership on this very, very important issue. Yeah. And uh, recently, uh, Mr Rudd outlined uh, the details of the very clear indications of the, the need to address uh, climate change, uh, change and the serious issue and the policy agenda that the Labor Party will take forward uh, to the uh, pending election. It's the Rudd Labor government uh, that will take decisive action on climate change because we believe climate change is the greatest environmental challenge facing the global community. Tackling climate change should be a national priority, but after the Howard government's 11 years of inaction and denial, Australia is now on track to increase its greenhouse pollutants by 27 per cent by 2020. 
In reports released earlier this year, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC, reaffirmed unequivocally what the Howard government has known since 1996, that climate change is real, it will hurt our economy, it will hurt the environment and, most importantly, it will affect our children's future. In coming decades, hotter and drier summers in the south of our country will threaten our rural communities and industries. The harsh reality of climate change is the Great Barrier Reef could be destroyed through coral bleaching, Kakadu wetlands flooded, the snowy mountains could lose much of their snow. These Australian icons are the backbone of our tourism industry and regional economies. It should be noted by the Senate what the UK Stern Review made clear last October. The cost of delay will be far greater than the cost of reducing greenhouse gas emissions now. Labor believes we can address climate change immediately with solutions that ensure the integrity of our water supply, protect our environment and secure Australian jobs and industries now and into the future. A Rudd Labor government is committed to restoring Australia's international leadership on climate change, and Labor will immediately ratify the Kyoto Protocol to help forge a global solution to climate change. Labor will aim to cut Australia's greenhouse pollutants by 60 per cent on 2000 levels by the year 2050 and introduce an effective emissions trading scheme by 2010. Labor is also committed to leading by example. Central to this point, a Labor government has committed to using its purchasing power to provide a market for new, efficient technologies. Labor has also pledged to help Australian families to green their homes. Labor will offer $10,000 low-interest loans for Australian households to implement energy and water savings and provide rebate for rooftop solar panel. Now, these are real initiatives and these are part of the way to heading to a solution. And Labor has agreed to work in partnership with businesses to drive energy efficiency improvements that deliver smarter and more productive industries and establish a $500 million national clean coal fund. Labor also is willing to invest in sustainable agriculture and protect our biodiversity. We will work with farmers to encourage sustainable farming practices which reduce emissions, develop carbon sinks and protects our unique plants and animals. And as I said, it's not about uh, blaming others and wanting to take credit. It's about action. It's about leadership. And uh, I think it's uh, necessary and vitally important and something that the Howard government has not done and has shown no leadership on and I don't believe will do. Labor is the only party— Senator Polly, your time has expired. On the same matter, the question is the motion moved by Senator Evans be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer given by Senator Minchin to the question I asked of him in question time today. Um, the question I asked related to the resolution moved by the, sorry, passed by the Senate earlier this morning uh, without dissent, so I presume with uh, the support of all parties in this chamber, uh, which uh, recognised, amongst other things, there's four parts to it, I won't read the whole thing out, but amongst other things, uh, the Senate recognises the importance of following up expressions of concern uh, regarding sexual assault and abuse of children and young people with genuine action to assist survivors of sexual assault and to bring perpetrators to justice. And uh, the Senate also, um, without dissent, expressed support for the long-standing call for a comprehensive royal commission into the sexual assault and abuse of children throughout Australia, especially in institutions. Now, I appreciate the uh, minister couldn't uh, you know, instantaneously give a response that uh, you know, the Prime Minister and Cabinet had considered this resolution in the space of a few hours and resolved to uh, implement a Royal Commission, although the government is capable of acting extremely quickly, it seems, on, on some issues. But I uh, appreciate for a serious issue like this you don't want to respond um, instantaneously. Uh, but I, I do want to reinforce the key points of the resolution, which is not just that it uh, supported the calls for a Royal Commission but also that it specifically recognised the importance of following up expressions of concern with genuine action. Uh, and that's certainly the point that the Democrats will continue to push uh, right through to Election Day and uh, for uh, as long as we have breath in our bodies, uh, that 
it does need more than just expressions of concern and general statements about how terrible uh, sexual assault of children is and the, the need for us all to do more and all those sorts of things, which is uh, all well and good, but it needs to be followed up with genuine action. Now, the, the minister noted quite understandably and correctly that there's uh, you know, efforts through uh, Commonwealth and state governments to work together to improve our performance in regards to child protection. Uh, and as I've stated in this chamber a number of times before, as have people from other parties, there's uh, certainly a lot of room for improvement uh, in that regard. And uh, there we have failed pretty dismally, collectively uh, and societally, I might say, um, and across the political spectrum in uh, ensuring as much as is humanly possible a uh, safe environment for children. Uh, and I should make the point that whilst I'm urging action from government um, and political parties in this regard, uh, it is an issue where, as a society, we need to take more responsibility. It's not one of those issues, frankly, where you can expect the government to fix it. Uh, you can't expect the government to show leadership on it. You can't expect uh, some comprehensive, cohesive national strategies, uh, which in my view would include a Royal Commission or some similar type of independent commission of inquiry to comprehensively examine the issue uh, rather than deal with it in an ad hoc sort of way. Uh, and the concern uh, that I have and the Democrats have, and as part of the motivation behind this resolution, as is probably fairly obvious, uh, is that once again we had uh, a particular incident generating a lot of publicity, and this was the, the re-raising of concerns about uh, alleged incident in a youth detention centre in Brisbane some time ago and uh, you know, the need for the fact that the issues of justice regarding that had not been resolved, that is a serious issue, needs action. Uh, but obviously there's politics involved in that, obviously that's part of um, why it had resurfaced um, and I think we need to be making sure that we look comprehensively at this issue as a whole and as much as possible in a non-partisan and independent way not have uh, a sudden focus on one area because there's political scandal, political opportunity or just you know, media heat or whatever it is. Uh, and that's why I think we, we need to be having some uh, national cooperation and, and uh, leadership on the issue. And that includes uh, the sort of comprehensive examination of the totality of the issue that I don't believe we've ever had. We've had bits and pieces here and there regarding specific institutions, specific groups in the community, specific regions, uh, specific churches. Um, some done by independent bodies, some done by governments, some done by departments. Uh, we haven't had a comprehensive nationwide examination and that's why the Democrats keep supporting this call, which others in the community have also made. And that's why I would reinforce our request to government to act on this and the opposition leader, uh, obviously moving to a period where he's putting himself as the alternative prime minister, to act on this as a matter of urgency and get a comprehensive uh, examination and action follow up those expressions of concern with action and do so as a matter of urgency. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Macdonald. Uh, Mr Deputy President, could I seek the leave of the uh, Senate to incorporate a speech which we'd arranged to incorporate on the Australian Technical Colleges Act uh, bill, uh, which was inadvertently omitted? The Labor Party have seen it and have approved it. Is, is leave granted? Leave to there being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Macdonald. Senator Coonan. Thank you uh, very much, um, Mr Deputy President. During question time, I was called upon by Senator Crossan to correct a statement made in answer to a question yesterday from Senator Birmingham. The statement complained of concerned um, Labor's pollster, Mr Utting, being on Telstra's payroll. After question time, I read a copy of a letter from Mr Utting, the Managing Director of UMR Research, and a letter from uh, Philip M Burgess of Telstra Corporation that had apparently been widely copied. Both letters assert that Mr Utting has no current or any recent financial relationship with Telstra. However, a search of UMR website last updated today claims that over the past few years UMR has worked with a wide range of clients, which is illustrated uh, in what is described as a recent client list for Australia and New Zealand. Under the selected clients listed as recent clients is none other than Telstra. And so uh, whilst I certainly would correct the record if it is wrong, the information on the public record is, I would submit, equivocal. 
and uh, it certainly does suggest that Telstra is a client. Now, it's either uh, Telstra and Mr Orting uh, acting on a, um, a voluntary basis, and uh, I don't know whether that's in fact the position, but if Telstra and Mr Orting have no financial relationship, it is odd that Telstra is specifically listed as late as today on the UMR website as a client. And uh, so, to be fair to, uh, to, Mr, to both Mr Orting and Telstra, I've placed the competing versions on the record. And I note that uh, the letter from Telstra gave no assurance or guarantee that Telstra would not be meddling in the election to try to secure a Labor victory. I, um, I table the uh, website of UMR Research Limited. All right. um, Senator Conroy. Uh, do I need leave? To yes, you do need leave. Uh, with le seek leave to respond to the minister's statement. You'll need, you'll need to move to take note. Oh, I move to take note of uh, the minister's statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave Thank is you. granted. Senator Conroy. Well, that was perhaps one of the more graceless apologies that one could get when one has been shown to have completely misled the Australian public. Completely misled the Australian public. And, it, and unfortunately, it's not a one-off occurrence because what we've seen in recent months from this minister is that she is a serial misleader of the Australian public. She misled 27 tenderers for the Broadband Connect program when she only told one tenderer that there was more money available than had been advertised as part of the order. tender process. Po order, Senator Conroy. Point of order, Senator Kernan. I think it's getting very close to uh, Senator Conroy reflecting on my integrity, and I don't believe that that's appropriate. I no, no point of order. I'm listening very closely to what uh, Senator Conroy Thank is you. saying. Senator Conroy. So that was just in recent months the first of the serial misleads. 500,000 Australians recently received a letter from the minister, paid for by taxpayers, which misled them about the government's broadband proposal and, more importantly, misled them about the level of coverage of broadband that they actually received. The Australian public have been misled recently by this minister over the maps purporting to be Opel coverage. And tragically, the minister was exposed by her own departmental website, which stated in relation to the maps that the department took no responsibility whatsoever for, by, for any use by any person for these maps whatsoever. Absolutely, the minister's own website exposed the misleading conduct of this minister. And then finally, we've just seen yesterday this graceless and classless performance by the minister when she can't even come in here and just apologise for misleading the Australian public and slandering Mr Utting. And the only pollster that Telstra has employed since the new management came into power in Telstra is the Liberal Party's own Crosby Texter. That's the only pollster being employed by Telstra under the new management. So this minister is a serial misleader, and she has fallen well below the ministerial code of conduct for misleading the Australian public on all of these occasions. And if it wasn't for the fact that their ministerial code of conduct has been shredded over the last few years, this is a minister that should have resigned her commission. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Conroy be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Any MPI urgency? No. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the hours of meeting and routine of business for today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Kernan. I move that the hours of meeting for today shall be 9.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m and 7 p.m. to adjournment, and the order for the consideration of government business for the remainder of today shall be in accordance with the list circulated in the chamber. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Any further ministerial statements? No. Yes. Th there is. Uh, Senator Colbeck. Yes, 
Thank you, Mr Deputy President. On behalf of the Minister of Defence, Mr Dr Nelson, I table a statement on Joint Defence Facility Pine Gap. Any further? Senator Colbert. I present the government's response to the report of the Community Affairs References Committee on its inquiry into oh, the— Sorry, uh, Senator Colbert. Um, uh, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I just wanted to seek leave to take note of the ministerial statement, if I could. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I move to take note of that statement. I won't go on at great length, but uh, we don't get ministerial statements quite so often in this place these days. And uh, on as important issue as the Joint Defence Facility at Pine Gap, I thought it would be appropriate to make a, a few comments. Um, no doubt the government expanded on it. And perhaps there was response to it in the other place. But, uh, uh, to put the Democrats' views on the record, the, the ministerial statement is, is basically a, uh, a bit of a general overview of the role of the Pine Gap uh, Defence Facility, um, which has been in operation for 40 years now, so it's a bit of a 40th anniversary statement, uh, and it does set out the government's view in fairly straightforward and uncontroversial fashion. Uh, I would like to make just uh, one or two general comments and a specific comment in regard to that. Uh, there's no doubt that the Pine Gap Defence Facility does play a, a significant role in uh, Australia's defence activities. Uh, and there's also no doubt that it's been quite controversial and continues to remain con controversial to some degree. Uh, I think the level of controversy uh, to some extent depends on the nature of Australia's defence policy as it does in regard to what happens specifically at the facility. Uh, there is a change in the nature of some of the work that is done there or the importance of it uh, in the changed international security environment, particularly post-2001, um, and uh, that's something that, that I recognise. Uh, but some of the concerns about the facility um, remain fairly similar. Now, in uh, previous decades, there was a lot of concern about it being a, a nuclear target. I don't see any reason why that concern wouldn't have shifted uh, or would have, been dis would have disappeared, but that's acknowledged in the minister's statement. Uh, but there is also a wider issue of uh, what, what the facility is used for. Uh, now, I, um, speaking individually, I'm not a, a pacifist. I recognise the role of a defence force, and for me it's about making sure the defence force is used for defence and genuine defence purposes, uh, and that can include intelligence gathering, of course, uh, but isn't used to facilitate acts of aggression. And uh, certainly that's behind my concern uh, in regard to the uses of this particular facility uh, in the current uh, international environment and in regards to the federal government's current defence policies. Uh, there is a, a new political correctness abroad in the land that any time one expresses concern about uh, Australia's uh, military policies being intertwined with uh, the current military agenda of the US administration, you just get told that you're anti-American or anti-the US alliance and these sorts of things. Uh, I've been on the record a number of times, going back many, many years, actually, of, of not being against having a, a cooperative relationship with the United States, but I do think we need to retain sufficient independence that we aren't so intertwined with the US that uh, when they embark on unwise uh, acts of military aggression that we're uh, fundamentally uh, linked with those acts of military aggression and their ongoing uh, operation, and that's where we're at at the moment, I think. There's not much doubt Pine Gap is used in part for that role, and I think that's a uh, very much valid reason why people continue to express concern about it. The only other point I'd make in the regard to the ministerial statement is it, it does in passing note that there are, obviously the government is, is quite comfortable uh, with the continuing role of Pine Gap and the way it operates, and uh, from all I'm aware of, the opposition is, is similarly uh, perfectly comfortable with it. Uh, the ministerial statement does acknowledge in passing that that's not a universal view amongst the community, that there do remain some concerns amongst people in the community. And the, the ministerial statement states that while the government doesn't share those views, those views are respected. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not so convinced those views are respected. Uh, and I'm particularly concerned about the continuing uh, actions of the Attorney General in uh, targeting uh, some non-violent protesters who sought to make their views known via entering the Pine Gap facility uh, by, uh, as a way of non-violent protest. Now, regardless of whether or not you agree with their views and even whether or not you agree with their methods, uh, the absolute total sledgehammer approach uh, of the Attorney-General in response to that uh, clearly 
non-violent action uh, by those protesters, uh, and you know, it, it is beyond dispute, I think, uh, the intent of those protesters, their history, their, their record over many years uh, of the sorts of uh, clearly non-violent protesters that protests that you know, lots of people don't particularly like, but are, are clearly no threat, clearly no security threat, clearly no threat in terms of violence. Uh, and the Attorney General made the decision for the first time ever to use the uh, Defence Special Undertakings Act, a Cold War piece of legislation that had never been used even during the Cold War, uh, to now use it uh, to uh, charge these protesters under. Uh, all of the other times people had trespassed at Pine Gap, or they had been charged under trespass type offences, gone through the courts that way. I don't have a problem with that. People almost always go into these actions with their eyes open. And uh, you know, there's no doubt that people on this occasion did so with their eyes open, including of course, aware that there's always the potential for a government to try and use them as a political example. Uh, but it is, I think, uh, <coughs> completely unjustifiable for the Attorney General to have made the specific, and it clearly was a specific political individual decision of the government and the Attorney General to use this extremely heavy handed piece of legislation that's obviously meant to be used for people who are you know, international spies or, or genuinely attempting to create major security hazards. Uh, to use it on non-violent peace protesters, I think, is a disgrace. Uh, and what is even more disgraceful is, having done so, uh, having employed uh, an army of QCs uh, to ensure that uh, the people's defence, the protesters' defence, was uh, as limited as possible, and that uh, there was very little opportunity for them to get the totality of their defence and their justifications on the on the public record or get it accepted in court, uh, and those people were thus uh, found guilty almost unavoidably by a jury. Uh, the judge uh, then produced a sentence. Uh, clearly they didn't have any precedent to use in determining the sentence because there had never been a, ch a charge under the Act before. Uh, now, the judge in that case uh, weighed up the intent of the actions, the uh, extent of the risk or non-existence thereof to public safety and security the motivation of the protesters and a range of other factors and brought down a fine. Uh, the, the key issue with the use of the Defence Special Undertakings Act is that it has a, a potential for a, a jail sentence, a very extreme jail sentence. Um, I cannot off the top of my head remember what it is. Uh, I, I have 15 years in my head, but it may be seven years, I'm not sure. But either way, that, that scope was there by the decision of the Attorney General not to charge with trespass but to charge under that act. Uh, specifically put in the prospect of uh, many years jail uh, for a very simple act of civil disobedience and non-violent protest. Uh, what is a particular disgrace is not only using that act but the sentence having been brought down, the government once again coming through and the Attorney-General once again coming through with the sledgehammer and the, the use of taxpayers' funds and launching an appeal against the sentence. Uh, that, I think, is not only a, an excessive abuse of government power, but it is a deliberate act of intimidation, not just against those protesters, but against anybody uh, that seeks to express concern about this government's um, defence policy and military policy and foreign policy in regards to uh, use of our defence forces. So I don't believe the government and the minister can credibly say, as they have in this statement, that they have respect uh, for people who have different views than they do about the Pine Gap facility. My views about the Pine Gap facility are not the same as those protesters uh, that have been arrested and convicted, um, but I certainly do not have any problem with uh, either their right to protest or their method of protest. And I do have a real problem with the use of uh, that sort of piece of legislation for purposes that it clearly wasn't intended, uh, the use of uh, large amounts of taxpayers' funds to persecute peace protesters and pursue peace protesters uh, rather than use it towards where it should be used, which is actually protecting and improving the safety of Australians. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Now, are there any more ministerial statements or is it a response to a committee report? Right. No, no more ministerial statements. Now, are there any government responses to committee reports? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I present the government's response to the report of the Community Affairs References Committee on its inquiry into quality and equity in aged care and sick leave to have the document incorporated in the council. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McLucas. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave to uh, 
move a motion to take note of the uh, of the government response. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Mr. Acting Deputy President, this uh, government response table today uh, is in response to a report uh, which was tabled in this place on the 23rd of June 2005. It has taken this government to, uh, two years and three months to respond to a report that usually, well, it's not right to say that, that uh, you would expect uh, the Senate would uh, receive within three months. It is normal to expect a government response three months after the tabling of a report, uh, but we have had to wait two years and three months to receive this document. Mr Acting Deputy President, I was very pleased to be the chair of that inquiry into aged care uh, by the Senate Community Affairs Committee. I acknowledge Senator Allison's in involvement in developing the terms of reference, particularly on the issues affecting young people in nursing homes. But to take two years and three months to respond to what I've got to say it was an excellent report, but not huge, is appalling. Uh, can I say on reading this document, though, it is a document of hollow self-congratulation. It intentionally does not uh, misunderstand some of the recommendations. It is a list of, uh, uh, as I said, hollow self-congratulation. The report was uh, uh, divided into a, a range of areas, and the time will not allow me to, to deal with all of them, but hopefully I'll get to the most important. Three years ago, or almost three years ago, when I became the Shadow Minister for Ageing, when I'd go to an aged care service, the big issue people talk to, would talk to me about was uh, funding, in particular capital raising. Now, and this government knows it, now the most significant issue facing aged care, both residential and community care, is how to attract and retain a quality workforce in order to care for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And in terms of the seven recommendations that our committee made in our report, uh, the response from the government is, to be frank, ridiculous. The first re uh, recommendation that our committee made was, uh, that, uh, was to do with the number of nurses that we have in aged care, in particular residential aged care. In the life of this government, the number of, of registered and enrolled nurses who now work in our aged care facilities in Australia has reduced. In the same time, the number of people who live in residential aged care in Australia has increased by almost 25,000. So we have less qualified nurses caring for, as I said, some of the most vulnerable people in our society. The recommendation of our committee was to follow the, re the recommendation of Professor Warren Hogan, and that is to increase the number of undergraduate nursing places at Australian universities to, th to 1,000. The response is offensive. The response talks about the 440 aged care nurses funded in the 2004-05 budget. Yes, that's acknowledged in the recommendation and then goes on to talk about the normal number of, of uh, undergraduate places that are there every year, year in, year out. The recommendation was clear. We want an extra thousand, at least, to deal with the problem that we have, finding nurses to work right across the health sector, but particularly in aged care. In 2004, this government received a report that said we are 19,000 nurses short in this country. I note, though, that the response from the government was too embarrassed to talk about the 500 uh, enrolled nurses that uh, minister, uh, the Prime Minister announced last week who are going to be trained now in hospitals rather than in the well-organised and well-run TAFE system, uh, because we know, and Catholic Health Australia knows, that those 500 enrolled nurses that the government has promised to be trained in TAFE will never end up in aged care because the pathway is not there. And I commend uh, Francis Sullivan from Catholic Health Australia for raising the issue, as did I, uh, because we know that that announcement 
does not, uh, will not result in any new nurses or uh, either enrolled or uh, 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 um, full nurses who are working in aged care. Can I also say that uh, recommendation five of the committee said that as a matter of priority we needed to expand the national aged care workforce strategy to encompass the full aged care workforce, including medical and allied health profession professionals across all of the aged care sector, including the community care sector. There's a little bit of honesty in the response to this one. The, uh, the government acknowledges that further work needs to, ha to occur to cover the full aged care workforce. But what have they been doing? We've known of the problem of uh, workforce in aged care, but they're still acknowledging we need to do further work. And what it, what it, well, the next paragraph does tell you what's been happening. They've taken a census. They've counted the number of people who are working in aged care. I'm sorry, Mr. Acti Mr. Pre Deputy President, we actually need more than counting people who work in aged care. We'd like to know how we're going to train, pay them, uh, and ke therefore keep them in aged care services so that we can actually run the facilities uh, that we have. The second section that uh, the report goes to is a, a section on accreditation. Uh, the, government, the first recommendation talks about the need for delivering consistency uh, in assessments of aged care facilities. The, the, second report, uh, the second recommendation goes to the question of the accuracy of assessors' decision, decisions and uh, uh, further about the uh, access to uh, the process of accreditation by uh, both residents and their families. Mr Acting Deputy President, um, once again the government intentionally has misunderstood uh, the, two the two first recommendations. The issues have not been addressed by this government. Every time there is a problem uh, in aged care and, a, and a, um, an issue is raised, particularly in the media, the question of consistency of assessment is raised. We need to have confidence as a community in a system that delivers a fair analysis of the quality of care that is being provided. And it is my clear view and my strong view that uh, we have in fact eroded that confidence in aged care uh, in the accreditation process in aged care, particularly over the last 18 months. Aged care providers have no confidence in the assessment system. Families, the more they find out about it, have, li have limited confidence in, a in uh, the process of accreditation and quality assurance. But unfortunately now we're getting to the point where uh, I don't think uh, parliamentarians had confidence in the process e either. And when we lose confidence in the process, I'm afraid uh, it is time for a, a, uh, a review. In that section as well, the, government, uh, the committee recommended that the agency develop a rating system that allows residents and families to make informed comparisons between different aged care facilities. This followed from a recommendation of Professor Hogan uh, who recommended that there be a star rating so that people could make some decision about, uh, about, the, uh, type of, uh, the, about the facility uh, before uh, either entering there themselves or uh, placing a loved one there. Uh, personally, I don't agree with uh, uh, Professor Hogan's star rating. It's not a motel we're talking about. We're talking about a place where a person is going to live and receive care. But once again, the government intentionally misunderstood uh, the, uh, the recommendation. The recommendation says that we want to give people information so they can make an informed judgment on where they might want to go. The government then goes to great lengths to talk about how they've developed a website. Can I say the website's quite good? Whoever developed it didn't, did a quite good job. But it doesn't tell you. It doesn't allow you to make any comparison about the quality of care that is being provided there, the level of staffing. It doesn't tell you what, the, uh, 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 what, what charges will be, will be uh, 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 levelled on any, any resident. It does tell you where it is, and that's useful, 
We acknowledge that. That's okay. Uh, but, it do, but once again, intentionally, the government has not addressed the guts of the question. Mr. Acting Senator McLucas, your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McLucas be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Um, Senator Bartlett, you wanted to incorporate a document to, from a, a, a bill earlier today. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Yes, I was seeking leave to incorporate a speech which was meant to be done with the Technical Colleges Bill at lunchtime that I failed to do. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, Australia's aid program in the Pacific, and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to incorporate a tabling statement in Hansard, in Hansard, which I understand has been circulated. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Government whip in the Senate. I uh, present the report of the Environment, Communications, Information Technology and the Arts Committee on two privilege matters raised with the committee in relation to its inquiry into national parks, conservation reserves and marine protected areas, and move that the report be printed. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Government whip. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Government Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to have a tabling statement incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Allison. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to table the report of the inquiry into the provisions of the same sex, same entitlements bill 2007 and the transcript of the hearing conducted in Parliament House on the 13th of September. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Allison. Um, and I seek leave to make a very short statement with leave regard granted. to the tabling. You need, uh, need to move to take note. First, Senator Allison, uh, I, and then I beg your pardon. Then I move to, that the Senate take note of the report. Right. And is leave granted for Senator Allison? Hmm? Leave is not granted. Leave is not granted. Leave is not granted. No, no. Yes, you've tabled the report, but leave is not granted for you to speak to take note of the report. Is that correct? Opposition whip? Correct. That was the understanding. Clerk, are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated by the senators. Order. I have received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to the following law. Australian Citizenship Amendment bracket, citizenship, end of bracket, citizenship Testing end of bracket, Act 2007. Government Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day. Health Insurance Amendment and Medicare Dental Services Bill 2007. Second reading. Adjourned debate. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. Directing Deputy President. Um, the purpose of this bill, the Health Insurance Amendment Medical Service, Service sorry, Health Insurance Amendment Medical Dental Services Bill, uh, is to amend the Health Insurance Act of 1973 in order to provide for the expansion of the government's failing Medicare dental program for people with chronic conditions and complex care needs. As indicated in the debate on this legislation in the other place, Labor will be opposing this bill. Labor will oppose the bill because it's an election year patch-up job, 
by a government that has pre pre presided over 11 years of neglect in dental health. Labor has consistently and loudly highlighted not only the weaknesses of this particular policy, but also the Howard government's negligent approach to the dental health needs of Australians over the last 11 years. A decade of Howard government neglect can't be fixed by throwing millions of dollars at a failing policy. Failing policy cannot be made effective simply by, uh, in, by pouring more money into it. The basis of this policy is wrong, and that's why Labor will not support it. There is little doubt that Australia is in the midst of a potentially catastrophic dental care crisis. Let's look at some of the facts. Currently, there are around 650,000 Australians on public dental waiting lists around the country, many waiting years for treatment. 30 per cent of Australians have reported avoiding dental care due to cost. The dental workforce shortages mean that Australians simply cannot get in to see a dentist when their teeth need attention. And in the public sector, that means long waiting lists. In the private sector, it means not being able to get in to see a local dentist at short notice. These dental workforce shortages are particularly felt in outer metropolitan, regional and rural areas where there, simply, there are simply not enough dental professionals. These problems with accessing affordable dental care are contributing to Australia's deteriorating dental health. Tooth decay ranks as Australia's most prevalent health problem, while gum disease ranks, ranks fifth highest. Untreated dental decay in the Australian adult population stands at 25.5 per cent. A quarter of Australians are not getting the dental care they need. A recent study found that one in six Australians had avoided certain foods during the last 12 months because of problems with their teeth. 50,000 Australians a year are being hospitalised for preventable dental conditions which have escalated into more serious problems because they have not been able to access treatment when needed. And perhaps the biggest indictment. While Australian kids had the, the world's best teeth during the 1990s, the mid-1990s, there are now pockets of real concern. For example, between 1996 and 1999, five-year-olds experienced a 21.7 per cent increase in deciduous decay. This was matched by soaring hospitalisation figures for removal or restoration of teeth. According to the New South Wales Chief Health, New South Wales Chief Health Officer's statistics, hospitalisation rates for children under five have increased by 91 per cent between 1994-95 and 2004-05, a finding confirmed by disturbing claims Infam uh, uh, claims information recently released by health insurer MBF that showed a 42 per cent increase in children being treated in private hospitals for dental cavities. It is clear that Australia needed, needs action on dental health. Rather than addressing this range of issues to improve accessibility to affordable dental care, the Howard government have instead spent must, much of the last uh, past decade cynically playing the blame game on dental health. Time and time again, Prime Minister Howard and the Health Minister Mr Abbott have deflected criticism onto the states and territories, saying, curiously, that Australia's public dental care crisis and deteriorating oral health standards were entirely a state and territory problem. We've seen more of it this week with all of the carry-on that we would have seen in the other place on Tuesday afternoon. Of course, in seeking to blame the states and the territories, the Prime Minister and the Health Minister conveniently ignored two key facts. Firstly, it was the Howard government that scrapped Labor's Commonwealth Dental Health Program in 1996, ripping $100 million a year from Australia's public dental system. Make, make no mistake about this. This, the government axed it, abolished the scheme as one of their first acts in government. Do not believe the revisionism exercised for, by the Minister for Health this week, and he, where he said that the Howard government did not review 
the Commonwealth Dental Health Program. The program had a year to run, and they cut off the last year of funding, $100 million a year. While the state and territory governments have more than doubled their investment in public dental care over the past decade, the Howard government has with withdrawn $1.1 billion in public dental services over the last 11 years. The impact of the Howard government decision in 1996 still reverberates today, not least in the hundreds of thousands of Australians languishing, languishing on public dental waiting lists. But that's not all the government have done. Dental care in Australia is in a crisis because of underfunding and because of workforce shortages. The Howard government seems to have forgotten that the training of dental professionals, professionals is entirely a Commonwealth government responsibility, but its neglect in this area is of long standing. The Senate Community Affairs References Committee recommended a national oral health training strategy for oral health care providers and other health professionals as long ago as 1998, but the Howard government has failed to act. In 2003, researchers highlighted that there would be a shortage of 1,500 dental professionals by 2010, and this action was taken. And in 2004, dental graduation levels were found to be at their lowest level for 50 years. Belatedly, the, how the government has recently increased dental training places at Australia's universities, and Labor welcomed the recent budget announcement of a new dental school at Charles Sturt University. But a comprehensive and strategic national policy is required to ensure long a long-term solution to the crisis. Not enough has been done, in particular, to address public sector shortage and regional rural demand for dental professionals. And while we're talking about uh, dental schools, I place on the record my support for James Cook University's uh, uh, desire to establish a dental school in my hometown of Cairns. I commend them for the work they've done. It's unfortunate that they were overlooked uh, and Charles Sturt uh, was successful. They can be assured I will continue to advocate on their behalf. Uh, training. Uh, of uh, dental professionals is certainly uh, uh, what we have needed for some time. Uh, affordability is also part of the key. Is, is also part of the issue. Mr. Acting Deputy President, over the last uh, four months, I have been conducting uh, forums for older Australians around Australia. I think in every single one of those forums that I have conducted, the issues of dental health and uh, affordability of dental services and access to dental services has been raised with me. When you, go, when you talk with these older people, older Australians, about the systems that are in place, the measures that the government introduced some uh, three years ago, uh, one, they're not aware of them, and then you explain how they work and they say, well, that wouldn't help me anyway because I can't afford the co-payment. These are people who are on pensions. They simply cannot afford the co-payment. So uh, if, if you needed a bit of evidence, I think you just need to start to talk to older people, older people who are on pensions and fixed incomes, and who will tell you very, very clearly uh, that uh, the current uh, uh, policy approach of the, of the Howard government simply isn't working. The other thing that I do is ask uh, 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 people from uh, the community what, uh, what the waiting lists are like at uh, public dental clinics. And why, by way of example, uh, I can report to the Senate that the small community of Edmonton, south of Cairns, a, a community of some six and a half, seven thousand people, has a waiting list, the worst I've heard of, of 4,000 people. 4,000 people out of a community of not, not more than six and a half thousand. Admittedly, the collection area is probably larger than that, but 4,000 people on a waiting list. I didn't ask how long it was uh, for them to, to seek attention. Unfortunately, though, this government is far more interested in playing the blame game than in providing solutions for Australia's dental crisis. The Howard government's initiatives on dental health have been limited to the subsidies of 30 per cent or more, depending on the person's age, for people with private health insurance 
Uh, rebates, I'm, I've got to say, Labor supports. Uh, but the other initiative that the government has undertaken is the ineffective Medicare dental program for people with chronic conditions and complex care needs, which is the focus of this legislation. This program was initially introduced, uh, announced in March of 2004 and commenced in July of that year. Under this policy, Australians were eligible for assistance with their dental care if they had a chronic medical condition, uh, like heart disease or diabetes or malignancies of the head and neck, and so they have to have a chronic medical condition, and they have poor oral health or a dental condition which was exacerbating their chronic and complex disease, and they were being treated under a multidisciplinary care plan. They have to jump three, uh, three hoops to get into the system. These complex and restrictive eligibility criteria limited the program to people, limiting the, peop the program to people with chronic conditions and complex care needs has severely limited the uptake of the program. High out-of-pocket expenses have also proven to be a significant barrier to uptake. Under the original policy, patients could claim up to three items in one calendar year at a cost of $220 per year for a program of treatment. But according to the 2005-06 data released earlier this year, the average out-of-pocket expense for, an ass for assessment or treatment by a dental specialist under Medicare item 10977 was $692. It is hardly surprising that this has adversely affected the program's take-up. Complex referral processes between GPs and dentists have also been cited as a significant problem. The Australian Dental Association, in evidence to the Senate's uh, Standing Committee of, on Community Affairs that examined this bill, stated that the paperwork in the initial system was a bit cumbersome and that administration of the scheme, most particularly practitioners' unfamiliar unfamiliarity with Medicare, continues to cause concern. The AMA noted in their submission to the committee that there was, and I quote, some ongoing concern that GPs have difficulty locating a dentist who will accept the, re the rebates as full payment when referring patients. To get an idea of just how poorly this program has been executed, I refer again to the minister's media release of 10 March 2004, where he stated that the new dental services would provide, and I quote, for up to 23,000 people under multi multidisciplinary care plans. In fact, in the three years between its introduction in July 2004 and June 2007, the program provided for a mere 7,000 patients at a cost of $1.8 million. The minister predicted that 23,000 people would be supported under that program only 7,000 people were. Labor has consistently highlighted the weaknesses of this policy, and the Minister for Health himself, as recently as Tuesday in the other place, <laughs> openly acknowledged the failure of this policy, which, which makes it even more the remarkable then that the government would announce in, in the budget in May that it would pour an additional $377 million into an expansion of the failing program. The figure was subsequently increased to $384.6 million, a program that is so flawed that has only managed to spend $1.8 million in three years has now been allocated $385 million over four years. The budget announcement included a change in the benefits available under the program, although, again, it was subsequently adjusted. Eligible patients from 1 November will now be able to access up to $4,250 worth of Medicare-funded dental treatment over two consecutive calendar years. This might sound good to a casual passerby, and the change might go some way to addressing the out-of-pocket expenses incurred by eligible patients, but the key problem of how few people are eligible remain. Given the extremely poor take-up to date, Labor has no confidence that the extended program will be any better 
particularly because the government has failed to address the, the range of other problems besetting the program. Most importantly, the eligibility criteria remain totally unchanged by this legislation. Further, the government has failed to address the complex and restrictive referral processes identified as cumbersome by dentists and doctors alike. In fact, the, government, the department revealed to the recent committee examining this, le this legislation that the, the current three Medicare items will be expanded to more than 450 Medicare items under the extended programs. Labor is not convinced that moving from three Medicare items to 450 Medicare items can possibly simplify the program or encourage greater take-up by patients or practitioners. Throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at a failing program is not just, uh, is, uh, not just an appalling piece of public policy. Labor objects to the continuation of a policy that is not only failing on its narrow, own narrow objectives, but it, which also will do very little to address Australia's public uh, dental waiting lists, will do nothing to make dental care more affordable and accessible to Australian families, and fails to even contemplate Australia's dental workforce crisis. It is for those reasons that Labor will be opposing this bill. This is a very brief bill. The provisions simply provide the legislative framework for the policy detail to be fully still to be fully revealed by the government. It make am makes amendments to the Health Insurance Act to enable a monetary limit on the Medicare benefits for dental services to be introduced for eligible patients. It amends, uh, the amendments provide for Medicare benefits to be paid for the supply of dental prostheses, such as dentures, under the new dental items. And according to the explanatory memorandum, details such as the medical dental items, including the scheduled fees, the eligibility requirements for dental providers and patients and other administrative requirements will be set out in a ministerial determination. Perhaps we will be surprised by policy developments outlined in this detail, but for now, Labor is not convinced that this is a policy worthy of our support. Pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into a failing program is simply not good policy and won't help the hundreds of thousands of Australians in need of dental care. And as announced by my colleagues, uh, 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 Labor Leader Kevin Rudd and uh, Opposition Health Spokesperson Nico Roxon earlier this week, rather than propping up the Howard government's failing and narrowly targeted dental scheme shambles, uh, Labor will instead uh, uh, draw on these funds and redirect them to Labor's own dental policy. This, in the first instalment of Labor's plan, we have committed $290 million to supply up to 1 million additional dental consultations and treatments for Australian need, Australians needing dental care. Uh, as part of federal Labor's determination to take national leadership and end the blame game in dental health, this funding will be available for the states and territories to help clear the waiting list backlog. States and territories will utilise their existing infrastructure to either supplement their existing public services or purchase private sector appointments for the hundreds and thousands waiting on, are stuck on their waiting lists. Labor's Commonwealth Dental Program will ensure that the, that Commonwealth investment is directed to, toward a broad-based scheme that better addresses the priority oral health needs of those groups in the community most in need of assistance. Labor's approach stands in sharp contrast to the Howard government's failing chronic disease scheme, a stark choice between helping one million Australians with their dental care or the dismal 7,000 who have been offered assistance under the government's failing policy. Rather than focus on a policy with such restricted eligibility, a Rudd Labor government will re-establish a Commonwealth dental program order, and order. ease the, the pressure Senator's on public dental waiting. Senator Allison. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, it was encouraging to see that uh, money was finally being allocated to dental care in the 2007-08 budget, or more correctly, money to assist uh, those people uh, who don't have private health insurance. Uh, the government of course, um, 
spends about 400 million a year paying, uh, in paying the 30 per cent of the cost of dental care for those able to afford private ancillary dental uh, health insurance cover. The Health Minister has consistently argued that dental care was not his responsibility and that it was uh, all up to the states. He conveniently ignored the Constitution, which clearly recognises the role of the Commonwealth in the delivery of dental services. Of course, once it looked like dental health was going to play a part in the federal election, the coalition was forced to do something to take the heat off. Uh, and uh, that's their standard response, of course, when it comes to health. Wait until there's a public hue and cry and uh, make some quick announcement that will quieten things down and then move on. Unfortunately, these announcements don't usually tackle the real issues or provide any long-term solutions, and this announcement is no exception. Ten years ago, the Howard government shirked its responsibility for dental care by walking away from the former Labor government's $100 million a year Commonwealth dental scheme, and ordinary Australians had to face the consequences. Hundreds of thousands of people are on waiting lists for public dental care around Australia. And estimates put that figure at 650,000 people with an average waiting time of 27 months. So that's one in every 30 Australians. And it's probably an underestimate because um, anecdotal evidence suggests that lots of people are, putting, are simply not joining the list anymore because they don't think there's any point. And those 650,000 don't include the many who are not eligible for the public system, people who don't have a health card but uh, can't afford the private system where dentists can charge whatever they like. Dental fees have increased much more quickly than other health services and faster than CPI. Too many people put off attending to preventive treatment and fillings and cavities uh, as uh, more urgent bills pile up at home and their oral health deteriorates further. A recent survey by the National Oral Health Alliance estimates that as many as 40 per cent of Australians could not access treatment when they needed it because of costs and a severe shortage of dentists. By 2010, Australia will be short 1,500 dental workers, mostly dentists, and that's 3.8 million dental visits that won't happen. The shortage of dentists is already acute in rural and remote areas. The Australian Dental Association recently released figures showing that, on average, Australia uh, had 47.4 practising dentists for every uh, 100,000 people. But a breakdown of that figure shows that while major cities might have 56.2 um, dentists per 100,000 population, remote areas had just 22.9 dentists for the same number. Regional areas don't fare much better either. Um, inner regional locations have 33.6 dentists and outer regional areas 26.6 dentists per 100,000 population. So there's a growing inequity um, in dental health and care in Australia, whether we're talking about geographic inequalities between rural and urban Australians or between socio-economically disadvantaged communities and their wealthier counterparts. Low-income adults without private dental insurance are 25 times more likely to have all their teeth extracted than high-income adults with insurance, and children in lower-income families now have twice as many rotten teeth as those in wealthier groups. Dental health is an area which very clearly illustrates one of the major problems with Australia's health system, the lack of priority given to prevention and early intervention. So rather than spending money on education, on checkups and early treatment, the federal government is spending millions of dollars uh, a year on GP visits and hospital care for dental problems. It's very difficult to get good data, but reports suggest that up to one in ten GP visits are for dental problems, uh, costing Medicare hundreds of millions of dollars a year. People come in for repeated uh, prescriptions for antibiotics and painkillers because they can't find and can't afford a dentist. Uh, it makes sense if you're in pain with a dental infection, uh, you'll, uh, of course you'll go to your local GP for drugs, but it doesn't work, which is why uh, people turn, uh, turn up over and over again. GPs can't fix teeth, they can prescribe antibiotics and pain relief, but the underlying problem is there still and it keeps coming back. 
Eventually, things get so bad that people end up in hospitals, and more than 30,000 people are hospitalised every year because of a dental condition. And they're not all older people. The number one reason that children under the age of five are admitted to hospitals is for their teeth. And of course, there is increasing research and awareness of the connection between oral and general health. We know that the failure to treat dental problems can lead to or exacerbate other illnesses elsewhere in the body. Poor oral health has been linked to arthritis, diabetes and cardiovascular disease to various degrees. And this is not a failure of policy. In uh, 2004, the National Oral Health Plan, uh, called Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, uh, was a comprehensive approach to improving oral health and was endorsed by all health ministers. But three years down the track, there's been very little improvement. Unfortunately, the changes to the Medicare Enhanced Primary Care Scheme for people with chronic and complex conditions proposed in this bill will do little to fix the underlying and ongoing problems. On the surface, it seems as if, uh, at long last, the Howard government is acknowledging its responsibility for dental care, but uh, it's allocated the money in such a way that most people will not be able to get the help they need. The government has selected one group of people to help, and they'll have to go to a doctor and show that they have a condition with complex care needs and receive, receive care under a written management plan. And then they'll have to show that they have a dental problem which significantly adds to the seriousness of their medical condition so they can uh, get permission to, see, to actually see a dentist and get some care. The existing dental items in the enhanced primary care scheme has not been a roaring success, uh, and even, even that's been acknowledged by the government. There has been a very poor uptake attributed in part to the administrative complexity of the scheme and the restrictions on age eligibility. So it's hard to see how increasing from three Medicare items to 450 Medicare items will make the system any easier for people to use. Finding dentists who would accept the rebate as the total payment uh, has also been a problem, meaning that lots of people still face out-of-pocket expenses they can't afford. It is true that there will be higher rebates under the system, but co-payments are still allowed and some eligible patients will not be able to afford to pay the co-payment. The new system will also have a cap on it at $4,250 over two years, and people will then have to cover all of the costs for any ongoing uh, dental treatment after that. It's difficult to assess what impact this uh, bill will have. After all, most of the detail, including the eligibility criteria for dental providers and patients, will be up to ministerial uh, determination. But we do know that it won't help those who need to receive their dental care in a hospital environment. These patients will be ineligible for the Medicare rebates. There are many special needs, uh, patients that for a variety of reasons uh, cannot be treated uh, for in dental surgery, whether it's because of a mental health problem, an intellectual disability or a physical illness such as cancer, leukaemia or haemophilia. Those patients with special needs that would require them to be under general anaesthetic in hospital or require other hospital level assistance while undergoing dental uh, treatment will miss out. Dental care is largely primary care and deserves federal funding. It's not a case of the Commonwealth taking over dental care, but simply paying its fair share. And this means more than simply extending a program that will do nothing for most of the people in direct need, in direst need or other. There should be specific Commonwealth funding for low-income people to get access to free basic dental care, not just people with complex and chronic conditions. The report into health funding by the Commonwealth-dominated House of Representatives Standing Committee on Health and Ageing recommended that the federal government supplement dental care for those in disadvantaged positions way back in uh, December last year. And we should extend Medicare to cover medically necessary dental care for the medically compromised, those patients who, because of their medical, physical or mental state, cannot be treated by general dental practitioners in the private uh, or the public setting, and require treatment to be undertaken within the safe, uh, safety and resources uh, available in hospitals. This group, which includes the severely immunosuppressed, such as organ and bone marrow transplant recipients, patients who require replacement heart valves and those needing radiotherapy treatment to the neck and the head need medically necessary dental care and this should be funded by the Commonwealth. Equally, those people with intellectual or psychological disabilities that necessitate hospital-based dental treatment should be covered by the Commonwealth. 
and there uh, should be a much greater focus on preventive oral health programs, including dental health promotion and public education campaigns. And that would include screening and dental hygiene programs in all primary schools. So we shouldn't be simply flinging money at repairing and replacing teeth. This doesn't fundamentally improve dental health in the country. Once a tooth is replaced or repaired, it needs ongoing regular maintenance. And to be effective, we need to address the major cause of oral health dysfunction, tooth loss. We need to be supporting preventive practices, including dental office-based fluoridation, uh, diet assessment and education, cleaning and scaling. And we need to fix the lack of a workforce to provide, a hor provide oral health care. We need long-range dental health uh, <coughs> workforce planning and more university places for dentists and dental hygienists. The federal government has increased dental training places to address the shortage of dentists, but more graduates are still needed to make the dental labour force adequate. And we need more Commonwealth-supported dental places. We also need incentives to encourage graduates to work in rural and remote areas and the public sector, and this means better salaries and conditions for all dental workers working in the public sector. We should be looking at more scholarships for dental students in rural and remote areas and exploring debt forgiveness for dental graduates who agree to provide their services in regional, rural and remote areas or in the public sector. We need to think about providing financial support for dental intern programs, as has been successfully undertaken in Britain, and this would allow the immediate creation of an extensive oral health workforce in public hospitals and dental clinics and available to the most needy as well as ensuring the availability of dentists in rural and regional areas. Uh, we could look at providing salaried, specially trained um, positions for orthodontics, or oral surgery, periodontics, uh, with the requirement of one to two years return of service in a public facility. Again, providing better accesses to specialist services in um, public settings. There should be outreach programs for Indigenous Australians, people with mental illness, homeless people, prisoners and the chronically ill. And we need more dental uh, health assessment and follow-up dental hygienists in residential aged care. We do need more money to tackle the disastrously long waiting lists for basic dental services, for, the pain, for relief of the pain and the repair and replacement of teeth. But we also need to look to the future and prioritise training, prevention and research if we want to see real long-term gains, gains that go beyond an electoral cycle. Parliamentary Secretary, Senator, oh, sorry. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, on behalf of Senator Sir Stirl and Senator Polly, I seek leave to have their remarks on this legislation incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Parliamentary Secretary, thank you, Senator Mason. Uh, Mr. Anglin, President, uh, thank you very much. Um, look, I do agree with uh, Senator McLucas and Senator Rallison that uh, you know, dental uh, health is a, is a big issue in this country, and certainly there's been much debate both here in Parliament and throughout the public uh, in recent times. Um, it is an important issue. But, sir, clearly this is an issue primarily for the states, and I sometimes wonder. You now, I sometimes wonder, uh, with all the money we give uh, through GST payments to states. Well, well, Senator Lucas asked the question. You know, my home state of Queensland. Let's take that as an example. Receives billions of dollars more than it would have received under the old taxation arrangements, and yet cannot provide sufficient primary dental care for Queenslanders. Why is that? They receive more more taxation revenue from the Commonwealth than they have ever received in the history of the Federation, more than they would have received if the Labor Party had stopped the GST going through, which was, their, which was what they tried to do. But because the GST went through, the, state, the, good, the great state of Queensland receives more money in revenue than they have ever received or would have received under the old arrangements. Now, all of us know that. Uh, Mr. Racking Deputy President, and yet they can't provide adequate services for Queenslanders. And yet the Labor Party stands up here and says, gee, it's all the Commonwealth's fault. Well, it's not. Well, let me, let me just talk a bit about, uh, let me just talk about some of the problems we have in dental health care. But can I just, by way of parenthesis, say this? Now, I suspect I may even get some bipartisan support on this. Um, 
One of the big issues in Queensland, certainly over the last 10 years, it's been a local government issue, but it's been raised in state parliament. And I suspect, quite frankly, it's not an issue that is just about uh, uh, a partisan politics, is fluoride. We haven't even got fluoride in, the state, in, in, in Brisbane, Brisbane City. Oh, I'm not, I, 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 Senator McLucas, if you heard me, I, I think I did say this wasn't a partisan issue. But you know, Mr Beattie hasn't done anything about it. He certainly hasn't enforced it. We should have done more. And quite frankly, that initiative alone, that initiative alone, Mr Acting Deputy President, not only would save a lot of money, but far more importantly than that, would save um, a lot of pain, discomfort and agony for, uh, for Queenslanders. And that's a very minor thing. It would cost very little, and yet we haven't done it. And it's not a partisan point, but it's something we should have done. I suspect even Senator Allison would, would agree with that. It's something we should do and we haven't done. Now, Senator uh, McLucas did outline the Labor Party's uh, uh, proposal uh, recently enunciated by Mr Rudd. Well, and, and, and speaking about to waiting lists and how the Labor Party is going to assist in, in, in cutting down those waiting lists. Conceptually, that is quite incoherent, that policy. Um, let me just say, um, by way of background, by way of warning, that that is uh, uh, fiscal quicksand. The difference with the coalition policy is that it is conceptually coherent. We think that if someone's dental health, their oral health, impacts upon their general health, which ultimately is a responsibility for Medicare, the general health, therefore the Commonwealth should provide it. Nibbling away, nibbling away the edges of waiting lists will not solve the problem. It won't make, won't make the states take responsibility, and it certainly won't solve the more general issue of chronic disease uh, coming from uh, bad uh, oral, uh, oral care. And that's the major problem. So I don't know what, I don't know what the Labor Party is on about here. Nibbling at the edges, and in, indeed their proposal isn't even as generous as the coalition's proposal on dental care. So it's quite, it's quite an unusual proposal. Not, on, not only is it less generous, but it nibbles at the edges of a huge problem rather than, in fact, engaging with a conceptually coherent policy that the coalition's is. And that is where oral health impacts upon general health, the Commonwealth will take responsibility. Through this bill, the Commonwealth government will provide substantial support to people with chronic conditions such as cancer, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and complex care needs to access dental treatment under Medicare. This will help to improve the oral health of those Australians with long-term serious illness. Passing this legislation will enable eligible Australians to access up to $4,250 in Medicare dental benefits over two consecutive calendar years. And the new arrangements will commence from the 1st of November this year if this bill is passed. Patients will be able to receive Medicare benefits for a comprehensive range of dental treatment from diagnosis, preventive services and fillings to more complex treatments such as major restorative work. Older people requiring dentures will particularly benefit from these new arrangements. And, Mr Acting Deputy President, I note that the Senate Community Affairs Committee has recently considered this bill and concluded that, quote, it's a fundamentally important step in improving access to dental services and care for many Australians. The committee recommended that, of course, uh, this bill be passed. This Medicare initiative is a, is a substantial investment in private dental treatment by the Commonwealth Government of about $385 million over four years. It complements but doesn't replace state and territory government's responsibility to provide public dental services. I should just add, because I was listening carefully to what Senator Allison said before, I just wanted to rem remind uh, Senator Allison, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the new Medicare items complement other initiatives announced in the 2007-2008 federal budget designed to increase access to dental treatment and support the dental workforce. These include investments in a new school of dentistry and oral health at, at Charles Sturt University, more rural clinical placements and dental scholarships for, for Indigenous students. So the government has looked uh, very closely at that. 
Mr Acting Deputy President, the new Medicare items complement other Commonwealth initiatives announced in this year's budget. Together, these initiatives will strengthen dental care in Australia, and I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is, the bill will be now read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those, Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I move uh, Amendment 1 on uh, sheet 5378 on behalf of the Australian Democrats. Uh, this is our standard amendment which would remove the discrimination against same-sex couples which is inherent in, um, in this bill and inherent, I might say, in, as we found in, a, in the inquiry that was conducted um, and the report of which was tabled today in 58 acts uh, as discovered by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission. Uh, it's our view that it's time to end the discrimination against same-sex couples and this bill would have the effect of doing that. I'm sorry, th this amendment, Chair, would have the effect of doing that. Senator McLucas. President, um, I, uh, on behalf of the Labor Party, can I indicate that uh, the Labor Party, consistent with um, practice, uh, we will be supporting uh, this amendment. Um, can I say, uh, whilst uh, we've had a, a view over the question of discrimination against same-sex couples, that we want to have a comprehensive response to that. Uh, but in, uh, and we would do that if we were fortunate enough to gain government of this country. Um, but in this case, uh, uh, we will be supporting this amendment from Senator Allison. While I've got an opportunity, though, can I ask uh, the minister on what basis, where is the logic that says that the teeth of an individual are the responsibility of a state? and yet the rest of the body, the health of the rest of the body of that individual is the responsibility of the Commonwealth. Parliamentary Secretary, yeah. Senator Mason. I'd address both issues, if I might. First, the, the same-sex issue. Senator Allison, um, I, understand, uh, I understand the amendment you're trying to move. Look, I don't think this is the time or the place to address that issue again, but can I simply say that Currently, there are no plans to change current government policy at this time. Let me just leave it at that. Uh, I suspect at a later stage, at some other time, there will be a debate on that issue. In relation to um, uh, Senator McLucas's question about responsibility for health, since Federation, the health of Australians has always been the primary responsibility. Primary health care has been the primary responsibility of state governments. The question is, the amendment moved by Sen Senator Allison. If I could just prompt the minister on his response to my amendment. Um, he says that some other time there will be a debate. Could the minister indicate when the time will be? Parliamentary Secretary. Senator Allison, I am sure that sometime um, uh, in the future of this parliament uh, there will be a, full, a fulsome debate on that particular issue at another time, another place. But not this afternoon. The question is, the amendment. Question. Why Senator McLucas. Minister, why is it then that uh, the Commonwealth funds GP visits, yeah. which one would assume yeah. is primary health, primary health care, but refuses to play its part in the dental health of this nation uh, through uh, uh, cooperatively working with the states? to be able to deliver a comprehensive dental, national dental health plan for this country. Parliamentary Secretary, Senator well, Mr Mason. Chairman, in fact, the Commonwealth didn't until 30 years ago, as you'll know. It didn't. That's a fact. And what happened then, at that time, dentists, the um, dentists in this country decided that they did not want to, in fact, become part of Medicare. That's a historical fact. The question is, the amendment moved by Senator Allison be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Those against, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Health Insurance Amendment Medicare Dental Services Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Parliamentary Secretary. Senator Mason. Mr. Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. Senator Mason. So I move that the bill will now be read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day, Health Legislation Amendment Bill 2007, second reading adjourned debate. Senator McLucas. Mr. Director, Mr. Deputy President, um, I seek leave to incorporate my second reading contribution to this debate. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. The question is, the bill be now read. A second time, or does the parliamentary secretary wish to uh, respond? No, I simply commend the bill of the Senate. To, uh, sorry, give it to president. Question is: The bill be now read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to health and private health insurance and for related purposes. Senator Weber. Mr. Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Or I'm not present. Ring the bell. Lynn's got amendments. Quorum present, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank oh, you. Sorry. Before I call you, Senator Bartlett, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, the bill stand as printed, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Apologise to the Senate for the need to call a quorum. Um, I move the uh, amendments that have been circulated in the name of Senator Allison, as I understand it. 
um, these amendments, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody or certainly shouldn't deal with a topic that anybody is now uh, unaware of. Uh, the Democrats have repeatedly moved amendments uh, of a similar nature countless times over many years. Uh, since the uh, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission tabled their report at the end of June titled Same Sex, Same Entitlements, uh, which specified uh, what in their view was the best way for addressing the widespread discrimination across I think about 58 different pieces of Commonwealth legislation. Uh, discrimination towards people in same-sex relationships. Uh, the Democrats have used that as a template. Uh, we have tried every approach, um, so I, I would make it clear that uh, this isn't just some uh, you know, one-off incident to try and make a point to be inconvenient. We have tried every approach genuinely. Uh, we have tried the omnibus bill. We put forward uh, an omnibus bill as recommended by Herriock, which uh, amended all of those acts. Uh, in a consistent way, applying a consistent definition uh, in regard to same-sex relationships across all of the pieces of legislation identified by the uh, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission report. Uh, we, that bill uh, received such a stonewall that the government wouldn't even support it being sent to a Senate committee for examination, uh, which I must say I remain more than disappointed by, but uh, be that as it may, that's what happened. Um, so there was no opportunity for that to be progressed even that far. Uh, we have thus uh, instead taken the approach of uh, moving amendments using the definition of de facto relationship and same-sex uh, relationship um, as recommended by Herriock uh, to every of the acts, each of the acts identified by Herriock in their report and uh, hence the amendment to this piece of legislation, which is a piece of legislation amending the Health Act, the National Health Act, I think. Uh, so we are simply uh, following through uh, on the recommendation of the Human Rights Legal Opportunity Commission report. Uh, there is a significant, I should make the point, a significant degree of uh, disadvantage experienced by people in same-sex relationships under the Health Act. Um, it does uh, financially disadvantage them uh, purely uh, because their relationship isn't recognised, uh, because it's one of uh, two people of the same gender. Uh, the amendments before us simply equate um, a same-sex relationship as a part of a same uh, coming under the definition of de facto relationship, regardless of whether people are of opposite sex or the same sex, uh, and that is uh, the impact of the amendment and uh, as I say it's an issue we've raised many times before. Uh, it is now uh, in lockstep with the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission's recommended approach, uh, an approach that I would have to say has been supported verbally by many people across all parties including many members of the coalition uh, but as yet has yet to get the support where it matters which is in this chamber amending the law which is where the discrimination remains. Senator McLucas. Deputy President, uh, for the same reasons that we supported this amendment in the last piece of legislation that we dealt with, I can indicate that we will support this amendment as well. Parliament Secretary, Senator Mason. Uh, Mr Chairman, thank you. And can I just say to uh, Senator Bartlett and Senator Allison that um, uh, for what it's worth uh, on this issue, I don't believe that you are grandstanding uh, inappropriately, Senator. But can I just say that the government has uh, no, change, no uh, plans to change the, uh, its policy uh, at this time? The question is, the amendment moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those that opinion, Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I did want to just ask one question of the yes, parliamentary secretary whilst, um, whilst he was here. Uh, on, on the piece of legislation. Uh, I, I didn't do a second reading speech on this, I, but I, I did want to um, just, just seek to ask uh, an issue which was actually raised in a recent uh, committee inquiry, the Committee on Migration's inquiry into temporary visas uh, and the 457 visas. And I'd note in the Bill's Digest on this piece of legislation, 
mentioned that a possible effect of these proposed amendments is that holders of 457 visas may face higher health insurance costs as a result of the removal of the complying health product provisions. And, uh, the issue of health insurance costs was raised uh, in the inquiry that the Joint Standing Committee on Migration uh, held. Uh, I'd just like to ask the Minister, sorry, the Parliamentary Secretary, um, just does such a good job. He's ministerial in all aspects of his demeanour. Um, that um, whether whether the government has examined this potential consequence or whether it will be undertaking any. Um, any activities to monitor this to see whether it does have any impact on not just 457 visa holders, but I think there's a whole range of visa holders, in fact, that do have to take out health insurance as part of their visa criteria. Um, and that can be an expensive undertaking, uh, and whether consideration has been given to those possible impacts. Uh, uh, and if so, is it? Should there be concerns, or, or will it be okay, or just one of those things where we'll have to see how the market evolves, and you'll just give me a commitment that you'll monitor it closely, which I will welcome. In the context you've just raised, that this bill will make no difference, but uh, we will monitor the situation, Senator. Question is: the bill stand is printed. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Health Legislation Amendment Bill of 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Deputy President, thank you. And I, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The, motion is that that, oh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, parliamentary Secretary. Uh, sir, I, I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to health and private health insurance and for related purposes. Government business order of the day, National Health Security Bill 2007, second reading adjourned debate. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to incorporate my contribution to this debate. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, uh, Parliamentary Secretary? Mr. Acting Deputy President, I simply commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A, a bill for an act to provide for national health security and for related pur purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Great Deputy President, I move the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to provide for national health security and for related purposes. The Government Business Order of the Day, Indigenous Education Targeted Assistance Amendment, Cape York Measures Bill 2007. Second reading adjourned debate. Senator Carr. Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to incorporate my remarks and to and once that is, if that is going to formally move the second reading amendment, standing in my name, and which I understand has been distributed in the chamber. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I'd only speak briefly to this legislation, which is uh, indeed a, a non-controversial one. Uh, it provides some uh, extra degree of assistance uh, for uh, Cape York measures uh, in regard to schooling and the like. I would like to note that this is uh, another example of um, the, the curious state of play that's occurred in regard to our Senate committee processes, uh, where comprehensive legislation that's uh, controversial and complicated uh, isn't referred to Senate committees or is referred to committees for ridiculously short and inadequate timeframes, uh, whilst legislation that's extremely straightforward and uh, not controversial at all, uh, gets sent to committees for a, a leisurely examination. Uh, I think uh, you might actually be deputy chair of the relevant committee in question, Mr Acting Deputy President. I note the, um, the, this particular bill was referred by the government to committee, despite nobody uh, from the non-government side actually uh, having any concern about it or thinking that it needed referral. It was referred off. 
Um, and uh, I found it interesting to, um, to note the, uh, the report of the committee on this piece of legislation, uh, which uh, was basically that uh, it concluded that it, um, and I'd, I'd read the final paragraphs of the committee's report, that the committee is surprised to have received uh, this reference, uh, that is the reference of this piece of legislation. Uh, as it has noticed previously, the reference of a supplementary appropriation bill directed at specific programs has only a limited usefulness. The amount of money involved in this particular piece of legislation represents no more than what would be expected um, for the continuation of a policy which the government has previously approved. The committee does not see its role to review a policy which has obvious community support, nor does it see itself as equipped to assess whether the appropriation is sufficient or otherwise for the purpose of the program which is proposed in the bill. However, the committee is not in a position to assess whether the appropriation is sufficient or otherwise for the purpose of the program in the time allowed for the consideration of the bill. Uh, that, I think, is a very polite way of saying uh, what the hell was this bill doing referred to this committee in the first place. Uh, it's, it's inappropriate, it's unnecessary and uh, even in as much as there is any issue for us to consider, we don't have the capacity or the time to look at it. Uh, and that uh, I, I really do need to um, take the opportunity to point out just how perverted our committee process has become uh, with bills that uh, are not appropriate for referral, dealing with a matter that isn't necessary to be examined, um, are sent to committee, and indeed at one stage considerations being given to uh, committee to visit areas of Cape York, which, are, you know, as a Queenslander, I'd like every senator possible to visit Cape York and examine some of the issues there. But you know, coming uh, at the end of the week, where you know, 500 pages of legislation dealing with massive impacts on Aboriginal people across the Northern Territory was railroaded through this place without any opportunity for proper consideration at all, uh, and a one-day hearing on one day's notice uh, in Canberra uh, to then have a bill that dealt with about $2 million of appropriation, I think, from memory, um, given uh, two or three weeks' time for examination and uh, consideration being given to uh, travelling to, to Cape York to look, check things out just shows how, how totally perverted uh, the role of Senate committees has become, and that, I think, is a real shame. Having said that, in terms of the substantive issue of the legislation, uh, it is, a, is, of course, one that uh, the Democrats support, and there's no need, reason not to support it, part of a much wider range of measures uh, that are being implemented in Cape York. Uh, they are, in part, controversial. controversial. I, I certainly um, acknowledge that, and uh, my view as a Queensland Senator and as Democrats Indigenous Affairs spokesperson has been to uh, watch them closely uh, to try and get as much information as possible and I've received briefings from the Cape York Institute about uh, quite a comprehensive plan they've got uh, for a range of measures in that region and uh, as is regularly stated there's our trial and uh, a trial that's being done at least to a reasonable degree uh, with the involvement of people at community level and the uh, intent of trying to uh, empower people locally, get them to take control over the decision making, get ownership of the decision making, restore lines of authority uh, in the communities around the Cape, and to monitor progress uh, and assess it in an evidence based way. Uh, it may be that some of those measures uh, aren't ones that turn out to be effective. Uh, there's some that I'm not convinced will be effective, but I certainly support efforts to give it a go and I certainly support those efforts being properly resourced. Uh, and that is what is being done here. Um, I think it's very unfortunate that what's being done in Cape York is being treated as though it's parallel to what's being done in the Northern Territory, because uh, the similarities are nowhere near as great as the differences. Uh, but we've had the Northern Territory debate a number of times in this place. I won't deal with that here. Uh, so the, the Democrats' position is that uh, this legislation is supported by us. The measures uh, on the whole are welcome and uh, supported by us, particularly in the context of being a trial that's being assessed continually along the way, and particularly with that stated goal of empowering people at local level and involving them in the development and implementation of the program and the decision-making along the way, which is a clear difference from what is being done in the Northern Territory. Um, now, how well that will work is still to be seen, but uh, I think the um, 
measures need to be commended as, uh, as a genuine attempt to develop uh, evidence-based solutions to entrenched problems and to do so in a way that has ownership by people at community level and a clear goal of ending it all with greater empowerment at community level. Uh, and for that reason, the, um, the Democrats uh, congratulate the government for their willingness to provide that support uh, and uh, in the scope and nature that they have. Uh, I just wish that the uh, commitment shown by the government to enthusiastically refer this piece of legislation to a Senate committee when it wasn't controversial is not complex um, and is basically just some extra funding to continue a pre-existing policy had been matched by their desire to enable uh, their much more comprehensive, far-reaching legislation uh, dealing with Aboriginal people elsewhere uh, that, that had also been given the opportunity for some proper examination. A lot of the issues that are seeking to be addressed, of course, we know are similar. There's some differences, but there's some similarities, uh, and particularly if you're talking about the issue of uh, child safety, child sexual abuse, uh, child protection in the Cape. Uh, they are serious problems that have been identified a number of times, uh, not least in uh, reports by uh, Professor Bonnie Robertson uh, some years back. Uh, so uh, that's part and parcel of the landscape which led to and, and has informed some of the actions there. Uh, they were able to do that in Cape York uh, with these measures being uh, able to be uh, scrutinised and debated and examined and uh, developed with the involvement of people at least to some extent at community level. Uh, I still can't see why the same couldn't have been done in the Territory, uh, but we'll continue on with that debate and continue on with trying to get some of those principles married in and folded in in terms of the action in the Territory over time. And I know there's some in the government parties themselves that are keen to get uh, that greater degree of emphasis on some of those issues um, more fully involved with what's happening in the Territory. Uh, but I, I repeat uh, my call and my hope that uh, if there's one thing that uh, hope changes after the election, whoever ends up in government is that the Senate committee process does its job in a much more um, rational and uh, appropriate way than, than has occurred um, far too often uh, in the last year or two. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? A bill for an act to amend the Indigenous Education Targeted Assistance Act 2000 and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Oh, sorry, Minister. I, uh, move the, I, move the, I move the bill be read a third time. The question now is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? An act to amend the Indigenous Education Targeted Assistance Act 2000 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day, Social Security Amendment 2007, Measures No. 1, Bill 2007 and a related bill. Second reading, adjourned debate. Minister? I seek leave to incorporate uh, my summing up speech. Uh, for the previous bill? Indeed. Uh, yes. Is leave granted? Yes. The the, yes, I, I, was, I was moving a bit too quickly, uh, Senator Wong. Um, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, um, Minister. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, just to clarify, um, Mr Deputy President, uh, we are ba debating cognate na measures number one and measures number two. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Well, I wish to address my remarks initially in relation to the 2007 measures number two, Bill 2007. Uh, and I make the point that I think this is the third or fourth Howard Government Welfare, welfare Bill this year. Uh, that we are again debating. Uh, and I note that it wasn't long ago that the Howard government claimed it had reformed welfare in Australia, and yet here we are with yet another bill. Uh, but yet again, we see just in recent weeks uh, reports of further attempts of, at welfare reform being hooked up by Minister Hockey. Uh, the simple fact is that when it comes to social security policy, the Howard government has got it wrong for 11 long years and they still cannot figure out how to get it right. And that is because time after time this government goes for a short-term political fix rather than a plan for Australia's long-term future. 
As a result, Australia still has low participation rates when compared with our competitors, and we still have two million Australians who are officially unemployed, working part-time but wanting more work than they can get, or who want to work but do not show up in the monthly unemployment figures. Also as a result of the Howard government's failure to plan for Australia's long-term future, we have a skills crisis in this country. We have businesses desperate for skilled workers, a direct result of the Howard government's failure to plan ahead and failure to train Australians, particularly the available jobless Australians, for the available jobs. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to emphasise Labor has a different approach. We do believe that people who can work should work. And we believe that those who can't work should be cared for. We believe that work is a foundation of social inclusion. Everybody benefits when more people can participate in the social and economic mainstream. Labor's approach to workforce participation is to identify the reasons why some people aren't participating as much as they could or would like to and to deliver practical solutions. And I want to address for one briefly uh, the plan recently announced by, Na by uh, Labor leader Kevin Rudd to create Skills Australia. This body will play a central role to ensure we lock in a full employment economy and develop a high-skilled and innovative workforce for the future. It will assess evidence from commissioned research and industry stakeholders uh, to inform Australia's workforce development needs. It will provide government with recommendations about the future skill needs of the economy and the country. It will identify skill shortages so they can be addressed before they ne I should apologize. It will identify future skill shortages so they can be addressed before they negatively impact on economic activity. Persistent skill shortages so that current capacity blockages can be overcome and barriers that, ex that prevent skill formation in areas where persistent skill shortages exist. We will also identify industries where retraining and upskilling of workers may be required to prevent unemployment, underemployment and skills obsolescence. In making its recommendations to government, Skills Australia will have a, a regard to a range of factors. These include the objective of achieving full employment, the international competitiveness of the Australian economy, the promotion of innovation through skills acquisition, providing a sufficient number of appropriately qualified workers for industries of critical national importance and the role of state and regional economies in contributing to the success of the broader Australian economy. Mr Acting Deputy President, in a survey of more than 760 producers by the Australian Industry Group entitled Australia's Skills Gap, Costly, Wasteful and Widespread, it was found that one in two businesses were experiencing difficulties in obtaining skilled labour. Monash's Centre, University Centre for the Economics of Education and Training has estimated that more than four million additional people will need to acquire qualifications from 2006 to 2016. <clears throat> this includes more than two million new entrants and 1.7 million existing workers. Of these, 61.4 per cent will need a vocational education and training qualification and 38.6 per cent a higher education qualification. The simple reality is that businesses are desperate for skilled staff and people only get a job if they have the skills an employer needs. But yet again, with this bill, another opportunity passes to help jobless Australians obtain skills. Beyond this bill, this government has no plan to match future, current and future needs for skilled workers with the people who could be working. Instead, what we see in this bill is the usual random assortment of measures. Now, I do want to emphasise at the outset there is one measure here that Labor strongly supports, exempting relatives from participation requirements if they are the primary carers of children. On the basis of this measure, we will be supporting the bill, and we consider this exemption long overdue. The child, under the amendments, the child must be directed to live with a person under either a parenting order made under the Family Law Act, a state child order or overseas child order which are registered under that act, and the person must be complying with that order. Where those relatives are single principal carers, the bill also ensures that they have access to the higher available rate of payment, the parenting payment single. Relatives who have taken responsibility for the care of children are providing invaluable support to their family and their community, and we must support them. 
It is worth noting, however, that some community advocates, particularly those who made submissions to the Senate inquiry in this matter, have argued that eligibility for these exemptions should be extended further to include other circumstances where a relative of a child may become a principal carer without court orders being made. Indeed, the approach in this bill contradicts the government's move towards parenting plans and family relationship centres as alternative to family courts. It would be worth hearing from the minister how they he, the government justifies the narrowness of the exemption which is contained in the bill. Nevertheless, these, this aspect of the bill is quite unlike most of the Howard government's so-called welfare-to-work agenda, which, as you know, uh, actually makes it harder for Australians who are struggling to achieve financial independence. And there are other, uh, other aspects of the bill which continue in this vein. The Howard government appears intent on making life harder for people with a disability. One of the measures contained in the, the bill replaces, removes medical officers from the assessment of a person's capacity to work. The, this dramatic change was one of the reasons Labor sought a Senate inquiry into this bill. And I want to quote briefly from a couple of the submissions which were made to that inquiry. The Mental Health Council of Australia submitted to the inquiry that taking, uh, replacing a medical officer with uh, a job capacity assessor in the assessment process, and I quote, could have damaging unintended consequences for the person with mental illness. The Australian Federation of Disability Organisations was similarly concerned with the implications of this bill, saying that even under existing arrangements, and I quote, people whose impairments are not visible have been inappropriately assessed by people with poor knowledge or appreciation of the impact of their condition on their capacity to work, the supports they need to work and the range of work they can realistically undertake. Given this current predicament, disability advocates are concerned about the impact of removing the limited remaining role of medical officers from this process. Labor believes there is a role for medical opinion in the job capacity assessment process. And I will indicate uh, that we will move amendments to delete the items from the bill in the committee stage which remove medical officers from the assessment of impairment. <clears throat> the bill also reinforces the role of the job capacity assessment in another way. It replaces the guidelines for making these work capacity assessments from those made by the Secretary with guidelines set out in the legislative instrument by the Minister. The Secretary will be required to comply with these guidelines, as will the Social Security Appeals Tribunal and the AAT. So, whilst Labor acknowledges and understands the concern that, that some in the disability community have about the guidelines, and in particular how detailed and prescriptive they will be, we do support the increased ability of Parliament to scrutinise the guidelines as a legislative instrument. However, these guidelines have not been released and Labor will watch very closely to ensure they do not make life harder for people with a disability. This bill, like all the welfare to work bills put forward by this government, does not address Australia's participation challenges. Clearly, the Howard government doesn't actually understand the scale of the participation challenge. What this government hope simply relies on is that the mining boom will continue forever. But as we know, no boom lasts forever, and a prudent government would invest in Australia's people, would invest in Australia's people in order to secure our ongoing and future prosperity. Australia needs a long-term approach to workforce participation and welfare reform. Uh, an approach that tackles the reasons why some people aren't working and delivers practical solutions. Uh, I have indicated Labor at the committee stage will move to amendments to this bill. However, I will flag that ultimately Labor will support this bill principally because we support the amendments from participation requirements for relatives who are caring for children. I want to speak briefly in relation, because uh, we're in cognate debate, to 2007 Measures No. 1 Bill. Uh, this uh, bill makes a number of minor changes to social security law, most of which most pro provide more access to financial assistance. Uh, it does provide some additional support to parents who have been adversely affected by, recently, by the recently implemented welfare changes uh, and, amongst other things, enables the non-primary carer to access a higher rate of income support uh, than has previously been available. There are, in, in addition, uh, there are enhancements to the provision of mobility allowance. It is unfortunate that the government did not include those previously as part of the original welfare to work package. Mm -hmm. Uh, the enhancement of access to supplementary payments for recipients of parenting payment partnered who have a partial capacity for work and a range of um, 
changes to participation rules relating to mature age unemployed job seekers. Uh, again, I indicate uh, that Labor will be supporting this legislation uh, primarily because of some of the uh, additional benefits contained in it. If I could just briefly comment on the, the, my, the report into no measures number two bill, uh, I do want to <coughs> uh, emphasise uh, uh, that this was a very short inquiry process because obviously with the government's uh, restrictive timetabling of this legislation and its desire to get this through uh, in this session of parliament. We were very restricted in the amount of um, uh, inquiry that could be undertaken and, in fact, the committee determined that no uh, public hearings could be undertaken. Uh, can I indicate uh, our thanks to the I think it was 11 community organisations who at short notice provided uh, input into this bill. Uh, they were uh, particularly given uh, how short notice, what sh how short the notice was that was provided. Uh, we were most appreciative of their input, uh, and they can be assured, certainly from the opposition's perspective, uh, that some of the issues that they raised were taken into account in formulating the opposition's position on this bill. In particular, we note. Uh, as I said, the concern that was raised about the removal of the phrase medical officer uh, from some aspects of the assessment process. Uh, we, we share the concerns of the organisations who made submissions in relation to that issue. I do want to make a brief comment about one of the concerns raised by uh, submitters to the inquiry in relation to um, uh, including replacing existing administrative guidelines with ministerial guidelines contained in legislative instruments. And there was quite a significant amount of concern which was raised uh, by these community groups and representative groups about that. Uh, I understand the concerns which were raised. Uh, they primarily relate to a concern that this would affect appeal rights and review rights uh, that, and also a fear about what would be contained in the guidelines, which obviously affects, may have affected, may affect people's rights, may be overly prescriptive uh, or unduly harsh. These were some of the, the concerns raised. Can I say, just taking a step back from the opposition's perspective, uh, we are not opposed in principle to uh, issues being included in ministerial guidelines contained in legislative instruments. We note uh, that. In fact, there is the capacity for greater public scrutiny because legislative instruments can be disallowed in this chamber or in the other place. Uh, and in fact, one of our criticisms earlier um, of the government's original bill uh, was that um, <clears throat> there was far too much which had been taken out of the Act and guide, and, and uh, sorry, there was far too much been taken out of the Act and placed in the guide. Uh, and my recollection is the Senate Committee inquiry actually identified some of the concerns with the transparency of that process uh, and uh, the, the, the placing within uh, uh, instruments which were not to be considered by Parliament of issues affecting people's rights. Uh, so, as a matter of principle, uh, Labor is not opposed to these matters being included in, these, in this situation in legislative instruments, uh, but we do, as I said at the outset, uh, put the government on notice that um, uh, we would uh, inspect most closely and consult with community groups uh, in relation to uh, the content of such legislative instruments. Uh, can I flag, Mr Deputy President, that uh, uh, I propose to move two second reading amendments, one in relation to measures number one and one in relation to measures number two. I understand those will shortly be circulated in the chamber, or they have been circulated in the chamber, uh, and um, I so move um, the second reading amendments to both bills. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Seward. Acting Deputy, Pre uh, Mr. De Acting Deputy, Deputy President. Um, these two bills, the Social Security Amendments um, 2007 Measures Number 1 Bill and the Social Security Amendments um, 2007 Measures Number 2 Bill, re represent a mix of measures, some of which are broadly beneficial to, um, some, specific, to some specific groups and others that have attracted um, considerable criticism, particularly from organisations representing people with disabilities. These bills must be considered within the context of the laws that they seek to amend, and that is the government's welfare-to-work laws, which specifically introduced harsher measures for single parents and people with, dis with disabilities, 
and other um, Australians. These are laws that end up punishing the very people who we believe our welfare system should be helping the most. The Australian Greens welcome the beneficial aspects of these two bills. Um, these include um, the amendments to recognise kinship care and extended um, participation exemptions to principal carers um, who are relatives but not parents of children, to extend the mobility allowance, to extend benefit to benefits to partnered parenting payment recipients and to extend the entitlement to the dependent child um, maximum rate of payment where a person, provide, a person provides at least 14 per cent of care. The fact the government belatedly recognised that these, for me, these amendments helps demonstrate the flaws in the approach of the governments, um, of the governments which are inherent in the welfare-to-work laws. Having implemented such a punitive re regime and having rushed the laws um, through this parliament with insufficient time to adequately assess its impact and for, community and for community consultation, the government repeatedly finds itself in the, pro in the position of needing to make these sorts of amendments, which seem to be more or less on an ad hoc basis, as they realise the depth of the concern and the problems with, this, with their legislation. They need to act to rectify some of the edges of the extreme harshness of, these, um, Im of the impacts of these laws and the knock-on effects um, on, on particular groups of people. The Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures No. 1 Bill is broadly beneficial to the extent that it's mostly fixing holes in the welfare-to-work laws. Is the exemption is that, in, in, is that in the respect of the amendments to the youth allowance prov provisions, which once, which once again um, where once again the government, we believe, is being um, taking a very punitive approach um, to welfare. I will be moving amendments to this bill that amend the definition of family law order to be consistent with amendments I will be moving to the Social Security Amendments 2007 Measures No. 2 bill. The primary focus of my comments today, however, will be on the No. 2 bill and its amendments regarding principal carers, changes to disability support pensions, pension provisions and the amendments to section 12 of the Social Security Act. In terms of um, principal carers, as the Senate is very well aware by now, the issue of definition of principal carers is one that I have had concerns um, about from the beginning of the, from the very start and introduction of the welfare to work laws. As I have said in this place on numerous occasions, I will keep raising this issue until it is fixed by government. This bill does not fix the problem. Although it does make a welcome amendment, it, addre it ad addresses one issue that, again, I've been raising um, since the introduction of these laws. It does not fix some of the more in-depth concerns that we have about principal carers. The bill provides for an extension of participation exemptions to principal carers who are relatives but not parents of children, where the principal carer is providing care for a child as a result of a family law order as defined in the Act. These amendments would allow the person in this new category of a relative, who is a principal carer but not a parent, to access the higher PPS rate of New Start or Youth Allowance. The Australian Greens are pleased that the government is finally recognising the role of kinship care through these amendments. However, while we welcome the intent of these amendments, we are concerned they do not go far enough to effectively address the reality of kinship carers' circumstances. For example, there is a need to recognise less, less formal arrangements than those that fall under the definition of a family law order. The, Nation, the National Welfare Rights Network commented in their submission to the inquiry, there exist many circumstances where a relative of a child may become a principal carer without court orders being made. The narrow scope of the definition as detailed in this item under, undermines the utility and the appeal of parenting plans that include non-parents and stands in direct contrast to the current policy, policy and legislative drive towards parenting plans and family relationship centres as alternatives to family courts. In many kinship care arrangements, family members who care for a child do not have a family law order or, where, or, or in circumstances where there's protracted family law processes are still ongoing. They still face exactly the same demands as those with a formal order, and yet they can still be subject to the onerous activity requirements under these amendments. There is no justification for this discrepancy, particularly where the government is encouraging um, repeat that, is encouraging less formal arrangements through the establishment of family relationship centres. These informal care arrangements are also particularly important in Aboriginal communities. It is less likely that in Aboriginal care communities, care arrangements by relatives will be formalised through family court orders or, or even the less formal parenting plans. 
it is much more usual for grandparents or other family members to take, to, to, to take care of children on an informal yet ongoing basis. These amendments from the government do not address this situation and continue to leave people disadvantaged while caring for children. With this in mind, I will be moving an amendment to the definition of family law order to widen its scope to recognise less formal care arrangements. I might add that are then consistent with other, um, with other um, requirements under FAXIA for, family, for child care benefits and for family tax benefits. We are very disappointed that the government has not taken this opportunity to fix the broader problems with principal carers. The Australian Greens also believe that the, that the government should use this opportunity to address the broader principal care inequities. Principal care inequities. That is the contradiction between the presumption of equal shared care within the Family Law Act and the definition of a single parent carer within the Social Security Act. And while I risk boring the chamber yet again with this argument, obviously I have to repeat it again because the government hasn't got it yet. We have outlined this inequity in the past ad nauseum, I believe, and will continue to draw attention to the Senate until it's fixed. For the purpose of income support, the government says that there can only be one principal carer, and that person is responsible for the care of the child. If you are nominated the principal carer, you then receive certain benefits under the welfare to work laws, whereas if you are the other parent in a shared, in a shared parenting arrangement, you receive exactly the same entitlements as someone with no parenting responsibilities. The problem is that at the same time in, in introducing virtually the same time as introducing the welfare to work laws, the government made changes to the family, to family um, law, which moved to a model of equal shared care as the preferred social model. This is resulting in an increasing number of parents with 50-50 shared, care, shared caring arrangements, with an income support system under which only one parent in a 50-50 shared care arrangement can be determined to be the principal carer. This is manifestly unjust and the biggest losers are the children who are caught in the middle. We will, we will see an increasing number of people coming forward who, are nom who nominally have 50-50 shared care arrangements, but in reality, in reality sharing an unequal part of the, pa of the pa parental care burden, because their shared care has not been recognised through the principal care provisions of welfare to work. They are suffering and their children are suffering as a result of the government not recognising that the move to a presumption of shared care within the family law system must, it must be properly recognised within the income support system. The current situation is leading to disadvantage in the lives of many Australian children. I will once again be moving amendments to the definition of principal carer so that it is aligned with the intent of the family law changes. That, that they, and so that they reflect the concept of shared parenting, such that where parents are sharing the care of children, each receive income support, and each receive income support, then the, and the difference is in the, in the percentage of child care, of care arrangements is, is 12 per cent or less, that they should be both deemed to be principal carers. I'll keep bringing this amendment until this inequity is fixed. I'd like to move on to the changes to the disability support pension. There are two key issues with the proposed changes to the disability support pension. Firstly, the power given to the minister to make guidelines by legislative instrument relating to the determination of a, of a person's continuing inability to work and the application of impairment ratings, the partial capacity to work and incapacity exemptions. And secondly, the changes to allow imper impairment ratings to be made by non-medical qualified assessors. The Senate inquiry received a number of submissions from disability groups expressing concerns over both these changes. First, I'd like to address the ministerial guidelines. The main concern expressed by disability groups on the issue of the minister setting guidelines by legislative instrument is the fear that such a change will restrict the discretion of the initial job as capacity assessments um, and the Social Security Appeals Tribunal, the SAT and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal in reviewing the merits of, of um, assessments. The Australian Greens share these concerns. Given that the proposed amendments provide that the secretary, the secretary must comply with the guidelines determined by the minister, the ability of the secretary or a job capacity assessor, assessor to take particular individual circumstances into account, we believe and are concerned, may be reduced. Discretion would necessarily be circumscribed by the fact of a legislative in instruments setting out the guidelines. The issues to be addressed in capacity assessments are highly complex and, and accurate assessments require a high degree of discretion. 
Job capacity assessors are required to make dis um, um, distinctions between a person's ability to work less than 8, 15 or 30 hours per week. The discretion to take into account individual circumstances outside prescriptive legislative guidelines is vital for accurate and credible assessments. The Australian Greens are opposed to the idea of the Minister unilaterally creating guidelines for work capacity assessments. We believe that the creation of guidelines of this nature needs to be involved in a public consultation process to ensure that any such guidelines are both credible and transparent. Given the great variation in individual circumstances and the corresponding complexity of the impacts and interactions of various disabilities on individuals' capacity to work, we believe it's important that capacity assessment guidelines recognise that the experience and expertise of the assessor is a crucial factor, that they, and that they do not seek to be too pers prescriptive, and that they, that they recognise the importance of expert discretion in capacity assessment. The Greens will be moving amendments to oppose these um, specific provisions of the bill. I'd like to move to the second main issue with, the changes, uh, with, the, with respect to the changes of the DSP, which relates to the replacement of medical officers with assessors in the, in the context of the impairment tables. The key concern with these amendments um, is that it will make it even less likely that the job capacity assessment process will result in accurate assessments. This is likely to have significant consequences for, per, for persons accessing DSP. The Greens are very concerned about the consequences of these amendments. We do not believe it is appropriate to remove the presumption that medical officers should conduct certain assessments of a person's impairment rating. The ACOS submission to the, um, as previously um, uh, noted, short Senate inquiry provides examples of where there should be a presumption, a presumption of a medical officer undertaking these assessments, because non-medical qualified professionals would be unlikely to make the expert assessments required. These examples include assessing the likely effects of medical treatment and, and assessing pain or fatigue in terms of the underlying medical conditions which causes the pain or fatigue. These amendments are particularly likely to have a detrimental impact on people with mental illness. Professionally trained medical officers are best placed to make a decision about the impact of mental illness on a person's capacity to work. This is particularly the case because many people with a mental illness may have a fluctuating capacity to work. The Medical Health Council of Australia commented to the Senate inquiry that determining the ability of a person with mental illness to work can be a very complex process and it is not as simple as referring to a table and applying points. A person may present well on the day of assessment but then experience a relapse of their condition. This will not be picked up in the assessment if the assessor does not have the nece necessary medical information or an understanding of the medical illness. The Australian Greens are not suggesting that there is no role for a non-medical job ass capacity assessors, and we recognise that job capacity assessors come with a wide range of allied health from a wide range of allied health professionals. However, we believe there is no good reason for these amendments, and we are concerned about their direct consequences on the quality and consistency of impairment assessments. We will be moving amendments to oppose these provisions, um, replacing the term medical officer with assessor. I'd like now to turn to amendments to section 12. Section 12 allows the secretary to deem a person to have made a claim for a different income support payment when a person becomes qualified for it. The amendments to section 12 provide that there can be no claims resulting from that section more than 13 weeks prior to a determination under that section. The Greens can see no good reason why the 12-week restriction is necessary. We agree with the National Welfare Rights Network that the application of section 12 as a means of relieving debt is reasonable, particularly given the unfairness of many Centrelink debts and the limitations of their waiver. We will be moving an amendment to admit the 13-week restriction on the application of section 12. The Greens remain steadfastly opposed to the government's welfare-to-work legislation. We believe it is unnecessarily harsh, harsh, badly targeted and will ultimately prove ineffective in helping people move from, wel from welfare to the workforce. The laws focus on reducing income support and rely on coercive measures that un that and, un sorry, and unduly harsh penalties to force people into the workforce, rather than providing incentives, training and support. The majority of people affected by these measures face substantial barriers to work that are not being addressed. Many lack the skills necessary to meet current job market demands and, there have, been and, had, and have had insufficient training programs to help them. Enough employment assistance 
There is not enough employment assistance programs to support them or they're poorly targeted, and there's, and there's definitely not enough accessible childcare places available to help look after their kids. I have repeatedly raised examples in this place, for example, of the impact of the changes to the JET system to single mothers accessing training and education and the fact that that has now been limited to a 12-month period and how women are now dropping out of university because they cannot afford to keep their kids in childcare. We believe that fixing these measures should be a priority. The measures in these two bills are an acknowledgement the government recognises that there are holes in the laws that people are falling through. The very people that we believe we should be supported um, to help them um, find work and to cope. We believe that these, uh, these laws uh, unfairly penalise those that the community and society should be helping the most. We know there are many problems with this legislation and gaps in the safety net, and we will continue to work to establish an income support system that is based on empowerment rather than coercion. And as part of a whole of government approach, we believe that needs to be taken to invest in the future of the people of our community. Thank you. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Senate is debating two pieces of Social Security Amendment legislation together. Um, and there is also uh, an amendment from the Democrats uh, regarding removal of discrimination in same-sex couples that uh, have circulated. I'll speak to that in the committee stage of the debate. I won't deal with it in the second reading stage. There's a, a range of measures in these bills. The previous two speakers have gone through them uh, in a fair bit of detail. I don't want to revisit them all extensively. Uh, I do think, particularly at this juncture, as we're moving into uh, an election, it is important uh, to emphasise some of the areas where flaws remain in our social security safety net and indeed areas where I believe uh, the safety net has been weakened and uh, things have got worse in recent times. Uh, the Democrats remain of the view that the uh, A core component of the so-called welfare to work changes uh, were flawed and unfair and remain so. Uh, of course we support shifting people from welfare onto work and we support extra resources going into uh, making people more work ready. Indeed, I don't believe the government does enough of that. Uh, there is too much of the um, punitive approach and the aspect of the so-called welfare to work package uh, that uh, actually has ended up in uh, a range of people receiving lower income support payments than they otherwise would uh, is not a way of assisting them into work. Uh, what it has done is it's shifted some of them from welfare onto uh, a more harsh form of welfare. But it also highlights one of the continuing and more and more entrenched problems in our social security system. And uh, it really is disappointing that to date there's been no real sign of a, a commitment from the part of the Labor Party to address this entrenched problem. Uh, and that is the, the entrenched and growing gap between um, uh, the, the pension type payments and the, the allowances. And that's basically the motivation behind a key part of the government's so-called welfare to work package, was to shift a whole group of people onto that lower payment. Uh, and part of that is also not just the payment level, but the, uh, the uh, effective marginal tax rate that's attached to it, or the withdrawal rate of the, the low free areas, income, uh, free income areas that are contained in those payments uh, that have inbuilt disincentives uh, against people uh, shifting into the workforce. But, so we actually have uh, changes be that have been made that have increased the disincentives for people to try and start moving into the workforce uh, because for many people, particularly those that have been on welfare for a prolonged period of time, uh, it isn't just a matter of one day waking up and having a, a full-time well-paid job that you can just shoot straight into. Uh, in many cases, as part of making people work ready, uh, it is uh, adjusting to the nature of the labour market, the nature of a steady job, and that does mean temporary work, casual work, part-time work. Uh, and when you have uh, a real inbuilt disincentive with the withdrawal rates, the high effective marginal tax rates, uh, then uh, that is a, a disincentive. Now, you know, there have been some improvements in that area in some respects, and I don't dispute that, but the, the core problem remains. And indeed, even with the so-called welfare to work provisions, that was meant to be one of the the positive components of it, but um, 
the payment rates and income test provisions for sole parents and people with a partial capacity to work uh, were changed and a new income test was introduced for allowance level payments uh, which retained the old uh, initial free area but increased the next threshold. Uh, so while the withdrawal rate was reduced from 70 cents in the dollar to 60 cents in the dollar, uh, which is an improvement, uh, the, uh, because their basic free area was reduced down by being shifted onto the lower payment, uh, they actually had a, for many of them, depending on total amounts worked, uh, total income earned, they actually ended up um, with a bigger disincentive. Uh, the whole area does really need an overhaul and uh, it's a real shame. I think we've, we've basically moved too far away from some of the core principles that were outlined in the, the McClure report the, when uh, the term welfare reform actually did have some meaning to it. And that's many years ago now. Uh, and some of those, those key issues uh, in regard to built-in uh, inequalities in the welfare system and the, the gaps between different types of payment have now become so entrenched and, and are getting worse with each indexation. Uh, I'm not sure that it can ever be reversed without a very comprehensive overhaul and so currently certainly don't see any political will in that area. Uh, the Democrats support many of the measures contained in these two pieces of legislation but it, it is an opportune time to point to some of the areas where there does need to be some significant shifts and that's a message we send to both um, the major parties because as I say in many cases there's no particular sign of monumental differences here and indeed as I understand it despite Labor's appropriate position of uh, opposing some key aspects of the so-called welfare to work changes, uh, they're now going to keep them. Uh, so it's, it's a bit hard to get uh, too enthused about their opposition uh, if they're now going to keep the things they're opposed to. Uh, and that is a reminder of one of the core lessons that um, one can see when you look at uh, the reality of how the legislative process works is uh, once something does become put into law it is actually quite hard to reverse. Uh, it gets built into the system, it gets built into the finances, it gets built into the budgetary process, it gets built into the administrative process, it gets built into people's expectations and operations and it's just pretty hard to wind back and uh, that's part of the problem with some of the things that have been done um, over a prolonged period of time but particularly in the last few years. The uh, amendment bill number one includes some amendments uh, that are positive and uh, they are amendments that really go to fixing up some of the problems that were brought in with the initial so-called welfare to work changes. Um, I note in the second reading speech of the Minister in introducing this speech they say that these, um, these reforms ensure even greater fairness, to quote. Uh, well, in some respects that wouldn't be terribly hard to get greater fairness because it's not very fair to start with. Uh, so uh, even greater fairness I'd suggest is a bit of a hyperbole from the government. But anything that moves things forward uh, is, and does make things fairer is, is um, welcome. And the, the government has also described these as uh, ensuring a greater equity between groups with similar needs. Uh, and again, that is welcome, but I would suggest uh, there's still an enormous amount of inequity entrenched in uh, our social security laws. Uh, the first legislation, Amendment Bill Number 1, or 2007 Measures Number 1 Bill, uh, also includes um, uh, changes to the youth allowance, uh, ensuring a fast connection with employment assistance and uh, attempts to have greater engagement with the labour market. Uh, again, I would suggest that uh, reducing some of the disincentives for people to undertake work in the first place, whether younger people or others, would be uh, a desirable action, but it does give me the uh, cause to mention some of the other issues in regards to debt and payment problems that exist specifically for young people. And one of those is the fact that there are, um, Excuse me. there's a youth allowance student and a youth allowance other uh, job search type of payment, uh, and because they're just called youth allowance, there's a lot of confusion uh, amongst younger people who don't realise that uh, they have to shift from uh, youth allowance study to youth allowance other. Uh, when they change study, particularly if they're shifting between part-time study and full-time study, um, different levels of work and those sorts of things. That's something that more and more happens these days and happened back in my day. Indeed, it's something I did uh, in the 1980s, shifting between full-time work and part-time work. Um, and to when you've got a payment with a single name of youth allowance, then it does 
uh, lead to a greater probability of confusion. And certainly, it's a problem that's been identified by the Welfare Rights Network, who I'd suggest has a better idea than any of us here about what the real consequences of all of the social security laws that we pass through here are, because they deal with all of the problems that occur when people fall through the cracks or, or hit the hurdles. Uh, there remains a continuing problem with the uh, ridiculously high age of independence for youth allowance and the unrealistically low parental income test free area and taper rate. You know, I'd, I'd note and welcome again the uh, separate measure that was passed, I think, earlier today from memory. Um, finally, introducing um, rent assistance for, for people uh, on uh, Ostudy, and that's a campaign the Democrats have pushed for many years, and we, we, welcome, we welcome that. Uh, but there is still a, a very um, unfair treatment of many young people in regard to youth allowance. Uh, the Democrats have moved for many years for the uh, age of independence to be reduced down from its current high level of 25 years of age. Uh, the parental income test uh, has been, um, is also, I think, far too low. Uh, the very high levels of uh, poverty and financial stress among students is something that um, there's widespread evidence of. If we are looking at trying to encourage people to uh, increase their skills to uh, undertake study or further training, then we need to be removing some of the barriers and impediments, and that some of them are still very much in place. Uh, it, it uh, of course, appears as a cost in the budget in the short term when you uh, do things like reduce the age of independence or uh, make the parental income test fairer, but I'd suggest that uh, longer term, and we don't always think longer term in Treasury or in uh, Parliament in general, uh, the uh, wider benefits to the community by more people being able to afford to study uh, afford to expand and develop their skills uh, would pay off uh, in the long run. Uh, there is uh, also real continuing problems with the indexation uh, of payments like youth allowance and OS study and AB study. Uh, they are only indexed once a year uh, and they are only indexed to the consumer price index uh, and the income free area for these payments hasn't been indexed for almost 30 years. Uh, so its value has obviously declined dramatically. Um, this compares to pension payments which increase twice a year um, in real terms, uh, according to movements in average weekly earnings or the CPI, if it's higher, uh, and that I might say is a uh, indexation measure that the Democrats responsible, are responsible for implementing. So certainly, I'm not criticising that, but I do point out that uh, because it's not, and we weren't able to get it tied to all income support payments, then it means the gap there gets higher and higher, and uh, the real value uh, of payments such as uh, youth allowance and the like get lower and lower. And that compounds some of the other problems I mentioned with the cuts in the age of independence. Uh, the uh, legislation, the first bill, also addresses issues to do with partner parenting payment recipients and uh, issues to do with people with the shared care of a child. Um, the second piece of legislation, um, also relating to issues to do with care of a child, and Senator Seward outlined uh, a lot of those issues in great detail and certainly commend uh, her efforts uh, in the issues that she raised there. And, uh, will raise in the committee stage of the debate uh, in regard to uh, the amendments that have been circulated. Uh, I'd note there again a, a clear example where uh, under the change in the second bill that the single uh, principal carers receiving new start allowance or youth allowance who are, are eligible for this new exemption um, for some principal carers will access a higher rate of payment for the duration of the exemption. That higher rate is equivalent to the parenting payment single. Uh, and that is a, just a clear example of the, the benefit of having uh, access to that uh, higher rate, the parenting payment single rate, as opposed to the new start allowance rate. Uh, and I, I again think that that gap uh, between those two rates is a problem. Uh, the second piece of legislation also deals with uh, trying to improve the efficiency of people transferring between one income support payment and another. Uh, and certainly, if that works in in such a fashion that it's welcome, uh, and uh, new guidelines regarding assessments of partial capacity to work. Uh, and uh, as with the development of any of these sorts of guidelines, they do need to be monitored very closely. Uh, there is uh, an inbuilt incentive uh, for guidelines to be uh, both um, finalised and developed, or developed and finalised, and also administered and implemented in a way that uh, 
minimises expenditure, uh, to put it politely. And uh, we should not forget uh, that whilst uh, budgetary expenditure is important and effective and fair and efficient use of public resources is of course important, uh, we are dealing with uh, human beings here. We are dealing with real people, not dollars and cents. And uh, withdrawals of payments or cuts in payments uh, can have uh, very dramatic impacts on people, particularly when they're people who are already, in many cases, amongst uh, the poorest in our society. Uh, the second bill also makes a technical amendment to clarify that waiver of a social security debt recovery due to special circumstances is not available to a person who knowingly fails or omits to comply with social security law. And this, to me, raises another issue. I'm not uh, opposing that part of the legislation per se, but it, it does uh, highlight another continuing trend, which is despite all the talk of mutual obligation, uh, that, uh, a great catchphrase that's uh, almost impossible to argue against on its face, uh, but the trouble is the reality doesn't match uh, the face. Uh, it implies an equal partnership, equal levels of responsibility, uh, and the simple fact is that uh, it, the balance is right out of kilter. Uh, the level of obligation and responsibility on uh, income support recipients is enormous. Uh, the level of responsibility on Centrelink and the government is minimal. Uh, so there is a continual tightening time after time after time uh, on the uh, recipients and very little accountability, I'd argue, when Centrelink makes mistakes. And uh, this is a key area that the Welfare Rights Network have identified uh, when, uh, and in including in the areas of wavering, waivers of debts. Uh, in the matter of Social Security debt, um, Centrelink can be 99 per cent responsible for the cause of a debt but won't waive it because of a 1 per cent contributory error, error of the customer. And this encourages a no-care, no-responsibility attitude. Uh, that's not only unfair, I think it, it uh, facilitates uh, against good public administration. Uh, the, uh, need, the, I think there's a need to uh, make Centrelink at least partially responsible for some of their own errors. Uh, the Welfare Rights Network produced any number of case studies of people in terrible hardship uh, where clearly the, the predominant fault has been on the part of Centrelink uh, and yet there's been a refusal to um, uh, waive any debt. And even with this amendment in this measures number two bill, uh, we've got a further tightening there in regards to uh, any prospect of wavering, <coughs> waiving a debt. Um, there's also, uh, in regard to the continuing problem of uh, family tax benefits debts, um, even when there's uh, Centrelink as a sole administrative error is proven, that's still not enough uh, to have the debt waived, and there must also be severe financial hardship uh, demonstrated, and that I suggest is simply unfair. Uh, there is a, um, a, a also a concern about the so-called good faith debt waiver provisions for a debt to be waived. It's also necessary, among other things, for any overpayment to have been, uh, quote, received in good faith. And uh, the uh, way that's being interpreted um, is uh, such that, uh, again, I think it's being unnecessarily harsh on people who have uh, basically not done anything wrong and who are basically the victim of uh, Centrelink stuff-ups. And given the complexity of the legislation, I must say, it is inevitable there will be Centrelink stuff-ups. As I've mentioned a number of times in this place, I was previously employed by uh, Centrelink's predecessor, the Department of Social Security. Uh, I was a social worker in that department and uh, you tended to get uh, a lot of the cases where people didn't fit into the boxes neatly or where there'd been stuff-ups uh, and uh, the hard cases uh, that get uh, pushed aside to the social worker. And uh, that's still the role that social workers play to some extent. Not just that, but that's part of their role uh, today in that sort of income support arena. Uh, but the law, I'd suggest, since then has become uh, even more complex, and uh, the uh, scope for people to ensure that their rights are fulfilled uh, in this area is more diminished. Uh, and I'd certainly uh, support calls for much greater support for independent advice services, such as Welfare Rights Network and through community legal centres, uh, because even when people have been wronged, uh, it's very hard for them to get access to the support they need to uh, get a fair go, to get um, recompense. Um, and when you're dealing with people who are on income support payments, uh, even small amounts of money can make a massive difference. Uh, and let's not forget we're talking in a context here of the biggest housing affordability crisis uh, in Australia. 
uh, in, um, in modern history and we have uh, many people who are really, really on the edge in regards to being able to maintain a roof over their heads uh, with uh, rent payments and the like if uh, people are not able to, uh, even a small amount of money can make that difference between making that rent payment and not. If they fall behind, get into that spiral, get the eviction notice, uh, it can be the start of a very, very big fall. Uh, and that can, apart from anything else, not only be catastrophic for that person and their family, particularly when there's children involved, but uh, creates more public cost. Uh, there's also a need for uh, additional funding for um, uh, authorised review offers within Centrelink to deal with appeals there properly. Uh, my understanding is that uh, concerns uh, regularly been raised not just by the Welfare Rights Network but by the Ombudsman and the National Audit Office uh, and a, a model of, uh, of um, ensuring decisions were reviews by uh, authorised review officers was agreed to but still hasn't been properly implemented because of uh, financial problems. Uh, those are something that also I believe needs to be addressed. So there's some measures in all of these bills here that go some way forward, some of them just fixing up problems that have been introduced in the past or excessive harshness from the past. But uh, as I've outlined uh, in this contribution, there's a lot more gaps to be plugged. I hope both major parties give serious consideration to doing so uh, in their uh, policy pronouncements uh, in the election period. Thank you, Senator Bartlett. The question is that the... Uh... Oh, Senator Scullion. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Executive Deputy President. Uh, I thank the Senators for their contribution to this debate. The 2007 Measures Bill No. 1 builds on the Howard Government's welfare to work reforms by extending eligibility for mobility allowance and making it easier for people with disability to find work in the open labour market. The amendments also improve the labour market potential of people claiming youth allowance by ensuring the move for young people from full time study into the labour market is supported by prompt assistance from Centrelink. Welfare to work measures supporting parents are extended so that people receiving partnered parenting payment can access more support if they have a partial work capacity due to disability. This additional support is consistent with that received by people with partial capacity to work on New Start allowance. The 2007 measures bill number no. 2 gives effect to announcements made in the budget as with the first bill. This bill also builds on the Howard Government's welfare to work reforms. It does so by ensuring better arrangements for principal carers, improved consistency and efficiency in income support decisions and greater clarity in the application of social security law. These amendments recognise the contribution made by grandparents and other relatives when they take on formal caring responsibilities for a child, often preventing the need for foster care arrangements. The amendments extend access to automatic exemptions from participation requirements already in place for some principal carers. In addition, some principal carers will have access to a high rate of payment while they take on care of a child to whom they are related. The bill also updates the terminology used in the impairment tables in Schedule 1B of the Social Security Act of 1991. The updated terminology reflects the broader range of health professionals who are now able to determine impairment ratings against the impairment tables. I would like to make it very clear that these changes do not prohibit the involvement of medical officers and do not reduce the importance of medical information in relation to assigning impairment ratings. In fact, a job capacity assessor is instructed by the Department of Human Services guidelines that they must take into account all relevant supporting material, including the treating doctor's report, when making these sort of assessments. Assertions by the opposition that this measure weakens the role of medical officers and their supporting reports in this process are simply untrue and misleading. Our welfare to work measures aren't an attempt to save money. In fact, they will cost around about $3.6 billion over four years. They are part of a genuine attempt to move people from welfare to the work for the long-term benefit of Australia. The welfare to work measures seek to increase workforce participation through a balance of improved services increased financial incentives and appropriate obligations. The measures include changes to income support payments, increases in employment services, changes to participation requirements and a new compliance system. Both bills provide even further support for people assisted under the government's welfare to work reforms. I commend these bills to the Senate 
and I seek leave to incorporate other parts of the summing up speech. This is leave granted for incorporation. There have been no objection. Leave is granted. The Senate will there are two amendments to each of the two bills, so I'll, I'll, I'll put the uh, second reading amendment in first in relation to the Social Security Amendment 2007 measures bill number one. The question is, the opposition amendment be agreed to. Those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the no's have it. The no's have it. We now move to the Social Security Amendment 2007 measures bill number two 2007 opposition amendment. Those that in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the no's have it. We will now take the two bills jointly that the second reading uh, be agreed to. Those that opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures No. 1 Bill 2007, Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures No. 2 Bill 2007. The committee will now look at uh, the No. 1 Bill first. Is the wish of the committee that the No. 1 be Bill be taken as a whole? There be no objection. It is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Seward. Senator Seward. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. I move Greens amendments one on uh, one and two on sheet five three nine seven. These relate, as I um, referred to in my second reading um, speech, these relate to the changing um, or amending the requirement for. Um, these provisions, kinship care provisions, to apply only under the family law or, uh, under a family law order, trying to extend it to the definition to or the, the clause to include other care arrangements and to that can include a parenting plan within the meaning of 63C of the Act or any other formal or informal care arrangements. So to see what you will require leave to move oh, them together. Sorry. I seek leave to move a green Just amendment to one and two. No objection. Leave is granted. Okay. Senator Seward. These, um, this definition is aimed to actually make this, and, and I'll also be make, seeking to make similar amendments to uh, Social Security Amendment 2007, bill, the number two bill. Um, what we're seeking to do here is to make these provisions actually meet the requirements of the community. Many, many community kinship care arrangements are actually done informally, or they're done through parenting plans. And as I, as I mentioned in my second reading speech, um, the government is seeking to increase um, the development of more informal arrangements through the relation, family relationship centres. And yet, they're very, they're very heavily limiting the effectiveness of these provisions and these amendments they're making by just restricting, just restricting it to a family law order. Um, I'm particularly concerned around these arrangements and how they're going to apply in Aboriginal communities because there are many children in kinship care in Aboriginal communities and that is not, I, can, I, I can't quote the percentages off the top of my head but I can virtually guarantee that the majority of those arrangements are actually informal arrangements. So while the government is, is move, has taken a step to address the kinship arrangements, and I'm really pleased that they have recognised that, it's something that we've been um, we've raised as, um, from the beginning when these arrangements were brought into place. But it's not addressing the heart of kinship arrangements, and that is that many of these are done through informal arrangements. So we're seeking to actually make these effective, to actually meet the, meet the circumstances that are actually really happening in the community. So. Um, I'd, I'd ask the government to, to explain, have they actually done any stati statistical analysis through you, Chair? Have they actually done any statistical analysis of the proportion of children that are in kinship care that are actually through family law orders opposed, as opposed to those that are in informal arrangements or are done through parenting plans and why they haven't, why they've just restricted it to family law orders and have they given thought to the fact that that actually then is only addressing a portion of the problem when they've actually acknowledged that there's an issue there, but then they're only addressing part of the problem. Thank you, Senator Seward. Minister. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy Chairman, uh, uh, I acknowledge the, uh, the uh, 
I suppose, the importance of the question, but I, th I think it's important, Senator, that we look very carefully at the other alternatives that are available. Uh, there are a number of informal arrangements that are provided for an exemption uh, that reflect the, the, uh, I suppose, the flexibility that's, that's needed and the flexibility of kinship requirements, all of those things. But if, uh, um, if, if, if some particular kinship arrangement um, needs to be made more permanent, then a permanent exemption can be provided by going through the court process to make that particular temporary or flexible kinship arrangement available. Uh, but it, it doesn't have a negative impact on, 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 on the flexibility of that arrangement because uh, under the, the existing Centrelink provisions, uh, flexible exemption arrangements can be for a short term or you know, so that so there's not this is not the principal only tool that's available, uh, and I, and uh, the government would look to a suite of other tools in terms of particularly our capacity to provide for short-term flexible exemption arrangements. Um, and should somebody should that kinship care arrangement become a permanent arrangement, then that would be reflected through the court process. Thank you, Senator Seward. I'm, I'm aware that there are some um, array the exemptions, and we've been through that ad nauseum again in this place for 16 weeks. But if you're looking after children on a, a uh, on a um, you're looking after children in a kinship care process, it's rather onerous to keep going back for this 16 week ex 16 week exemption. And in fact, some people don't want to make it a permanent arrangement. So again, you're still disadvantaging disadvantaging children that are in kinship care on an ongoing basis that aren't as a result of a family law, um, a family law order. And the, I'll just remind the Senate that the figures that are looking, um, the figures that for children that are in out-of-home care, there is an increasing number of children in out-of-home care. It's going up um, quite significantly. And the number of children that are in kinship care is going up quite significant. So we're talking about a significant number of children. Um, that again, uh, many of these children are in informal arrangements, and in particular in um, Aboriginal um, communities. And it seemed to be to be much more equitable and um, more efficient to actually provide for these people in the in, for these cohort of kids and carers um, in the. Um, arrangement the government's made. As, as I said, the centre media have gone halfway to fixing this problem, and really, I think you know, I, I think that these amendments actually address what, try to do what the government's trying to do in a much more comprehensive manner, um, because the, flex, the so-called flexible arrangements that are happening at the moment, in fact, are not meeting those needs and are still quite cumbersome. Thank you, Minister. Uh, and uh, in, your, in your second statement of the question, uh, uh, Senator, uh, you, 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 uh, you related to the, uh, uh, the undertaking of the an equal, an equal sharing arrangements um, in, in the kinship arrangements sometimes occur. I understand there was a piece of legislation I understand being taken through here by Senator Abetz, and he made an undertaking that that aspect of this legislation would be reviewed. I understand it's under current review at the moment. Thank you. Senator Seward. Sorry, I think you're, you're referring to my other amendments that I've been making to measures number two um, in terms of um, shared that's, that relates to shared parenting arrangements rather than the rather than kinship care. I've got other amendments. Um, so I will ask you questions, but so as not to confuse the process at the moment, I'll, I'll leave that one be. But the, my specific question relates to have you so I'll go back to my original question and is have you got Figures and statistics on those number of children in kinship care that are actually in formal, or formal family law order arrangements, as opposed to those that are in informal, some version of informal care arrangements. Senator, I'm advised that whilst the department is currently undertaking a, a continual evaluation of statistical analysis, uh, we are still satisfied at this stage that the flexible arrangements we do have in place. Are meeting the needs of the community. Senator Seward. All right, I'm going to try and not drag this out too much, but in that case, Thank you. I suppose my question has to be: Why are you making? It seems to me you're having a bit both ways. You're saying they're working okay, but we're going to deal with this 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 smaller cohort of people that are in family law orders. So why make only part? Why address this issue only part? Um, in, in a partial manner rather than actually dealing with the, the full concept of kinship, kinship care. Thank you. 
Minister. Oh, Senator, uh, this is the first step, and as I have said, we are looking at the remaining cohorts, and we hope that an increased scrutiny of, the, uh, uh, of that particular demographic will give us some good, uh, good ideas in the future. So the question now is that the Greens amendments be agreed to. Those in opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. We now move to the Democratic amendments. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, these amendments uh, circulated in my name uh, deal with the same topic. The Democrats have moved many amendments of, uh, most recently about an hour ago, to health legislation. Uh, they seek to remove the discrimination against people in same-sex relationships and uh, match the recommendations of the Herioc report, Same Sex, Same Entitlements, uh, that was tabled in the parliament uh, towards the end of June. Uh, the Democrats have sought to uh, address the entrenched mm -hmm. discrimination against people in same-sex relationships via a range of mechanisms over many years. Uh, without success, but we will continue to persevere with that, particularly given the repeated and widespread statements made by many people, including many people of the coalition, including the Prime Minister himself, uh, as long ago as uh, late 2005, that he did not support uh, discrimination against people in, in same-sex relationships in regard to their financial entitlements. Uh, he has nonetheless not supported efforts to remove that discrimination, which is rather frustrating, uh, except on a few occasions. Uh, he has done so. Uh, back when I was leader of the Democrats in regard to superannuation, component of superannuation entitlement, um, which was good to see, uh, although it took a while, um, but uh, the rest has taken even longer. Uh, I won't speak at length on this because the issue is well canvassed, and I think the positions each side is taking is also well canvassed. Uh, I would note, though, specifically with these amendments in this area, which is to do with the Social Security Act, um, this is one of those areas where, in removing the discrimination it, it could well and indeed would, um, at least in some areas of the Social Security Act, lead to a reduction uh, in entitlements for people in same-sex relationship because they would be treated as a couple. Uh, that would mean that their um, payment eligibility may actually go down. Well, it would, in many circumstances, if they're treated a couple, mean that their payment eligibility would go down because the income of one partner would be taken into account in assessing income of the other. So there are people in same-sex relationships who uh, one partner is working in a full-time job and the other partner is entitled to welfare because um, their partner's income is not counted because they're not recognised as a couple. Uh, so this would actually be a saving for the government, quite probably, um, although uh, in the nature of these things, some aspects it may still mean that some people, um, particularly in regard to family payments, perhaps might end up with, uh, with greater financial entitlements, but uh, I don't think there's much doubt that the, the Social Security area in particular is one where um, people in same-sex relationships may end up financially worse off if their relationship is recognised. Uh, certainly, um, from all of the feedback I've had from uh, people in the, the gay and lesbian community and those more widely who have been uh, campaigning for this most basic issue of equality, um, they have said, well, you know, that's not a problem for them. They want equality. And where equality means uh, less money, that's part and parcel. Um, but it is worth making that point that this, this, is, um, this does cut both ways in terms of the financial cost. So um, if there's ever one where the government has no excuse not to support it, it's this one because we're probably saving money. Um, so I um, look forward to hearing the uh, minister um, enthusiastically supporting this money-saving measure. Um, but I guess more, um, more importantly, it is about equality. Um, we would prefer an approach that is matched, matches that of the Herioc. Human Rights Equal Opportunity Commission, which is an omnibus piece of legislation that does the whole lot in one sweep. And uh, you know, people might gain on the swings, lose on the roundabouts. It's not about money per se, it's about equality and it's about recognition. And that is still lacking and that has serious um, wider consequences beyond just money. Uh, so we would prefer that approach, but I've, as I've said previously, uh, that approach has been stymied to date. We do have legislation before the Senate. Uh, that uh, implements the Herioc recommendations. Uh, the legislation was refused uh, by coalition members in this place. Uh, the referral to a Senate committee, uh, an ad hoc Senate committee was established uh, of interested, or an ad hoc parliamentary committee, uh, was established uh, 
of interested MPs to examine it uh, in an unofficial capacity, and that did include uh, members from uh, the House of Representatives and from uh, the coalition parties. And uh, I would note that Senator Allison tabled uh, the report of that ad hoc committee in this Senate uh, an hour or two ago for people who are interested and want to chase it up. Uh, so the, the um, probably no great surprise that the majority of that committee recommended that the bill should be passed and that the Herriot recommendation should be supported. Uh, but um, I, nor should it be a surprise because it's clearly the right thing to do and it's a change that's long overdue. Hence our determination to continue persisting with uh, amendments such as these. Thank you, Senator Bartlett. Senator Scully? No. Oh, Senator no. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Chairman. Um, before the minister responds to Senator Bartlett's um, comments, I wonder if he could also address in his remarks whether or not the government has actually done any analysis of the costs implications of these amendments. Minister Senator Scully? Uh, if I could just take uh, Senator Wong's question first. Uh, I'm not aware of that, uh, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Um, uh, uh, Senator Bartlett, uh, uh, through you, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Chairman, um, this government has already indicated publicly that uh, we're in favour of removing, removing any discriminations against uh, independent, uh, interdependent relationships, including same-sex couples, and uh, as you've indicated, uh, uh, the tabling, I think, on the 21st of June of this year of the uh, Same Sex, Same Entitlements report by the uh, Human Rights and Equal, Equal Opportunity Commission is something that we are looking very carefully at, uh, at those recommendations, and as uh, I think, I think it'd be fair to say, into response for a number of uh, 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 Democrat amendments over a whole suite of legislation, um, we are making, we would only make broad changes to government programs after we considered all of the issues and the ramifications. Uh, it has been our response consistently uh, in regard to the uh, Democrats' amendments in this regard. Um, and it's, it's important to remember that we have an obligation to consider a whole range of interrelated areas of law to ensure that there are no unintended consequences. And uh, uh, that's the uh, reason that we won't be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, I think it's appropriate that I indicate Labor's position in relation to these particular amendments. Um, I am sure those in the chamber would be aware of Labor's um, policy position. I know our platform states clearly that um, a Labor government would remove discrimination, say for marriage, that exists in, in Commonwealth legislation on the basis of sexual orientation. So obviously the, these amendments uh, are consistent with that position and uh, we support the principle behind the amendments and uh, I share some of the, the comments, share the views of, that, of some of the views that um, Senator Bartlett has outlined. Uh, we have considered closely the Harry York report, which identified, I think, 58 or, or thereabouts pieces of legislation uh, in which there were financial, uh, in which there existed discrimination uh, against same-sex couples, particularly in relation to financial and work-related benefits. <coughs> Uh, we, we have stated publicly, our spokesperson has stated publicly that we support uh, the recommendations of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission in that report and in government that we would implement it. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, I think it's safe to say that the position that Labor now has in relation to these issues uh, is the most progressive and advantageous <coughs> in relation to same-sex couples uh, that Labor has ever stated and publicly put on the record uh, in terms of the federal, federal sphere. Uh, I also note that Labor, state Labor governments uh, have obviously uh, led the way in terms of clearing away discrimination on the basis of sexual, sexuality. Um, can I say, however, this um, particular amendment does introduce, um, uh, has significant cost implications uh, and Senator Bartlett identified there will be uh, if this were passed, some cost savings. There would also be some additional costs. Uh, we are conscious of that. Uh, we, if we were to win government, this would be an issue we would approach sensibly, consistent with our platform and our public commitments. It would require us to uh, undertake a proper analysis of the costs associated with it. We are not able to do that in opposition. Uh, and for those reasons, we are not able to support these particular amendments on this occasion. Uh, for the reasons I've outlined. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Seward. Um, I'd like to put on the record that the Greens 
um, do support these amendments and um, uh, believe that they're essential amendments to, and it's essential that we end this form of discrimination. So we would be supporting um, these amendments. Thank you. So the question is, do you wish to respond, Minister? Or not? So the question is that uh, the democratic, Democrat amendments uh, relating to the same sex, uh, same entitlements, uh, be agreed to. Those with opinions say aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The next question is the bill stand is printed. Those with opinions say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Okay. Now, Andy, time to suspend. Do you think? Do you think almost I think perhaps it's all, as it's almost 7:30. Uh, the question, the uh, the question, the issue is that the Senate stands suspended until seven o'clock. Seven o'clock tonight. Thank you. Seven. No, seven. Half an hour. That's why I repeated.